Good morning, everybody. We're ready to get started. If everyone could take your seats. All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2023 fall meeting of the National Advisory Committee on Racial, Ethnic, and Other Populations. We are delighted to have you join us, and we look forward to a productive discussion over the next two days. My name is Karen Battle. I am the Chief of the Population Division at the U.S. Census Bureau, and I am also the designated federal officer for the National Advisory Committee. And in this role, I preside over the Advisory Committee meeting as specified by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, also known as FACA. Important information for this meeting can be found in our Federal Register Notice. The proceedings for this meeting, including the agenda, information to access closed captioning services, and other important details can be found on the Census Bureau's NAC website. During the two-day session, only committee members will be permitted to make comments and or ask questions of the Census Bureau presenters. This is a hybrid meeting for the NAC members who have joined us via the virtual format. We ask that you mute your microphones unless you are engaged in the discussion. As a reminder to my Census Bureau colleagues who joined virtually, I encourage you to enable video during your presentation and the committee discussion. Once your topic has ended, you may turn off the video feature. At the conclusion of each Census Bureau presentation, Cherokee Bradley, with Carol Haffer's assistance, will be responsible for facilitating the committee discussion. To accommodate our hybrid NAC members, the chair and vice chair will first acknowledge the members in the room, followed by members who have joined us virtually. For the NAC members in the room, please turn your name card on its side to indicate to the chair or vice chair that you wish to join the queue to speak. Once acknowledged by the chair or vice chair, turn on the microphone at your location and clearly state your name for the record. This is needed each time you speak for the most accurate transcripts. And for the NAC members who have joined virtually, I ask that you use the raise hand feature once acknowledged by the chair, unmute your microphone, state your name clearly for the record, and proceed with your question or comment. During the two-day meeting, we have time designated for public comments. The Federal Register Notice provides information on the process to submit written comments. Tomorrow at 10.40 a.m., I will read a number of the public comments received before the deadline. All public comments, regardless of when received, will be posted on the Census Bureau's NAC website for public viewing. At this time, I would like to acknowledge each of our Census Bureau leaders. Robert Santos, Director of the Census Bureau. Ron Jarman, Deputy Director of the Census Bureau. David Zaya, Chief, Office of Program Performance and Stakeholder Integration. Didis Katagi, Associate Director for Communications. Laura Fergioni, Chief Administrative Officer. Louis Cano, Chief Information Officer. Fernandez Boards, Chief Financial Officer. Tim Olson, Associate Director for Field Operations. Nick Orsini, Associate Director for Economic Programs. Deb Stempowski, Associate Director for Decennial Census Programs. Tori Velkoff, Associate Director for Demographic Programs, and Sally Keller, Associate Director for Research and Methodology and Chief Scientist. We would also like to thank all members of the public, the Department of Commerce staff, regional staff, congressional staff, and others who are observing today's proceedings. We'd also like to thank the United States Patent and Trademark Office for hosting us today. Over the next two days, Cherokee, Carol, and I will share in facilitating this meeting. Between the three of us, we will do our very best to keep the discussion moving to ensure we hear from everyone while staying on schedule. 
Our meeting agenda reflects a broad range of topics. We developed the agenda in response to the Census Bureau's need to share and introduce research and program developments requiring your attention. The agenda also includes topics NAC recommended on critical program areas and research. Most topics are broken into three parts, census presentations, discussant presentations, and committee discussion. First on today's agenda, our committee chair, Cherokee Bradley, will introduce the NAC vice chair, welcome committee members, and invite John Sandoval to make opening remarks. Next, the director, Robert Santos, uh, will provide executive remarks followed by committee discussion. Following the executive remarks, Lisa Moore will present lessons learned from the 2020 Integrated Partnership and Communications Operation, followed by discussant John Sandoval and committee discussion. We'll take a brief break. Uh, during that time, we will take the NAC member photo. After the break, Eric Jensen and Lauren Medina will present an overview on the Young Children Working Group followed by discussants Richard Pan and Arlock Sherman and committee discussion. Next, we will have Joan Hill, who will present the American Community Survey content test, followed by discussant uh, Nicholas Vargas and committee discussion. Then we will pause for lunch. And after lunch, uh, Sharon Stern, Julie Weeks, Susan Popkin, and Andrew Houghtonville will present on data collection efforts for the disability community followed by discussant Marlene Sayo and committee discussion. Once we conclude that topic, the NAC committee members will discuss and formulate recommendations on today's topics. Cherokee Bradley and Carol Hafford will lead the NAC committee discussion and formulation of recommendations. While we invite the public to continue watching that portion of the meeting, we note that it will consist of conversation among the committee members only. At 5 p.m., we will conclude all discussion and reconvene tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. for day two of the NAC meeting. So now, please welcome Cherokee Bradley, who will bring chair remarks and welcome the NAC members. Good morning, everyone. First, I would like to thank Director Santos, Deputy Director Harmon, Jarman, excuse me, Karen, and Karen Battle for all your work with the, um, the NAC committee. It's very important at this time that I also extend the opportunity to one of our NAC members due to the number of constituencies that are represented on the NAC and voices, various voices. So at this time, I would like to turn the mic over to John Sandoval, who, would, who also will continue with opening remarks. Thank you, Cherokee. Uh, good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, it's my fourth year on the NAC. And it's great for us to now be two consecutive meetings in person, fully back, well, hybridly back, uh, and really appreciate all the work that the Census Bureau has done to bring us here. And once again, in, in community and conversation and discussion. So we've got a media agenda for our first day, as you've heard. Um, I particularly am fond of the first agenda topic. Uh, the integrated communication plan has been something that we've been seeing on a recurring basis over Previous meetings, it's always great to have a good steady tempo and continued conversation, um, as well as uh, overview of the young children's working group, which I know a lot of the NAC members are very interested in conversing. Um, also, the American Community Survey content test and uh, data collection efforts for the disability community. Um, we're going to end the day with our NAC discussion, formulation of recommendations. And just to set the stage, I looked up what advisory, we're all in the National Advisory Committee. What does advisory mean? So it means having or exercising power to advise, having or consisting in the power to make recommendations, but not to take action enforcing them. So to that end, to my fellow NAC members, we appreciate your ideas, your input, your contributions and recommendations. And I was going to say thanks in advance, to our chair and co-chair, but I have to say thank you already. So we already have 42 recommendations. That's four two coming into the meeting. So for perspective, in our spring meeting, we had 32. We ended with 32 recommendations. So we're already 10 above, and we're going to have lots of discussion over the next two days. Uh, so Cherokee and Carol, 
um, really shepherd us, kind of wrangle us in, make sure our, our recommendations are uh, fit for digestion by the Census Bureau, formulated in a way for it's easy for them or easier for them to, to review. Uh, and uh, it's critical that they be clear and focused. So for us as NAC members, uh, be concise, make sure they're actionable, make sure they're clear, really helps for the overall process. And I'd like to close by uh, sharing a quote that I hope will get all of us in the spirit for our meeting. It's from Chauncey Depew. Follow the path of the unsafe, independent thinker. Expose your ideas to the dangers of controversy. Speak your mind and fear less the label of crackpot than the stigma of conformity. And on issues that seem important to you, stand up and be counted at any cost. Again, quote by Chauncey Depew. Thank you very much. We'll turn it back over to you, Karen. All right, thank you very much, Cherokee and John. And now we will hear remarks from Director Santos. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, John, for that uh, wonderful set of remarks, including uh, the, the quote that you ended with. I thought that was very appropriate. Reality check, can folks hear me? Louder? No, <laughs> That's, look, I've raised the thing. <laughs> so I don't know if it was a, a, an issue in the back or, or what, but uh, anyway, here, here we are. You guys know I have, I have a soft voice. I'll try to, I'll try to shout it up. Uh, but anyway, good morning. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us in person or virtually. Um, you, the NAC, are a portal to the public for us to get input, feedback, and recommendations. And it's only through your recommendations that we can enhance what we do at the Bureau. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your time, your contributions, and your volunteerism. Uh, now, uh, Deputy Director Ron Jarman was not able to attend today, but he should be in tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to uh, focus my remarks on the types of updates that I know that you would uh, appreciate hearing about what's going on at the Census Bureau uh, and so forth. And uh, let me start with committee updates. First, <clears throat> we currently have an active federal register notice seeking nominations to the NAC, the National Advisory Committee. Please, please notify your networks and your colleagues of this opportunity for public service. Uh, the nomination deadline is January 10th of next year. And um, so we really would appreciate a nice diverse group of nominations. So please do all you can. We are as well. Next, uh, I'd like to turn to something that's really important to me and I think to all of us. I'd like to acknowledge the current backlog of Census Bureau responses to NAC recommendations. Uh, current practice calls for us to formally respond to advisory committee recommendations before the next meeting of the committee. Uh, but regrettably, we have fallen short and we are in the midst of processing responses to a number of past of your recommendations for the past meetings. Please don't under, think that that means that we don't care about them. We really do. In fact, we're being incredibly thoughtful and deliberative, which means that sometimes things go back and forth. So uh, our apologies. Uh, I do want to say that I personally take full responsibility in the backlog. So the buck stops with me. Uh, what we can do is um, let you know that we are committed to get back on that on that common practice of responding before the next meeting. Uh, but we're gonna we'll be working through the current backlog as quickly as we can 
uh, and responding prior to the uh, next meeting uh, in all expectation. Um, now, in the spirit of transparency, I think this is really important, and I believe a NAC member made this suggestion. Um, please know that we've posted your recommendations, the committee's recommendations, for the meetings held in spring 2022 and July 2023 on our NAC website. And underneath it'll say responses are coming. Um, we will post our responses as soon as they are finalized and make sure that you receive them personally as well. Um, I understand the frustrations that it's caused and um, you give your best and we recognize it uh, in developing your recommendations uh, all in the spirit of helping us. And we really, really appreciate it. And we're gonna, we're gonna do better. So in advance, <clears throat> Thank you for your patience and your indulgence. Okay, so I wanna now talk about our 2030 Census Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, committee. Um, it's a new committee uh, planning uh, for the 2030 Census continues and the establishment of this committee is part of that. If you recall last fall, we eagerly reached out to the public seeking new creative ideas for a better 2030 census through an, a federal register notice. And this August, um, then as part of our overarching effort, uh, we established uh, this committee to advise on 2030 census operations. Now, uh, I talked about this at the CSAC meeting, but I wanna make sure that both committees uh, hear what, what we have to say on this. The CSAC and the NAC, advise on Census Bureau enterprise issues. Uh, you uh, provide feedback on the many programmatic and uh, programs and initiatives across our agency, which may directly or indirectly include the decennial census. Our National Advisory Committee, you, focuses on people and communities, specifically race, ethnicity, and other historically undercounted groups, like people experiencing homelessness, young children, um, in Census Bureau surveys and censuses and so forth. The Census Scientific Advisory Committee, CSAC, focuses on science. This committee advises the Census Bureau on its research and methodology work across its programs that, and its enterprise-wide. For example, those programs include research on race, ethnicity, age, sexual orientation, and gender identity, as well as uh, research and methodology related to all surveys and censuses and estimation and data privacy issues and so forth. In contrast, this 2030 Census Advisory Committee will focus on issues related specifically to census operations. This includes such topics as questionnaire content, enumeration strategies, outreach, communications, and data analysis, including how um, we, we better capture or, uh, or measure historically undercounted groups. Now, NAC and CSAC will continue to inform fundamental enterprise level aspects of the Census Bureau's work that impact the 2030 census planning. And there will be inevitable overlap, and, and really, that's okay. More diverse voices are needed and welcome. Okay, next I'm going to talk about our budget. We all live by the budget, right? In fiscal year 2023, the Census Bureau received uh, just under $1.5 billion. Uh, this enables us to continue our efforts in transformation and modernization throughout the organization and uh, operations uh, in going from this survey-centric to a data-centric uh, type of uh, single enterprise operation. Uh, highlights of uh, this uh, 2023 fiscal year budget include uh, continuing uh, major data collection operations, including the 2022 economic census, uh, and continuing uh, data on census of governments, as well as ACS, et cetera. 
Um, working on 2020 census final evaluations and assessments. Uh, working on the 2020 census data releases. We've done uh, one already and uh, there is another coming for next year. Conducting 2030 census planning and research as we've discussed and maintaining the current population survey and while working on an internet self response mode that uh, pushes our modernization efforts part of that. And uh, also advancing our common enterprise systems for data collection, management, data release, and so forth. All part of this uh, transformation and modernization effort. So those are sort of the types of things that are included in the 23 budget. For the 24 budget, um, it's basically, right now it's indeterminate, as you know. Uh, and we are basically have a tale of two cities. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the Senate, current Senate appropriations bill would provide the Census Bureau with one and a half billion, which is 16, uh, uh, roughly one and a half billion. And uh, this funding level would allow us to maintain the current operation and make improvements to population estimates and support Puerto Rican uh, data collection operations and the sort. Uh, on the other hand, the other city, so to speak, the House Appropriations Bill funds Census Bureau at 1.35 billion, which is a bit lower, as you and uh, as you can tell, uh, and it's more consistent with our, uh, the fiscal year 2022 level of funding. Um, it presents challenges, obviously, to uh, our operations, and we're working through uh, how that might be affected. Now. Both of those versions of the bills and uh, alloc budget allocations are available publicly, so you can look them up if you're interested in more detail. Um, they do need to be reconciled, and they will, uh, but they have a way to go before that that occurs. Um, the their diverging divergent starting points, though, the fact that they are so far apart, does signal that we'll probably end up who knows where, and we have to be prepared uh, for either uh, either version or something in between, or something different. Who knows? Who knows what the Senate and the the Congress are going to, uh, the House are going to come up with? Okay, um, let's turn to the topic of race ethnicity. Since our spring meeting, we've released a large amount of data, including several releases that feature race and ethnicity. In May, we released the Demographic and Housing Characteristics file, the DHC, and the, along with the Demographic file. And last June, we posted the ACS Selected Population and American Indian and Alaska Native tables uh, and the Population Estimates Demographic release. And I wanna especially highlight this, this last September where we released the 2020 Detailed Demographic and Housing Characteristic File A. Um, that product, uh, along with a, uh, its documentation and such, features detailed counts of 1,500 race, ethnicity, and um, American Indian and Alaska Native uh, categories and combinations. Uh, this includes, includes counts of 1,200 tribes and 300 race ethnicity combinations. And really, it shows us for the first time the wonderful diversity, uh, increasing diversity of, of our nation. So uh, congratulations to the staff that produced this. Uh, collectively, if you think about it, these data releases illustrate our commitment to developing statistics that more accurately reflect our ever-changing nation. They offer us the rich portrait of who we are, and they serve to benefit everyone, including our nation's underserved groups. Now, here's an update on federal data collection of race and ethnicity. Uh, as you know, every federal agency, including the Census Bureau, collects race and ethnicity data following the standards set by the Office of Management and Budget under uh, Statistical Policy Directive 15. Uh, OMB, in fact, uh, commenced a review of that directive uh, and uh, the, the process has been unfolding. 
Uh, and this directive, as you probably know, main, uh, lays out the standards for maintaining, collecting, and presenting federal data on race and ethnicity. The formal, uh, this formal review process for a potential revision had a simple goal, to ensure that the new standards would better reflect uh, where we are as a nation in terms of our beautifully rich diversity. In January, uh, the OMB Office uh, of uh, the Chief Statistician, Karen Orvis, uh, released the initial recommended set of revisions to the race and ethnicity standards. These recommendations were developed by an interagency technical working group made up of uh, 20 federal uh, government agencies and career staff. Uh, their proposal featured collecting race and ethnicity together using a simple question, adding a response category to, uh, to reflect Middle Eastern and Northern uh, African uh, people separate uh, and separate them distinctly from the white category, and updating the terminology definitions and question wording in the standards. The recommendations are preliminary, they don't represent the position of OMB or the agencies participating on the working group. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget remains on track to reach the goal of completing these important revisions by the summer of 2024. Uh, we'll continue to support OMB through this critical endeavor, uh, and we have our wonderful co-chair of the working group, uh, Karen, here with us, providing subject matter expertise. Okay, let's talk about 2030 Census. Um, we've begun a series of webinars regarding the 2030 Census to update the public on our preparations. And I hope that, that some of you have been able to, to uh, view those. Last month, a webinar addressed how we're using public comments submitted in response to the 2030 Federal Register Notice to revise our decennial census. We um, recognized the need to engage and collaborate with partners, with stakeholders, with tribes and the public to inform the, this research agenda and ultimately our operational plan. Um, as a result, we are conducting 55 projects, which you can review uh, at the website uh, that's called the 2030 Re Census Research Explorer Tool. Uh, now, if you go there, you'll note that about 40% of our research projects are investigating how to increase participation uh, among historically undercounted populations. And another nine projects focus on improving external engagement, which necessarily and inherently includes research to engage historically undercounted communities and populations. And looking at it from that lens, you can see that over half of our projects, uh, directly or indirectly, involve research that addresses our ability to, uh, to effectively enumerate these critically important subpopulations. Uh, we added a new project, actually, as, as a result of the FRN, to explore how our staff can, uh, our staff training can be used to ensure that uh, we develop specialized skills on cultural competencies, including, of course, training the field staff, the census questionnaire assistance staff, and Im embedding it in all of uh, our approaches to uh, communications. You can read more about those. Again, um, actually, you can read more about our decennial research, how our decennial research supports that goal of, uh, of getting at historically undercounted po uh, populations in a blog that I, I wrote and it appears on census.gov. Next is the American Community Survey, our flagship survey. Uh, I, m I already mentioned uh, that race ethnicity uh, product releases uh, have, have, um, have been released, but there's another item that related to ACS that I'd like to touch on. 
The Census Bureau is currently inviting public feedback through a federal register notice on proposed changes that would commence uh, proposed changes to the ACS questions that would commence with the 2025 American Community Survey. As many know, since the inception of ACS, we regularly review the need for improvements to, the, to our flagship survey. And the process involves both interagency um, involvement and input, uh, input and the opportunity for public feedback at various points in, that f in a five-year process. Um, it also includes a large national field test aptly called the ACS content test and a, a pretty comprehensive uh, presentation on that test and its results is forthcoming later this morning. The proposed 2025 survey changes cover a variety of topics, including household rosters, educational attainment, health insurance coverage, disability, and labor force questions. And they also include three new areas uh, that were tested, uh, solar panels, uh, electronic vehicles, and sewage disposal. We encourage, and in fact, we need the public's input on these proposed changes in order for us to prepare a final packet of recommendations to submit to the Office of Management and Budget for their review and approval. Comments on any or all aspects of the proposed revisions can be submitted through December 19th, so there's still a bit of time. I want to acknowledge and thank the public on the robust submission of commentary thus far on the proposed disability revisions. But we seek in feedback on all the proposed changes. So please keep the feedback coming. We appreciate it. We need it in order to, to be able to make the best decisions and develop the best package to submit to OMB. And in that regard, note that OMB, uh, and they do consult with uh, the Interagency Council on Statistical Policies Subcommittee on ACS, uh, which has representatives from different federal statistical agencies, including census, of course. Uh, they will, OMB will provide final approval on which changes to content will actually be made to, in, to the 2025 ACS. Now, I'll end my remarks uh, with a few commentaries on the uh, economic uh, statistics programs. Uh, we have a 2022 economic census. And as of uh, November, the middle of November, just a few days ago, uh, we had mailed to over 4 million establishments with 73% uh, responses, roughly similar to that of 2017, except for island areas that tended to be a little bit lower in terms of their participation this time around. Contingent on 2024 funding, the first look data, it's a data product that use, that are based on the, the economic census, are planned for release in March of 2024. This release is about six months ahead of, of the 2017 publication schedule or cycle. And in fact, all of the economic census products will be published roughly six months earlier. Um, than the previous economic census. So we think that's a good sign. We also have another census, the Census of Governments. The Census of Governments is the only source of comprehensive and uniformly classified data on economic activities of state and local governments. It's conducted in three phases or three components, an organizational, an employment, and then one on finance pension. The first component, organizational, uh, has released the official counts of state and local governments uh, in, they did it back in August of 2023. Uh, results are presented by characteristics such as government type, state, population size, uh, groups, and function. Uh, data provided include things like school systems, uh, independent school districts, uh, dependent school districts, and so forth. 
and those uh, will state descriptions will be released later in 2024. The employment component was also released, and that's in it was released in June of this year. Uh, it provides the number of state and local government employees and payroll by government function. Finance data include revenue, expenditures, debt, assets uh, for state and local governments, as well as pension data. These data are partially released, but uh, they'll go on on a rolling basis through uh, December of 2024. Now, similar to the Household Pulse Survey, we have the Business Trends and Outlooks Survey, which is a high-frequency survey of businesses. Um, the, uh, we call it the BTOS. Started, it started data collection in July of 2022, and it uh, features ongoing publications roughly every two weeks uh, since October of 22 to measure the U.S. Uh, business climate. Um, data is available by sector, state, uh, 25 most populous metropolitan statistical areas, as well as uh, Puerto Rico. And data are, are also available by subsector and uh, state. And then uh, the last economic program I wanted to mention was uh, the Annual Integrated Economic Survey, which a AIES, which is actually pretty cool when you think about it from a methodological perspective. It's a re-engineered survey that integrates and replaces seven existing annual business surveys. The AIES provides key annual measures of economic activity, including the only comprehensive national and subnational data on business, revenues, employment, expenses, and assets on, annual, on an annual basis. Uh, the 2022 AIES was launched in a pilot mode with about 8,200 companies, and the full scale will be in 2023 uh, to be launched in, uh, I'm sorry, the 2023 AIES is set to launch in March of 2024 for, approx uh, for approximately 385 uh, businesses. Uh, and the data for that will be expected to be released in the public. So if you noticed, I spent a little bit of time on economic data because as I go out and we engage with the public, it's becoming increasingly evident that there is real value to the data products we produce and the insights that can be had in underserved communities, communities of color, and just the public more generally, when we combine and look at both the economic aspects as well as the population and the housing aspects of data. So um, I want to make sure that, that, that this group understands that and, um, and that you're apprised of the different, the, the various aspects of data that can be used to, um, to affect all communities and promote economic development. So thank you for joining us and uh, I'll pass it over to, uh, to Karen. Thank you very much, Director. And um, I believe Cherokee and uh, Carol will uh, facilitate questions from the committee. NAC members, if you have any questions, please turn your card to the side. Just one moment. For those who are virtual, is it something you can assist? Yes. Is that something? Okay. Floor recognizes Richard Pan. Uh, th thank you so very much. And uh, thank you, Director Santos, for that presentation. Um, two questions, actually. And uh, I guess the first question, because you touched on the budget, um, um, different budget proposals. And, and also, of course, you touched on the wide variety of data collection that the census is doing. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, in, in many ways, um, since one proposal would perhaps result in a cut in and the bureau's activities, um, I guess, and I know you've talked about this here, but in what way um, is, do you see best that we communicate to the public that the census is not just the, certainly it's very important, the decennial census, but all the other things you talked about, including, I mean, basically, um, 
businesses need to know that there's critical data, the business that the census collects that actually can inform their economic decision making, including investments, other types of things that has tremendous value way beyond, frankly, the small, well, not, no amount of money small, but I mean, the amount of money, in other words, uh, those types of cu cuts to the operation of the census um, may actually impact the census ability to provide the kind of data that people use to make even larger, whether economic or personal decisions, and that that's an unwise uh, cut, I guess, cut. I don't know whether you can say that or not as a, as a federal employee or not, but I mean, really trying to communicate to be sure that we have people reminding both of our houses of the legislature, of, the, of Congress, that, um, that uh, the census is providing really important data that helps other people make really important decisions um, for actually a fairly small amount of money, given the size of the economic impact that this data can provide. So uh, what, what we're, we actually have a, a multi-prong approach, um, and it's all within the context of external engagement, uh, not only with state uh, and local governments, but also with communities and the federal component too. So we have an Office of Legislative Affairs within the Census Bureau whose role it is to serve Congress, the, the Senate and the, and the House. And uh, we provide and make sure to do briefings and extend offers like well, here we are, you know, please come. We want to talk to you about X, Y, Z, so that folks uh, on the Hill can be apprised of the importance and critical nature of the data we're yeah. collecting and how it feeds into economic development, public health, etc. So we're actively doing that. In fact, yesterday we had a meeting uh, with with. Uh, with a with one of the caucuses of the of Congress uh, to discuss the value of data and, and things of that sort, um, and and uh, ex in terms of externally to the business world, um, our external strategy is is one of a continuous um, operation to do uh, things like address. Uh, chambers of commerce so when we go around the country and when i go around the country and with with other census staff uh one of the first groups that we contact is is the chambers of commerce and it's not just the chicago chambers of commerce but it's also the you know the asian american you know chamber of commerce and the hispanic chamber of commerce etc because we need and uh, audiences with them so that they can understand the value of things like the economic census we have great discussions with them. We bring our data dissemination specialists who then, you know, have laptops and talk to them about the data products. So we're doing that type of okay. activity. And uh, we're also doing something in terms of partnerships with universities where we are, are trying to leverage the university partnership as a further portal into the local community. Mm -hmm. So that we work with professors, we work with students, et cetera, but we also get them uh, engaged with other networks. Um, professors often do community-based participatory research. So right. we can hear back from the community how local communities are using survey data or not and what they lack. And again, we have data dissemination specialists, uh, census information centers, state data, data centers, et cetera. The, sim the same is true for, you know, uh, working with and uh, presenting to, you know, the Council of Governors and uh, state legislators groups, Council of Mayors, uh, things of that sort. Okay. So we're pretty active and robust in terms of that type of outreach. Okay. And we have communications groups that also do that type of outreach to the corporate world as well as to okay. the local. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think it's important for people to know, though, that if there are cuts to the census budget, that will have an impact on the quality of the data and other types of things. And so I think that certainly it's important to communicate both what we do, but also what the impact if it's under resourced, right? And then the second question I do have is, is that, and you did touch on, you know, we have a 2030 census advisory committee that Mm -hmm. has a certain charge. Um, we have our charge where we're looking over all the various census products. I have to admit, there seems to be a lot of overlap okay. between the two. So can you just speak to what happens when there are, I guess, conflicting recommendations or are, how, how's the census playing to yeah, that, prioritize various yeah. recommendations coming from one body versus the other one 
associated with the same thing or some very similar things, because obviously we're going to make making, making recommendations that impacts the 2030 census even today. So, so um, uh, I'm really, really glad you asked that question. The, uh, it depends on how you look at, at the issue of um, conflicting recommendations, because um, I'm of the belief, and I think we are of the belief mm -hmm. that we need as much input and feedback as possible from, from communities externally in order for us to actually achieve our mission. And that includes um, diverse perspectives. And diverse perspectives aren't diverse if everybody's simply saying one thing. You gain more insight through recognizing and seeing the perspectives of others when they differ in the in the final recommendation than when everybody's lockstep. And in fact, when everybody's lockstep, the first question I ask is, okay, who do we miss? Because <laughs> there's always a diversity of opinion and there needs to be, and we need to hear that in order to, to create the best insights and knowledge base so that we can then make the decision. So I see it as a as an opportunity and uh, but I recognize that others might see it as a as a threat. But just briefly, uh, I mean, it's it's not so much. Of course, we want different inputs and you can have et cetera. It's, what's the process for resolving them? Uh, and I think we can uh, resolve inter those things. Yeah, internal discussion uh, provided that the recommendations are sufficiently um, uh, articulated so that we don't need clarification. So if there are conflicting, if there are conflicting um, recommendations, the first thing I do is think, okay, everybody has a starting point for making that recommendation, so they have some underlying assumptions. Are the two underlying assumptions the same? Because you could ha actually have two conflicting uh, recommendations that actually are, are ultimately the same because they assume different starting points, <laughs> drastically different starting points. So that's something that, that, that we would do. We, we would first see if we understand uh, uh, the underlying uh, premise, uh, ask, seek clarification, and then have our, our discussions and, and make a decision. And uh, it's not, a, uh, these are types of decisions in terms of operational types of things that I do not make. These are decisions that the career staff make. Are there any NAC committee members virtually as a question or comment at this time? Please introduce yourself. Any virtual members who have a question or a comment at this time? <clears throat> Let me revisit my guidance for those who are here in person. Please turn your car upright on its side um, to be recognized. Upon asking your question or speaking, please lower your car to introduce yourself. Floor recognizes. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. That was very interesting to hear what is happening currently. Um, I'm just following up on this previous question, um, just for some further clarification. I think I'm envisioning a situation um, between these th uh, two different groups, three different groups, but let's say the two that are focused on representation of people, you know, undercounted folks. Um, I think my, our, my concern lies if someone says, well, this group, it's not a important or we're not going to count this group or we're not going to focus on counting a, a particular population that let's say the NAC has already talked about um, being important to count. I think it's more of the omission, the possible omission of groups from counts or from detail that may come up. And so those kind of conflicts are like where I will say my fears um, come from when there's a 2030 um, census advi uh, advisory committee and the NAC together. If the NAC is charged with, you know, race, ethnicity, and special populations, and so it's just it's more about that specific aspect. If you know the committee decides for 2030, we don't need to ask a question in this certain way, and that leaves out a whole entire um, subpopulation. You know, who sort of gets the final say or who whose uh, recommendations are weighted more. I think it's it's 
that kind of situation. And of course, I'm a catastrophizer, so I always think of these type of situations, but I just like to hear more thoughts about um, how you envision those kind of conflicts being um, remedied. Uh, well, I'm not too sure that I can say more than I already have that that they are what they are. We need to understand them fully, find out where people are coming from, and then make the best the best decision or recommendation from there going forward. Um, ultimately, actually, uh, as as you probably know, it's the Office of Management and Budget that tells us what we can and can't ask and how we can can and can't ask it. Um, but we want to be able to say, here's the research to back it up because we, we do research. Recommendations often uh, result in further research that creates an evidence base to then move forward rather than saying, here's two recommendations, let's just pick one, you know, or we, we think this is the right way to go. So we rely on the evidence base that is informed by the recommendations that that end up leading to additional research so we can have the evidence to say that therefore we need to do this. Thank you. That's that helped clarify things. Okay. Do we have any members? Next members virtually has a question or a comment at this time. Please introduce yourself before speaking. Any additional NAC members in person who has a question or comment at this time? <clears throat> Floor recognizes. Um, good morning. This is Carol Hafford. Thank you, Director Santos, for your comments and your warm welcome. Um, in scanning over the Census Research um, Project Explorer, there's more than 50 projects, and it's a robust um, collection of research that is will be undertaken. So I was just wondering, how would the, the NAC be informed of progress and findings of these um, research projects, because some of the topics um, are those of importance to the NAC, historical undercount of children, historically undercounted populations, um, improving enha um, and enhancing engagement and communication strategies. So just wondering how we could stay informed about um, progress and findings. Thank you. Uh, through through co joint communication. <laughs> Uh, because we develop our agendas together, we, we sometimes we have certain needs and we say we really need this on on the agenda, but we also listen and um, and just as a matter of protocol, I would expect that we would provide overviews of our ongoing research and the and the findings, just as we're now going to be talking about the ACS uh, census test. So uh, I don't envision a time where the NAC would be excluded from discussing something that's clearly within its domain. Mm -hmm. And and if you if there's ever any perception from anyone that that might be happening, please speak up. Okay. Are there any members, NAC members virtually who has a question or comment? Hearing none, we'll recognize this oh, oh, R-Lot. Oh. We'll recognize this R-Lot. Thank you so much, Director Santos. Um, and I did not um, see, but this might just make, be me, um, very much in the research agenda about, and, and it's a wonderful agenda, but about um, resourcing for language barriers for low literacy and for multi-unit access where there's restricted access to a building say mm -hmm. um and it, are there shoes to drop um in the research agenda is there or um uh I, I might have just missed it uh i don't think you necessarily missed it uh, i believe and and i don't have the 55 in my brain so forgive me um i believe there are operational type of uh, research projects that are going on that necessarily would involve those issues uh and deb i don't know if you want to talk about it <laughs> hi good morning i'm deb stempowski Nice to see you all. But yes, they're in there in terms of operational uh, research. For example, the um, 
gatekeepers on the large apartment buildings and so forth, you know, building relationships, trying to do some of that work. That's all ongoing right now. I like the research explorer tool. It's really cool, but I understand if you don't have time for it, sometimes you can't dig all the way in, but definitely have heard you. And we've added actually something around low literacy um, relatively recently as part of what was coming out of the uh, later Federal Register notice uh, comments and so forth. We are approaching time for our first presentation, so I will turn. Can we take one more? I like questions. Uh, I just wanted. Oh, I just wanted to go back quickly to the discussions you said you'd been having uh, on the Hill with members who have differing viewpoints on the necessity of funding for the Census Bureau, and I just want to express my hope that those conversations include the recent uh, POGO Project on Government Oversight Report on the funding that flows down from the decennial census and um, the importance of that funding to local governments and state governments. Um, I've had a number of those conversations with folks who are not necessarily in favor of full funding and the necessity of the funding that especially goes to rural communities, to big cities, to local governments is so hugely important and I don't think really fully understood. So I just wanted to note that. And thank you for having those conversations. I know they're not easy. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Karen, for our first presentation. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you, committee members, for your questions and comments. Now let's move on to our first topic of the day. Lisa Moore will present on lessons learned from the 2020 Integrated Partnership and Communications Operation, followed by discussant John Sandoval and committee discussion. Good morning, everybody. Sound check is much higher right now, so let me know if I'm too loud. I have the opposite problem. I talk a lot and loud. Um, so I'm Lisa Moore. I'm the communication liaison for the 2030 Integrated Partnership and Communications Program. I'm here today to walk us through the 2020 Integrated Partnership and Communications Lessons Learned. Throughout the presentation, I will be saying the acronym. I know many of you love, you know, NAC is an acronym, um, IPC. So um, just so you hear, I'll be referring to it as IPC as we walk through it. Just some general conversation um, uh, terminology up front. I have my colleague here also um, that will provide additional support if there's some additional questions that we have at the end um, for the work that was done in the 2020 IPC program. So uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, I do want to first off uh, thank everybody here for um, requesting this information and then also um, thank the partners that we worked very closely with at all levels, both national and hyperlocal. Um, whether they're here in the room, because many of you have that voice in the community, as well as those that might be um, joining us virtually. So uh, just a thank you for all of the work that was done in the 2020 outreach efforts. We're going to go through the, um, the overall scope of the high level scope of the 2020 program. We'll go through the IPC structure to kind of get a better sense of all of the buckets and the work buckets um, that was encompassing of the uh, larger effort. And then we'll go through some lessons learned. We'll have some successes. We'll have some uh, areas for improvement and then those recommendations um, that have already been submitted uh, to this date. And then we're going to walk through current steps. Uh, normally, I like to say next steps, but it's really not next steps. We're currently in it um, and started. Obviously, as soon as census wraps up, we start um, into this current step phase for this ongoing work for the 2030 planning. So we go to the next slide. Uh, and I do want to say I'm a, a paper girl in a digital world. Um, so uh, just I know the, the turning of the paper might be a little louder here. Um, but the overall uh, scope for the communication, I want to uh, note, John uh, Sandoval, your comment when you mentioned uh, in your opening quote, emphasizing clear, concise, and actionable. 
And that is exactly what the campaign strived to do and we continue to strive to do with our communications. So communicating the importance of participating in the 2020 census for the entire population of the United States, blanketing the nation, um, if you will, uh, to get the message out about the importance of completing the 2020 census. Working throughout United States, Puerto Rico, the island areas and uh, comprising of American Samoa, the Commonwealth and the Northern Mariana Islands, Guam and the US Virgin Islands. Um, so that's like the overall scope, increasing participation, creating this awareness. There were several phases of the operation, um, an educational uh, phase, an awareness phase, a motivation and a reminder phase. A lot of that pivoted, there was six and we ended up and uh, executing four because of the pandemic. Um, but we'll go through more of that uh, momentarily. The overall com program at the IPC level was broken into two subcomponents. It was the 2020 partnership program and then the 2020 census integrated communications campaign. So we're gonna go through those two programs, uh, the, those two components here, and then you'll notate um, a lot of the sub work that goes on within those areas. Both of those programs were charged with completing activities surrounding communications, um, and that was done by both Census Bureau staff as well as contractors. And the goal, again, to inform, educate, create this awareness, and motivate the people to respond, the public to respond to the census. Um, so being across the entire country um, into the communities to get that message um, loud and clear, not through our voices, right? So our voices stop somewhere. So really leveraging our partnership and that local trusted messenger to really guide us um, to what makes sense. And then being that, um, the census um, was predominantly available on uh, online throughout the internet self response tool, the ISR tool. Um, we were motivating people to respond online. That helped optimize the campaign. We were able to tailor efforts based upon seeing the results come in. So um, that's a great uh, advantage and it's something that was very positive for the 2020 census with respect to the communications program. And go to the next slide. Um, this is, um, your eye chart here for the back of the room. Um, but uh, I'm gonna walk through this in the other slides sub subsequently. So um, I just wanted to notate here the overall structure. And then on the next slide, you'll see the breakdown of partnership component. So you'll see, just so you can kind of, there we go. Um, you can see that this entire area is the 2020 partnership bucket. You'll notate here, and as Director Santos mentioned, we work, we have the OCIA uh, office, the Office of Congressional Intergovernmental Affairs. So not every single thing that we work through outreach is actually in this chart, um, but this is the high level overview of the buckets in which we're charged to the IPC program. So we did work across the directorates to engage that external engagement um, down with our DDS staff, our data dissemination specialist, and our OCIA staff as well. So here through the partnership program um, efforts that we have here, we have a national partnership program um, and they worked closely with uh, large, nor large organizations at the national level, large nonprofits, really trying to get the scope broadly um, about the, why, why is it important to complete the census and how to message that across the country. And then we have the community partnership program, um, and that is our local regional efforts. That is my home for the 2020 census. I worked in that, um, supporting the New York region, and my colleague here supported the Denver Dallas region. Um, and then we have, um, through the, that program, we worked closely with community based organizations. Um, we worked with our nonprofits, those Chamber of Commerces. That's where we really start leveraging our outreach um, at the grassroots level, that hyper local outreach effort. The next section here we have in our partnership program is the Census Open Innovation Labs, or what we would call COIL. Um, and many of you might have participated in one of those sessions, um, but they generally drove the Census Solution Workshops, that initiative, and then we were able to tailor that both at a national level and a, and a local level. So that Census Solution Workshop was in the community um, at, at a very local level through that CPEP, um, if you will, uh, uh, acronym, the, the lingo that we, we say, CPEP. Um, and the COIL team, what they worked with, they worked with technologists. They were working with civil leaders. They were working um, to ideate ideas and to really try to see what can we, in a room, come up with, and then how can we leverage all of our shared knowledge resources here 
and take that to the road? How can we produce that? Um, so it was a really a communal effort um, at this point to, to run the COIL efforts. Um, and then that was a great tool that the other groups uh, leveraged very closely. So the overall goal of the partnership program, one of the goals, um, was to cultivate this relational organizing this, this, um, with external, or, uh, external organizations, bringing people together, uh, communicating the message as much as possible um, to participate in the census and, and having that strategic timeline to kind of motivate those individuals to respond in, uh, in time for that March uh, launch of the operation. So um, we want to use these trusted messengers, and that's where I, I think is, is really important, is our um, the communities and, and leveraging voices. Um, they're very powerful, um, and, and we definitely worked closely with them and continue, and we always welcome new partnerships and new stakeholders that want to offer um, some insights in, into uh, how, to, how to reach the community. Go to the next slide. So that's the partnership component. Um, and then we're going to go across and can kind of illustrate how the integrated communications campaign crossed over um, inclusive of the partnership program. So it didn't exclude it. It was just an added uh, bonus to have the, the crossover here. So you might be wondering, where am I in this chart? And that's a lot of questions we get is where am I in the data, right? So where is NAC in this particular chart? Just so you can kind of see your home. Um, you're in the stakeholder relations bucket up there, like that, that chart there. So we can see that included Department of Commerce, uh, Congress, OIG, Office of Inspector in General, NAS, OMB. So that, that's just to illustrate here so that everyone knows where your home was, at least in our overall communications for the IPC program. So starting on the left-hand side, I'll kind of walk through um, each of these buckets at a high level. All right, so on the left hand side, we have research and analytics, and this drove the campaign. The campaign was data driven, statistically driven uh, campaign, um, working through subject matter experts and also community industry experts. Uh, we, we leverage expertise across the, you know, the country as well as in house to, to meet the needs that we needed to for the 2020 census. Also within this research and analytics, some of you may be familiar with our CBAMS um, effort. And um, our CBAMS effort um, was bucketed in this group, um, in addition to census tracking surveys, um, as well as previous census data. So those lessons learned and that data um, from previous censuses help guiding the research. In addition to the mindsets and the audience segmentation. So that was all housed in the research and analytics world. And that drove um, a lot of the planning and implementation of the partnership and uh, the communications program. Going through the next bucket here, we have website development and digital act activities. So really understanding how can we support a large effort through a 2020census.gov website. So all of that work um, and the digital activations were housed in this particular uh, component of the IPC uh, structure. I mentioned the stakeholder relations structure already. Um, and then we've gone through the partnership program um, bucket so far, but I'm gonna just jump over to um, the earned, shared, and owned media. So what we generally call ESO. Um, and again, none of these terminologies are set in stone for 2030. We are welcome, you know, and, and it's also important that when we plan, we um, have different language uh, to kind of meet the needs that we have for 2030. But our earned media, so what does that mean? Um, media relations that um, the public facing public, um, media relations that are done, but not through a paid component. So right now I'm not talking anything paid. It's we're sending out a press release, somebody wants to do an interview, we're going to start engaging with them through media relations in that sense. Uh, we have the shared, so using generated content um, that shared social media posts, so others sharing the content accordingly. So that's considered shared media. And then and I'm talking high level here, um, uh, but uh, then we have the owned media component. So content that's developed in house and we're including our emails, our newsletters, our blogs, the webinars, um, and that's something um, that will continue as well. So the owned um, actual content and uh, information of the Census Bureau. Uh, on the next side, we have the statistics in schools program. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. That's 
Cue it up. Yep, there we go. Sorry. The next bucket um, is the statistics in schools program. Um, and this is, um, as the director mentioned, a lot of our evergreen programs. This is now one of those evergreen programs working in the school districts throughout the country throughout the entire decade now. It's not just for the decennial census. Uh, it used to be called census in schools in, tw in 2010. It's now statistics in schools to really have that home um, in an evergreen, uh, evergreen manner. All right. Um, and then uh, our field recruitment advertising and communications. So that was another initiative within the IPC uh, structure that we supported um, to make sure we have the hundreds of thousands of temporary workers knocking on doors and working in the communities, um, hosting our MQA events to really be present um, there. So the overall goal here and um, I apologize. One other note to, to emphasize here is that there's the also the paid component. So when I have that cross uh, chart across the top, that's also supported by the integrated communications contract. Some of that large contract effort that was done, I mean, some of, it was a large contract effort that supported this um, operation and then the subcontractors um, through all of the media components that were available. So the paid advertising and media um, is also included across that board with inputs of each of the other uh, components uh, with, within it. So the concept, design, develop content assets that are going to be able to be shared in the community, shared with the public. Um, both operations have the same goal, getting this message out, increasing participation um, for that, and shaping the, the platform, as many of you all may know, shape your future, start right here. Um, and that message became very important as we were in a pandemic later on. We were able to change some of the storylines and we'll get to that momentarily. All right, next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, and some of the pictures here are just for some added um, context and warm and fuzzy feels. Because uh, partnership, we love people, right? We love them. Um, we are people, people. All right, so the 20 census partnership program, um, we're going to have some successes recommendations for continued successes and then we'll go through improvements. So operating a success operating at the grassroots level was critical for us um, participating with partners and stakeholders and utilizing your message your trusted face um, in the communities and, and working together a strong complement um, to make this message uh, heard in the community. The human capital and the materials um, were, were really profound. Over 250 materials were developed in uh, 12 languages and in a total of 47 languages was within the communications campaign. There's obviously more languages than that and that's where we had hired staff um, partnership specialists in the community that had different dialects and languages to meet um, our, our community members where they are. And when I talk about the materials and human capital, um, I just tying a success and this is like a sweet success story that I personally will never leave home without again, but during the pandemic March timeframe, obviously we all knew where we were in March of 2020 um, March 30th of 2020 we had a baby born in Lenox Hill Hospital in the Bronx. And that baby is wearing a Census Bureau hat, a little baby hat. Um, so the undercount, I know Eric's like, yes, um, you know, the undercount of young children. So that initiative, working with our hospitals, is critical to get that message out. So being able to deliver through our GPO facilities, and nobody wanted to touch anything, they were individually wrapped, um, and getting it to the Lenox Hill Hospital through that partnership to get to that baby before Census Day. Like, Put a bow on it. That's beautiful. Um, so uh, then going into our um, mobile questionnaire assistance program uh, for partners in critical areas. This is where we were bringing devices to communities based on low self response and actually um, facilitating that conversation to collect the census response on the device. Um, so that was uh, very effective, especially even during a pandemic. We were at the food pantries. We were out at the food, at the hospitals, outside at the food trucks, driving people there to try to encourage participation, trying to meet people where they are. Um, we had over 47,000 MQA events, um, and that started J July 6th. So we had to wait. You know, obviously we had to you know tailor our efforts uh, to meet people where they were. Um, and then access to resources for the data to, to continue to census response and drive that outreach strategy is critical. 
um, another, uh, uh, several ideas that have changed. And these are not Census Bureau ideas. These are partner ideas. These are community member ideas. And to, the, the food industry went off the charts. All of that to go orders, all of that to go efforts. You're, everyone was getting things to go. So pizza boxes with flyers on it, census, complete your census today. Um, in Puerto Rico, we had pharmacies that would staple, they wanted a little pub cart. So we worked with them to develop a little pub cart and they wanted to staple that to their pharmacy bags when they were uh, administering um, medicine to their, patient, to their um, customers. So little things that go a long way and partnership is really about uh, that hand-to-hand -hand contact, that interaction at the very local level is critical. Uh, for the success of this program. But recommendations for continued success, right? There's always, uh, we wanna continue to do certain things and we need to improve on certain things. Um, so continued success. The National Partnership Program had a great research-based portfolio audience effort and they had a great um, portfolio of all of their audiences. And that's something that we, we need to continue. And we know um, we wanna incorporate that even further on into the local uh, partnership program. It's a great, great structure that they put in place. The GPO warehouse, being able to ship directly to partners. So having that connection um, with partners directly was really important, especially because uh, getting something to my house, then I'm gonna give it to you in person. We need a social distance. It, it was a difficult environment for all of us. Um, and, and it was successful to be able to ship directly to partners. A dedicated communication manager within the program is key and then um, continue to empower partners to create their own content, create um, their own messaging and provide resources and tools to do so. The next slide. All right. Um, yeah, man, I, I gotta get new glasses here. Um, so opportunities for improvement. Um, and I'm always one for wanting to improve. And I think all of you all here as, are um, supportive of that. So uh, outreach materials should be more representative of the communities they are de designed to reach. So making sure we're meeting the mark um, with these outreach materials, both print, digital, um, it needs to be done. Community served stronger data. We want that, that's a big focus for improvement. Tribal lands and rural communities require more targeted outreach. Um, so what can we do? Greater consideration needs to be done for that. And we're working, um, she particularly, works very closely on that effort um, at, for the partnership world. And establish it, oh, oh I'm sorry, um, challenges due to partnership turnover, partnership specialist turnover. So stakeholders, partners had a, an individual with the Census Bureau, but it's a temporary position. So people move on, they get promoted, they move to different things. Um, so how can we better support uh, our stakeholders and partners um, through having improved communications um, for uh, the new staff that might be coming in to support them to get them through the census? An established outreach strategy with toolkits to support the necessity for hyperlocal partnership. So um, that's an opportunity for improvement. We had some toolkits, but we know we need to make them a little bit better. We need to make them better, and we need to um, digest these lessons learned and these recommendations and move them forward. Um, recommendations for improvement: start earlier with planning. We always, you know, start earlier. Get get partnerships starting out earlier. Um, onboarding and communicating with organizations so that they can inform their plans. So hearing from us earlier um, so that they can start uh, planning their efforts for their outreach st strategies. And again, to complement one another. And I think that's the real key here is we want to be a sound complement with you. Partners who, who connect with other partners found it valuable. So this idea of networking, of even in this outreach effort, so seeing what do you have as a resource that's available for the community? What can I potentially um, you know, bring to the table and how can we work together to get our neighborhood counted? Uh, retain partnership relationships throughout the decade. And that was one of the questions here. Um, you know, how can we do that? And we are working on doing that. And already some programs are doing that. Um, conduct follow-up discussions to inform partners of their impact and effectiveness. And this is important. Um, one of our goals, in, in, in based on these recommendations, is to improve uh, how can you quantify the outreach? How can we say that it was a you know, particular advertisement or this particular event that I occurred, that I went to, that drove the self-response rate out? So really working together to develop models that are going to help improve as much as possible what, what's the bang for the buck? You know, what can we do to kind of make uh, this effort uh, move forward? 
Conduct coordinated communications targeted at individually historically undercounted populations um, prior to the 20, 2030 census. So we had these efforts for push efforts where we got everybody together, did a digital activation weekend on one population, did another activation on another population, but these were planned on the fly. These were planned, you know, they were not necessarily planned in advance. So how, how can we do that? And the recommendation being, you need to do that. So we're, we're looking to incorporate planned um, historically undercounted population pushes um, in, in, in a strategic manner um, so that we share that information and more people get on board with this outreach effort. Um, but overall, national partnership at over 1,000 partners, 1,090 or so, uh, working at the national level to get this message out, which is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, very powerful partners that did that. And then our CPEP uh, staff, um, you know, myself and Vicki uh, worked closely in this area, had over 390,000 partners. Um, but the key here, volume of partners, nice. The, the commitment, the events, and all of the effort that they did is really impactful. Um, and over 500,000 events were conducted uh, through the 2020 census program. The next slide will go through the integrated communications campaign. I'm gonna have to go a little quicker. Um, partnership, I like to talk. Um, so uh, the integrated communications campaign, as I mentioned earlier, it's data driven. You saw that bucket research and analytics that was driving the campaign um, and being able to optimize our, our efforts. So shifting media weights when we needed to, especially during um, the time frame when it was so challenging to get media time. Um, we were you know, challenged our, ourselves up against um, you know, all the different things uh, that occur in media, but we needed to mix media around, um, which was important. The shifting of the weights is necessary. Diversity of channels and formats that were used. So disseminating outreach materials, we were and, and communications and advertising, TV, radio, print, out of home, digital, paid, social. Um, and that was able to be pivoted during the pandemic. So we were able to um, probably, you know, I'm a big out of home fan for, for advertising, but it was not necessarily like the, the shining moment, but now it is because we're at the gas station pumps where you're getting your gas filled because um, there's now there's the, the digital advertising that was there. Um, the bus stops, all the bus stops, you know, bus wraps, bus stops, um, where people, where those frontline workers were working, we needed to have advertisements to get that message out as best possible in person. Um, the storylines needed to change. So like I mentioned earlier, we had the hospital information. Now, shape your future, start here. Data is going to drive the resources in this community, and this is how why we need you to participate. Um, and then um, the grocery stores, being at the grocery stores at different parts, paying your credit card and seeing an advertisement come up on the screen is critical uh, for that. I don't know if anybody, does anybody have a, uh, a um, what's it called, a dustbuster at home in their house? No? Yeah, right? Um, you'll never look at your dustbuster differently. I have a dustbuster, I use it all day long, um, but I also have four little children. Um, and the census advertisement right next to it. So being able to, um, uh, and, and that's through partnership. I see, I see Robin in the back. Uh, that's through partnership, but that that's the way I look at it. Um, uh, the national partnership of Target that supported that. Um, but again, it's all together, right? The integrated communications campaign and partnership. We worked very closely together. Recommendations for continued success: grow communication research expertise at the bureau. Um, so that is something that we need to do, and that's what's something that we are always uh, ongoing uh, work that we're doing, as we'll mention uh, momentarily. Having a PMO dedicated to risks, tracking the schedule, uh, making sure that we're um, uh, accomplishing agile operations as necessary. The structure of having a SME paired with the orders, with the contract is important. Implementing a centralized rec recruiting campaign. So that's area for continued success. We recruited over 3 million people um, and we're gonna wanna continue to, to, to meet the needs of our mission um, through doing uh, the recruiting efforts. And promoting partner-led mobile questionnaire assistance uh, efforts as well. The next slide. All right. um, oh, opportunities for improvements. So making sure I mentioned earlier the structure. So making sure the structure is outlined um, up front and communicated across each area. And then the requirements of the program, making sure that those are strongly identified up front um, is an area for opportunities for improvement. Where's the handoff? How does integration occur? So having the handoffs between each of the components um, really outlined specifically is really something that will help drive that integration moving forward. 
tracking the success of campaign ads in terms of traffic to internet self-response. So you saw the ad, did you complete the census? And that's the type of question we wanna be able to track as much as possible through the advertisement to see, did this ad motivate somebody? Were they completing it because they saw this? So improving um, uh, upon tracking the success of each advertisement and campaign. The recommendations for improvement. So consistent content review process. So establishing one team as best as possible that's gonna develop content review and clear um, so that all efforts are, are speaking from that same sheet of music. Messaging materials developed to support cultural inclination of historically undercounted populations. Um, and that's important. That's something that we need to improve upon. Um, and, and, that, and that's something that was successful, but yet we need to get, we need to dive deeper into that for the future. Messaging developed to illuminate the benefits. This is a, you know, we heard this throughout the census and then also the FRN comments came in, uh, solidified that for us, um, but it's what's in it for me at that very local level. What's in it for me? Why should I complete the census? I didn't see any money coming in my bank account. So what's in it for me? So trying to um, develop messaging to really illuminate the importance of that census. Transcreate materials. So emphasizing on developing materials in that native language and messaging and concepts in that native language, um, not necessarily uh, always relying on a translation of materials. So transcreation of materials. And establishing a hyperlocal communication campaign that supports tailored efforts um, is something uh, that's recommendation for our improvement. Explore contract arrangements to allow flexibility. And I think that's a great takeaway from 2020. We need flexibility as much as possible in a contract to support the forever changing um, environment that we're all in. And then current steps for the 2030 census. So next slide. All right. Um, is the intercensal planning of the IPC program. And, and that's really where the work is ongoing. Um, but now we're gonna go through some of the components here. Maintaining partnership throughout the decade, um, and that's critical for us. The Office of Strategic Alliance, um, formerly that National Partnership Program, is now an evergreen program. So that came out of the 2020 Census, and now they are um, running the show, if you will, for outreach and engagement uh, at the Bureau. And then we have the Tribal Relationships Program, which started in spring of 22. So um, Vicki here actually uh, manages that and runs that up um, with the local efforts with respect to our tribal nations. So working closely with them now um, to, to make this effort uh, in the future and throughout the decade. So the importance of all census data and not necessarily just relying on, you know, it's a big one, the decennial census. The census barriers, I mentioned CBAMs earlier and I saw some like, yes, some, some eyes light up. The CBAMs now based on recommendations and needs and that research at home is done every two years. So um, we are um, now hosting that uh, research uh, every, every two years for that. We have the 2030 Federal Register Notice where we solicited the feedback and requests from the public as to what can we do, what are some solution ideas that you have. Um, and some of those, as, as Deb and, and uh, Director Santos mentioned, are now included in our research agenda uh, for that. Research projects in support of the 2030 cen Census. There's um, several that are, are geared towards uh, partnership. Um, some of them, if you wanna look them up further, it's the improving communications, messaging and advertising efforts. Our MQA, our mobile questionnaire assistance scope determination. Our internal partnership program, uh, training and system support. So thinking of tools that are gonna help partners partners internal, external, um, and our enhancing external engagement program, uh, pr uh, project, sorry. Um, and that's where we're looking to develop, what are the tools that are necessary? What, what do we need to do um, from a research perspective to help support the convening of partners, the idea sharing, um, and the communication of that? All right. So, um, and then the last item here, uh, and I think I'm just under 30 seconds, um, planning efforts for the 2026 census test IPC operation. So as I said, it's really uh, ongoing work um, for in preparation for 2030 census, but we have the FRN comments, we have the research phase, and now we're uh, preparing for the 26 census test. So taking all of that feeding into the 26 test and expanding beyond for 2030. Um, so uh, we're very excited about the work that's to come and, and currently on ongoing as, as I am very passionate and you need to be passionate um, when you're working with people and the, and the public.
So just with closing remarks, I want to thank all of you here and the NAC um, for uh, your su continued support um, and ideas. And we do welcome uh, feedback that you may all have as we look to plan for a future of 2030. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I'll turn the floor over now for our first discussant, John Sandoval. Thanks, Cherokee and Lisa and Vicki. Thank you so much. Just two notes of appreciation. First, this is a topic, at least you mentioned, that we've been hungry for uh, for a while. So really appreciate its delivery today. And then also, as a NAC, we're relatively close to the decennial, have an appreciation for um, how large and how massive it is. And that only follows through to the communication and partnership program that's necessary to, to make the country aware of it and get them to take action. So to be able to distill such a huge endeavor down to 10 slides mm -hmm. and four slides um, is a considerable feat. So I appreciate you and your team and all the partners to be able to get this down to something that we can uh, react to. And then I'll, I'll, I'll also mention, you know, lessons learned are only as good as you take them into the future. It's not about looking back, it's about looking forward and putting them into action. So that is in the spirit with which I'll share my comments today. So on the next slide, uh, I'll be going through a little few uh, overall themes, um, specifically talk about historically undercounted populations. There's a number of references within the presentation. And then I have something to say about our research projects as well as a 2026 census test. I have a number of questions that I've already uh, Put down written form, but uh, I will at that point in the presentation pause. Uh, we have about eight minutes left for the agenda item so that we can prioritize valuable community discussion time and we'll close with discussion. So next slide, please. So there's a number of themes that emerged as I went through the presentation. Uh, I think dedicated resources, one that came up again and again, um, actually having someone who's prime responsibility in their role is single-minded. Uh, and it showed up in terms of both the partnership program, it showed up in terms of our the, the communication campaign, um, single content review team. So how can we increase the idea of dedicated resources? Hyperlocal was sprinkled in there as well and the importance of that on both programs. Also, how do we empower our partners? How do we give them the tools, more tools, the best tools? so they can do what they know how to do best and get our message out there, uh, leading to people completing the census. Uh, a note on Census Bureau expertise and structure. Uh, so that was something that was highlighted, both as something that's working well, just the amount of information, data, and just pure plain speaking expertise that sits within the Bureau and making how is that accessible to our partners, to the communication partners. Flexibility, agility, and responsiveness. There's no better lesson for this than what we went through with the pandemic and uh, the pivoting that resulted. So that's something that's only become more uh, important as we live in a, a VUCA world. Um, field staff, that's always an opportunity. How do we get recruitment? How do we keep them in? How do we uh, deal with understaffing when it inevitably occurs? So always good. And planning and timing start now. So it's always good to be easier and early. Next slide, please. So specifically with our historically undercounted populations, I uh, was really happy to see that the uh, notion of addressing trust and uh, misinformation was called out, especially before the 2030 census is something that we've talked about as a knack. Uh, and I'm glad that it's being mentioned again here. Also, the idea of trans creation of communication. So, um, you know, typically, not typically, but in many places, um, English language materials are started on first. You know, the agency is briefed and they come back with the idea in English and they kind of do a lot of work in the English. And then it's like, OK, well, we have to do this in X amount of other languages. So there's a process of retrofitting after the fact. And that just is not a best practice. Um, so I applaud the efforts to move forward with a trans creation approach to help things in parallel. Uh, materials that are more representative of the communities they're designed to reach. This is where we're here in this room. We represent communities. There's some, tons of communities that were heard from through the Federal Register Notice. So how can we make sure that is more representative and representative specifically in what area? Is it languages? Is it gender? Is it demographics? Um, the importance of culture and how that needs to inform and really make sure that our messaging works in the context of culture. Obviously, in language, creative and materials, super important. 
and focusing, yes, the end benefit communication. So what, what is in it for me? Why do I have to fill out the census? What is in it for my community? Really communicating clearly that reward that you get and making it um, something that's a, a one-two connection in the head. Um, improved targeting of, of historically undercounted populations, something we're all familiar with, but then the sub-segments we know and have appreciated sensitivity that these are not monoliths that we represent, that they are nuanced and the ability to actually target and um, speak to and have a conversation with those subsets is of prime importance. And also we have tremendous benefits of technology, but there's also lots of limitations. I was very happy that uh, tribal lands and rural communities, particularly with access to broadband and in other areas of the country. So making sure that um, to the extent we use technology, making sure we're aware of who can use it. And if they cannot, then we make sure that there are alternatives offered. Next slide, please. So this director center, thank you so much for addressing this uh, in your comments, the research project. So this was me trying to shrink it down. There's another two scrolls of this. Uh, and no, just reading your blog post already in the broad strokes, things like, you know, the 40% are dedicated to this, 9% are dedicated to this. I think that's something as a knack, and I, I, Carol mentioned as well, that we need just to get some kind of context around all of these research projects and, and how they fit together and how they're really going forward towards improving the 23 census. So I just want to highlight that for our committee uh, when we get into the discussion. Next slide, please. Uh, there's the 2026 census test. And I just uh, did a snapshot of, of what it's spoken about in one of the press releases. So um, really curious to see within that, what is the scope for um, the integrated partnership and communication plan operation? So what exactly will be part of that 2026 test? Um, and then how as a NAC can we have visibility and uh, offer uh, questions and advice and, and thoughts there? Next slide, please. So here I'll pause. I have a couple of slides of very detailed focused questions that I do not expect an answer to in our meeting this morning. Uh, so I would pause here, Cherokee, and allow um, some time for committee discussion. Hey, we're going to take about one or two. We're at time, <clears throat> approaching time closely, so the floor recognizes. Richard Pan. Thank you, um, and appreciate really appreciate the presentation. I actually have two questions, but maybe I'll just throw them both out, and then uh, I know we have a short amount of time to touch on that. So, uh, first question, actually, you talk a lot about partnerships, uh, but I didn't see a specific reference to complete count committees. And you know, you talk a lot about grassroots hyper local. I happen to be in California, big state. When you try to get grassroots hyper local, you probably want to engage your both state and also we had regional and so forth complete count committee. So maybe you can speak touch on what you're doing with complete count committees. You talked about starting earlier. You know, do we set them up earlier? How do we help support them? You know, is that simply based? Is that the states have to support them, or is there a role the Census Bureau may play? And then of course beyond the state, you know, going down. And then the other question really has to do with sort of connection between. Um, communications, what you're doing, and operations. So the message that you're going, and I hear a lot of awareness messages, but in the end, it's about someone filling it out. And I know that you know, you're know trying to, you do have metrics to say what the people fill it out. But some, um, I think there have been some examples where it seems like the communications and the operations, there's a little bit of, uh, they're not perfectly coordinated. And so how do we be sure that the messaging that we're doing is actually helping also support the operational part of getting people to fill out the census, not just the awareness, yes, you need to fill out the census. So for example, you talked about the baby ward, the census cap. I'd like to know that they actually count that baby in the end, right? Um, uh, and as we later we'll talk about, you know, the low response for um, for very young children. So, um, so that was great for awareness, but um, so uh, you probably can't answer both of those questions fully in the time we have left, but maybe you can touch on some of those. Thank you. Sure. Um 
Yeah, and also to to John's questions up here, I'll kind of talk to some of them at the same time. Um, but great point on the complete count committees. Those are critical, and I apologize for, for missing that. Um, but that is a critical component. That was one of our tools that we leveraged um, exponentially um, through the structures in which the states completed their state complete count commissions, and then all of the subcommittees, uh, the complete count committees at a local level. Um, so we are looking at one of our research projects, Enhancing External Engagement, the EEE project, um, is looking to define the timeline for what's maybe recommended for starting a CCC um, at a state level and also a local level, and then what other tools that they need, who should they bring to the table? So, so that is exactly what one of our research projects is, is touching on, one of the research questions in the project. Um, and uh, so that was a great point for that. So we are looking to redevelop that tool and see how can we make it more useful. And hearing from you is gonna be important to, to expand that toolkit for others. Um, we really wanna have, um, a partner walk in the door and say, how do I start? Where, where do I start? Um, how can I help my community? And, and being able to leverage and lay out everything that's necessary is um, through a complete count committee and other, uh, other tools as well. Um, I, I, tying to that, because that's the same research project to John, your question uh, two up here, what is the plan to streamline communications? Um, that is one of our research questions um, in that in, in enhanced external engagement as well. So working to, I'm a partner, who do I talk to in the bureau? And how, how many people am I talking to? And how can we streamline communication? So we're working directly on, on that effort within the research project as well um, and your complete count committee. For operationals, um, I, I mean, we are working on that. Uh, similar, I'm trying to think of which research projects. I, I am, a, we're doing a lot. Um, which one? I, I'm not sure where that new team I'm over. Oh, is the, the cultural com competency team? No. Uh, which team? The operations and partnership. Oh, the right. Great divide. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So she's, she's, you're running that on your own. I think it's just the ongoing work. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so you want to talk to that at all? Uh, no, it's just uh, the add a, add a step. Oh. oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, the add a step sync that we sometimes that you brought up um, our, our, our large operational staff. And then we have our partnership staff. They don't always seem to be in alignment um, and communicating the same message or, or the same time frame. Um, there is an ongoing team that I'm leading now that is is looking at how how can we enhance um, that integration between those two major components in field division between partnership and operations. So we're in step together and really supporting each other um, in what we have to do, like get in gated communities and gated neighborhoods and yeah. those kind of things, um, really supporting each other. We have time for one more question. And Hi, We're Janine staying. Abrams McLean. Um, I really like the fact that you are paying attention to the impacts of uh, partnership specialist turnover and other bureau staff turnover. But as you are starting earlier, and especially with smaller uh, CBOs, to also take into account turnover at the organizations, um, especially after the pandemic, and really understanding you know, or taking into account that a lot of that knowledge about the census may have been lost mm -hmm. and to really keep it going and educate people along the way so that there's less of a lift um, heading into 2030. That's a great, great point. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we experience. Um, so yes, uh, definitely well noted. Oh. <laughs> 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 sorry. The floor I wanted, to, I wanted to chime in a little, a little bit. I can't help myself. I'm sorry. Uh, congratulations on this uh, amazing work. Uh, one of the things that the, the paradigms that we're looking at is making sure that that in terms of our external engagement and all of this ties directly into that. When we go out to communities, it's um, it's. Um, how do you say it? necessary but not sufficient to have people aware that the census is going on? So an ad helps with the awareness, and it may or may not help with the behavioral change of not doing something to doing something. That behavioral change is most effectively done through peer mm -hmm. types of interactions. And so what the, the paradigm that we've been working on, and, and Didis can talk a little bit more about that, and, and we're collectively all talking about this as we move forward, 
um, is to engage and um, and work with existing community networks out there in two ways. One is to empower them with information and and uh, you know encouragement and and showing them the value of our data between censuses, how they can empower communities so that they can then tap they can use their networks, their trusted networks, so that you have pastors talking to uh, the congregation or teachers talking to parents uh, and at that level, as opposed to a city council person saying, please complete the census, because that honestly, it, it, it has some impact, but not at the level of getting at historically undercounted mm -hmm. populations. So our ultimate goal when looking at HUPs, historically undercounted populations, is really to tap in to the existing trusted networks, like in colonias or in inner city neighborhoods that are highly impoverished, uh, or in immigrant communities where English isn't being spoken. Um, that's what we're really trying to get at and we're exploring. Uh, Ditas, do you have anything? Hi, um, I just wanted to add, and I know Senator Pan's very familiar with this, is that um, partnership is not something we do to the community, it's what we do with the community, right? The existing trusted messenger ecosystems, and Senator Pan's very well aware of in his home state, um, and what director is saying is using the power of convening both at the local level and also internally, Vicki and Field, they're using the concept of power convening for the partnership and how to train them to do it. But we're also want to move towards data enabled technology. So we're hoping to have a very robust CRM, custom relationship management, because we got to map and leverage those existing ecosystems, but they can't just be in a spreadsheet here and a spreadsheet there. It's really about mapping them. I'm a visual person and want to see it. So fundamental to this integrated partnership and communications is all of you out there and the stuff that already exists. We're not going to create new partnerships. They exist and it's about finding those latent partnerships and lifting them up and providing the tools, uh, like Lisa and Vicky have said, to enable them to help us help them help their communities. One more. <laughs> Uh, I've been doing a lot of external engagement. I don't know if folks have read some of the blogs on all the places I've been, and it's only expanding. Repeatedly, we meet with the complete count committees in different places, or just even uh, uh, nonprofit organizations that helped out during the census. And over and over again, it, it, it it's amazing that that the groups that came together to help us in the census, they say at they said in, you know, since I've been meeting them, we cannot let this momentum pass. We need to continue it. So collectively, the Census Bureau and the partners and the partners that we had out there are in a very, very good spot to take advantage of the desire to continue and to advance that and to grow the partnerships even further. Thanks. May I? I'll turn it back over to you at this time, Karen. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you to our discussant and the committee members. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, but we're going to try to make up uh, by having a shorter break. And we're going to now take our NAC member photo. So we will do our best to resume at 1030. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. It is now 1030. We are going to resume the NAC meeting. If I can ask everyone to please return to their seats. Thank you, everybody. We're about to begin. Can I ask everybody to please return to their seats? At this time, I would like to welcome Eric Jensen, who will present an overview of the Young Children Working Group, followed by discussants Richard Pan and Arlock Sherman and committee discussion. So, Eric, please take it away. Thank you. Okay, I think it's working now. It is, we're good, we're good. Thank you, Karen, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eric Jensen. I'm Senior Advisor for Population Estimates and Coverage Measurement in the Population Division in the Census Bureau. You can't hear me? Speak up. All right. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Eric Jensen. I'm the senior advisor for population estimates and coverage measurement in the population division. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co author, Lauren Medina, who's chief of the foreign born population branch, also in the population division. We are co chairs of the Census Bureau's Young Children Working Group, and I'm going to talk about um, that today. So, what is the issue? In the 2020 census, young children aged 0 to 4 had a larger undercount than any other age group, and this was 5.4%. This was actually higher than the undercount for young children in the 2010 census, which was 4.6%. So the undercount of young children is a persistent issue in the decennial census. We've seen this for decades. It's interesting that other countries also see an undercount of young children in their censuses as well. And we don't just see this in the decennial census, but we also see lower coverage rates for young children in our demographic surveys, like the American Community Survey, the Current Population Survey, and also the Survey of Income and Program Participation. This graph shows the demographic analysis net coverage error estimates by select age groups from 1970 to 2020. For nearly all of the age groups shown, we see that coverage has improved since 1970. However, for young children, this is the blue line at the bottom, we see that the coverage, the undercount has increased and it's increased quite a bit. Again, this is a persistent issue. Um, it's something the Census Bureau has known about and something that actually last decade, we put a lot of resources into trying to improve the count for young children in the 2020 census. So this slide just shows some of the um, different task forces and groups that were formed. Um, in 2013, we had the exploratory task force, which outlined different research questions that should be addressed on this issue. Um, then starting in 2015, we had an undercount of young children research team that focused on you know, using existing data to um, improve our understanding of this. There was an implementation team formed in 2017 that focused on how do we put the results of the research into operations for 2020. And then we had a 2020 census under kind of young children task force. Um, and then finally, now we have the um, young children working group and this was formed in 2022. So the young children working group um, is a little bit different from past efforts, or at least those different efforts I went over in the last slide. Um, most of the work done last decade was focused almost entirely on the upcoming 2020 census. That was the goal. We're going to improve this, the count for young children in the 2020 census. Um, and our group has a little bit different focus. And I'll talk about that. But we are a cross directorate team, so we're pulling in people from all around the Census Bureau. We have subject matter experts in demography, survey methodology, census and survey operations, statistics, coverage measurement, and also stakeholder engagement. So it really sets this work apart from what was done last decade is that we're not just focused on the upcoming census, but we have four main areas that we that we focus on. 
So the first is research. We want to better understand why young children have higher earned accounts than other age groups, not only in the census, but also in surveys as well. Another focus area is data collection. We want to make improvements to instruments, to probes, to questions um, in surveys and in the census. Also, we want to understand better the coverage of young children in administrative records, as those are increasingly being used um, as part of data collection. Next, data products. Ultimately, that's our goal, right? We want to have the best data we can for young children. So we want to improve census bureau data for this group. And finally, outreach. We want to draw on the experiences and enthusiasm of the many stakeholder groups that we've partnered with in 2020 and keep those relationships going and build things as well. So I'll talk about each of these areas in turn. So, first of all, research. The Young Children Working Group developed a research agenda. To do this, we looked at research questions that were developed by the previous task force. Um, we also assessed how different research projects around the Census Bureau can incorporate young children. Um, we organized a 2030 research project. Uh, one thing we always stress is that we're looking for feedback on this. I've worked on research of the undercount young children for 10 years now. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that's been done, but we think there's a lot more work that can and needs to be done. And so we're always interested in people's ideas. We'll talk several times today about the 2030 Ventures Project Explorer. Um, I'm going to just mention and highlight a few 2030 research projects that are either focused on the Intercom Young Children or have a big component of their work on the Intercom Young Children. So these three projects listed here. Um, are led by members of the Young Children Working Group. So one is improving the coverage of young children in the 2030 census. This uses both qualitative and quantitative approaches. Um, next is research on the undercount of young children using administrative records. Uh, this project, as I said, uses focuses on administrative records and that approach. Then next, improving without, within household coverage using administrative data. So again, all three of these projects are led by members of our working group. Then there's several other projects um, which are related to the undercount of young children and they, they have a component on the undercount of young children and we're working closely with these groups. Um, for instance, the household roster revision, and we're working closely with them. Uh, the research to improve communications, messaging, and advan advertising efforts, the CBAMS project. We're working closely with them as well. And then finally, targeted quality improvement. So data collection is the next focus area that we have. Um, and we're hoping to make improvements to instructions, to probes, and to questions in both the surveys and in the census. So one thing we're excited about was the 2022 ACS content test. Um, and part of that test in, had improvements about how people list the household members on the survey, so that we call this rostering. Um, the improvements were not only focused on young children, but young children definitely were um, a big part of the uh, changes and improvements made to to that instrument. And so you'll hear later today actually more about the 2022 ACS content test, but we're very excited about the results for that. Um, another area that we're trying to improve data collection is we're currently doing cognitive testing on the age and date of birth question um, using the question format that was in the 2020 census. Um, we know that not all populations report age and months for young children in the same way, and so we want to understand that better. So again, this is our focus on data collection. And like I said, ultimately, uh, the goal is to have the best data products that we can for young children. Um, one example of improving uh, Census Bureau data for young children is the Population Estimates Program. The Population Estimates Program um, traditionally used the census counts as they were, as the base for the population estimates during the decade. Uh, this decade, we're using a new approach. We call this the blended base. And so we're taking data from the 2020 census and then data from the vintage 2020 population estimates, which would have used the 2010 census as the base, and then also data from the 2020 demographic analysis estimates. And we're blending all of those together. Well, when we do that, one thing that's really, really cool is that um, using the demographic analysis estimates corrects for the undercount of young children in the 2020 census. 
So this is a population pyramid. We have males on the left, females on the right, and then we have it's by age, you know, going down the, the vertical axis. And then we have different um, series of data. The red line is the 2020 census by single year of age, um, male and female. The green line is the vintage 2020 population estimates, which are part of the blended base. Um, and again, they use the 2010 census as their base. The blue line is the um, vintage 2021 blended base population estimates. And then the yellow line is the 2020 demographic analysis estimates. If you look at the population estimates in the blended base for young children, you see that they're higher than the census counts. That's because of that using the 2020 demographic analysis data. So this is great. These are the population estimates. The the, these are the controls for all of our demographic surveys. Um, and we're using, we're, we're seeing um, an improvement in the numbers for young children relative to if we'd only use the 2020 census. Another thing that's pretty cool about this graph is if you look at um, the population age 10 to 14 in 2020, so these would have been zero to four year olds in 2010, and they were undercounted in 2010 as well. And we see that the blended base actually improves those counts relative to the vintage 2020 estimates. So we see that um, this demographic analysis control is improving both the 2020 census in the undercount of young children and the 2010 census undercount of young children. So the final area I want to talk about is outreach. So we're working with internal and external stakeholders. And again, we want to draw on the enthusiasm of the many stakeholders and groups that we worked with for the 2020 census. Um, as you know, the Census Bureau's partnership program is going to be continued throughout the decade um, as part of the evergreening process with that. And so, again, we are excited to, to talk to stakeholders. Um, this is an example of some of the stakeholders that we have met with or that we interact with. Um, this is including, but not limited to, so advisory groups, uh, such as the NAC. Um, we've responded to several um, recommendations that you've made uh, related to young children, and now we're here presenting with you. Also, the Science, Census Scientific Advisory Committee. Um, advocacy groups, uh, Annie Casey Foundation, um, Partnerships for America's Children, the Coalition for Human Needs, uh, research groups, the Population Reference Bureau, also researchers from Georgetown University, and then umbrella organizations like the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the Count All Kids, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. And if you look at these different groups, you know, a lot of them are represented on CSAC um, or have been in the past. Okay, so we're often asked about why the focus on young children. People say, well, this is great that you're doing something about the undercount of young children, but what about other um, undercounted groups? And early this year, the Census Bureau formed the Historically Undercounted Populations Working Group. This working group brings together analysts from across the Census Bureau, including both business and household programs. And the group includes subject matter experts in the following areas, qualitative research, language and cross-cultural research, statistics, demography, sociology, economics, census operations, and also communications. So just to highlight a few of the things the group has done, um, they founded a Lunch and Learn speaker series that's hosted 10 speakers to date. Uh, this has been a really cool thing to see kind of evolve. Um, the meetings are very well attended. They'll have up to 200 people to attend these meetings to hear about different projects going on in the Census Bureau um, related to research on the um, historically undercount populations. They also implemented an innovative call for participants, um, which led to forming the people who are actively on the working group. And then they also supported four different um, scholars that were part of our summer at Census program this last year that presented research at the Census Bureau and talked collaboratively about work on historically undercount populations. So this group is excited to um, potentially present to the NAC in the future. Um, we just wanted to highlight them. Again, we get asked all the time, what are you doing about other groups? Why just the focus on young children? And we want to just talk briefly about um, that we do have this other working group um, that will focus more broadly on historically undercount populations. Young children are an example of a historically undercount population, but they're also parts of other historically undercount populations. 
So just in conclusion, um, despite a lot of efforts last decade to improve the count for young children in the 2020 census, we actually saw that the undercount grew to 5.4%. Um, in 2022, the Census Bureau formed the Young Children Working Group, and we have the, uh, the we have several areas that we're focusing on. And it's not just getting ready for the next census, but we're also concerned about data collection, data products, um, outreach, and and just overall improving data for young children, because that's our goal. So we had several questions for the NAC. I don't know if I like read these or if how we do this, but um, just briefly, we asked are there any research questions, topics, or methods that the NAC um, recommends the Census Bureau use to understand why young children were undercounted in the census. Next, are there any recommendations for identifying and contacting specific population groups for conducting research on the undercount of young children? And then finally, are there any specific data products for young children that the NAC recommends the Census Bureau focus on developing or improving? So thank you all. On. I'll turn the floor over to over this time to Richard Payne and Arla Sherman for our next discussion. Thank you, Cherokee, and thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm Arla Sherman. Um, this is a very highly promising model. Um, uh, Cross directorate approach focusing on problem solving for one problem um, is a great approach. Um, it seems like a, an excellent model for the broader historically undercounted populations working group. Um, and um, I want to Thank you, especially for exploring the uses of uh, administrative data in creative ways to to um, find missed children, to add them in the population estimate series, um, yeah. blended base. Um, it is great that um, that you'll be participating in, in in both the young child and broader undercounted working groups. Um, as you've made very clear, though, administrative records also frequently miss children or miss their addresses or list conflicting addresses or conflicting ages or other characteristics. So more approaches are clearly needed. Um, and um, there's a, a wonderful slide you showed um, uh, showing the problem of the net child undercount worsening in each of the last four decades. Um, and the and and by a long shot, so that now we're at, at uh, an overcount of more than five percent, the worst measured age, age group by far. And there's evidence um, from um, uh, your group in previous um, efforts around the 2010 census that it's the, the problem is even worse for the youngest children, for low income, for children of color. Um, and what we still don't know is the key questions of why, how much is this problem driven, and it's clearly more than one thing, um, how much by misunderstandings of respondents about whether to report children who may be related, um, maybe unrelated to the um, reference person. Um, maybe someone is not thinking a newborn who is living with you for a few months is meant to be counted. Um, or is it a broader confusion, not just about infants, but all the gray area complexities about complexly related uh, uh, people, temporary arrangements like a doubled up cousin and their child who are staying in your living room on and off. Um, maybe it's related, uh, third hypothesis to trust issues, and the fear of your information being shared with immigration agencies, child protective services, um, landlords, if you're worried that they might think too many people are staying in your home, um, and uh, kind of an issue of your 
a parent who's too busy and have no hands, literally. To, it's hard to fill out a form if you don't have someone else to hand off um, the baby to in your household or you're a single parent racing to fit your meals and sleep and shopping and bills and, and, and you know, everything else between your, the two hour naps. Um, and then fifth, you know, these are in last, these are on top of the traditional um, census barriers in many cases for many of the households like language barriers, low literacy, limited access multi-unit apartments where no one lets the enumer enumerator in. Uh, we know that these are interactive, that these are especially prominent for um, households with young children. There's some evidence each might be playing a role depending on their relative importance though, that might guide how much you'd wanna invest in the different kinds of follow-up research and then the 2020 operations solutions. And so you uh, requested uh, practical ideas for future uh, research, we're not census operations experts, but do have some possible areas to consider. And for that, I'm going to uh, uh, turn it over to Dr. Pan. Okay, thank you. And, uh, uh, and um, Mr. Jensen, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, so some of the things that uh, make note is, is that, uh, for example, on CBAMs, uh, that we could do um, more research uh, in terms of trying to explore these misunderstandings. You know, uh, I think you touched on it, but, you know, what uh, different rostering instructions, asking them if they'll list various hypothetical individuals, and especially if they're not related in their household, uh, that could be issue testing, uh, you know, issue fears of privacy violations. You know, we had uh, uh, before, um, what was it called? You know, basically um, people may not want to report children because, well, maybe there's too many people in the household, the landlord doesn't know, right? Uh, they're not, they're gonna lose public services, right, et cetera. Um, maybe they're worried about CPS or something, right? So, um, uh, so that, to what degree we can address that. Um, it's something a little harder to study and it may be even more challenging for someone who says, I'm from the federal government, I wanna study this. So whether we try to engage non-federal researchers and so forth to uh, collaborate with trusted institutions to ask questions about, like, you know, are you living, you know, are people are undocumented in the household if the household is more crowded, um, uh, so things like that. So basically trying to engage folks who can ask those questions uh, and get an answer, right? Or, or get a, a straightforward answer. Um, you know, we, we should be thinking, we just heard from communications, how do we communicate with folks? I'm a pediatrician, right? How do we do that? Um, there's also about, uh, uh, you know, so different, different places we can collect data. Um, and, and other types of barriers. But one, one of the things uh, that I, I do want to touch probably more on the operational side is, is that at least, you know, with the census, we're, tr you know, a lot of our emphasis is on, okay, you know, we want to get the household person, the head of household gets the, you know, the number to fill it out online or whatever, but that may not necessarily be the parent or guardian of the child, right? Uh, uh, that parent guardian of the child could be a, a, a you know, more likely mother than father, but probably with the young and a child, but you know, uh, is not, they may not be the head of the household, right? And, uh, or they may be couch surfing or so forth. And so the issue is, is that, is there a way, um, and the, how the household, by the way, may not know that much about that infant or that young child, and therefore less, and may actually not actually know how to answer the questions. Uh, so that's a response burden, right? I don't know what the race is, I know what the mother's race is, but I don't know who the father is, right, et cetera. And so, and that may actually create resistance to answering those questions as well, as well as those other barriers. And so one of the things we want to maybe explore from an operational standpoint as well is, is, is there a way we can collect information from the parent guardian, let's say when they go to a pediatrician's office, when they deliver a baby, right, when they go to a WIC office, Head Start, child care, and uh, they wouldn't know the person's address, right? They'd have their address, that they could somehow, information could be collected and then attached to an address that then connects with the household as a way to get at the person who actually may actually have the information uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, provide for the census, right? But it's not necessarily the head of the household to me necessarily feel comfortable providing it. So just thinking about maybe some operational approaches as well. So because we can try to keep studying, like how do we get the head of the household to report the babies there or the two-year-olds there, et cetera? Maybe that's not the right person who feels comfortable enough to do that. And so can we think about 
other, you know, certainly when we look at Ministry of Data, that's one kind of way around it, but maybe we should do more direct data collection from the parent guardian, right, and uh, uh, who wouldn't necessarily have the number to enter the data, right, because they're not getting it, but that they could report it at a pediatrician's office or a community health center or a WIC office or so forth, and then that data could come to the census in a way that they can attach it to a household, and then maybe that either helps an enumerator when they go to their household, or maybe there's a different way to use that data altogether, but to collect that data. So we want to throw that idea out there as well, right? Uh, and I don't know for ACS whether also that's helpful or not. So using, you know, finding ways to get the data that may not necessarily go through the person who traditionally we ex ask to respond to our questionnaire. So I want to throw that idea out there as well. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to kick it back to Arlock for some final words. Um, thanks. And uh, we will make sure you get slides um, that have uh, some of this spelled out. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight is that some of the recommendations we had were CBAMs related. Um, but some, I'm not sure if they would be CVAMs related because they really get at the fear issue. Um, and I don't know if it's possible for a, um, a government researcher to ask about some of these things, but one might consider paying non-federal researchers to collect, you know, university-based researchers to collaborate with trusted institutions, pediatric offices, churches, tribal health clinics to ask people in this neighborhood, do you think some people would worry about filling out a census form? Not you, too threatening. Audio check. Would some one, people two, worry one, about two, it? Or, or two, audio check. Ask, you know, one, two, one, two. Is, check one, two. Think? Audio check. One, two. Grow, but, well, what if this household had, you know, immigrant individuals living in their uh, home? What if the household, what's that? Oh, okay. And then check one, two, uh, audio the check. Thing one, is, two, one, two, uh, one, two, three, check not on the audio. One, two, one, two. I think, one, two. Good, I think this is yeah. good. Thank you. Um, Richard Ray is just a reiterate it of you could have an app or uh, um, other um, data processes where it's just very mechanically quick, easy for a large network of institutions um richard's being modest but is you know the, the american pediatric academy of pediatrics um and others would probably be very interested in making sure that at every pediatrics office uh probably you could get you know every way i can start to um to ask are you interested in nerfu here's your address we're going to send that to the census bureau to supplement a NERFO operation, and that's it. And so very stripped down. Thank you, Arlock and Richard. Um, that committee members, I want to reiterate, as we move into discussion, please pick your cards, place them to the side, wait to be recognized to speak. As you speak, please lower your card. I'm going to start the discussion out with um, virtual members. Are there any members virtually on the committee who has a question or comment? Do a second call. Are there any members, NAC members virtually who has a question or comment? Hearing none, the floor recognizes. Hello. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for the presentation and for all the work that you and others are doing to improve the count of young children. Um, I'm just looking and thinking about the data and the fact that even with efforts, the count continues to worsen. And I think within the advocacy community, one of the concerns is if we continue to do the same old, same old, the count will continue to get worse. So it's thinking outside the box, thinking about innovative approaches, <clears throat> thinking about what we can do different, 
um, so that we start moving the trend in the right direction. And I'm, I'm just thinking about all the focus groups that you all do, um, the data that you all collect. It's very much focused on why don't you fill out the census? It's not, or, or maybe I'm wrong, um, but you could easily use those conversations to get solutions from the community of, well, now that you understand, we understand why you don't fill it out, and do you understand what the census is? How can we work together to come up with solutions? What solutions do you have to get members of your community to sign or to count their children? So just like, there's some out of the box thinking that needs to be done, not only within the Bureau, but within the advocacy community, I think we're also kind of Pigeon home was like, how can we break through what we normally can and do something different? might use to emphasize the need to count young children, specifically talking points that they can bring up ahead of going into the survey. Um, as well as when they're discussing with proxy respondents. So I'm wondering, maybe that's somewhere else in one of the research questions, but targeted talking points or language for uh, non response follow up. Is that anywhere on the Bureau's radar? Was that a question? That was a question. With all these, do I respond now? I didn't know that. Great, because I'd love to talk about what everyone's been saying. Um, so a couple things as far as language and, um, you know, some of that, that stuff going into 2020, that was some of the things we did. We actually, because of the research done on the undercount young children, we changed, you know, that first question that asked about you know, um, is there anyone else who wasn't included? And we changed, you know, from just having like, like babies and foster children to like grandchildren, for instance, because we did work on um, household structure and the undercount and found that children in complex living situations, like living with a grandparent, um, that that made them have a higher risk of being missed in the census. And so, um, as far as as we move into 2030, that hasn't been something that we've initially like, like a, sought to address, but because we did a lot of that going into 2020, um, like, for instance, in the enumerator training, there was a whole little thing that enumerators watched about the undercount of young children. Um, I, I talked with an, a, an enumerator and they said, yeah, even though we knew that you're standing next to a baby stroller and they don't report a kid and you say, but is there a kid here? And they said, nope. You know, so it, it's hard, but that's something definitely on our radar is some of those um, things because we did that last decade and, you know, it, we, we didn't see an improvement in the undercount, but we're, we're hopeful of, of all that work. So again, that is something we're looking at. Um, as far as the comment on CBAMs, uh, we are working closely with CBAMs. CBAMs um, did a national survey that we um, have a couple questions about young children specifically, and then they're um, starting with follow with focus groups and we're part of that work as well. So we're really glad to hear that CBAMs is early and often like it's through the whole decade. Right? And so we're very excited to partner with the CBAMs people. Um, and we've had a lot of meetings with them, a lot of interaction with them. Um, Flo mentioned the community based approach, uh, and this is something we are trying to think more outside the box. Uh, the big research push last decade used a lot of existing data. Um, we used a ton of we we mined the 2020 or the sorry the 2010 census we mined the ACS we did everything we could with existing things but we still don't know why we don't know those mechanisms so that's a big thing we're looking for this decade so we are using different approaches we are trying to use community based approaches um, to understand and to partner you know to to hear why communities think there might be an issue with not only undercounting of young children but other members of their community so that is something that that we're looking at and, and trying to do. Um, 
it was mentioned already a couple of times, just like complex living situations, you know, the couch surfer and those things. And there is a whole 2030 project focused on rostering. And within that, the undercount of young children is definitely a big concern. And so it's something that that group is addressing as well. Um, when we first started doing this work, like 10 years ago, the big question on everyone, ha everyone had was, why do people just leave their child off the form? And that was kind of the paradigm we had. What, 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 what can we do so that people add their child to the form? But we know now it's more than that, that sometimes children are missed because the whole housing unit was missed. You know, housing unit coverage error, hidden housing. We know that young children are missed because everyone else in the household along with the young child are missed. But then we know that some are missed because just the young child's left off. And so um, we're trying to like have a very comprehensive sort of research plan that we can address all those different types of coverage error and all those ways that kids can be missed. Um, but like you said, thinking outside the box, and that's definitely something that we've talked about. And I think as Arlac said, you know, there's gonna be a lot of different sources and that's what um, my colleague Kirsten West, who's retired since this and has been working on, worked on this for like 20 years or so. And she said that we're not gonna find the kids in one spot. You know, it's gonna be all these different reasons. And, and we know that. Um, last decade, um, we we realized that a lot of children born in the United States had moved to Mexico and were counted in Mexico census. So for demographic analysis this decade, we did a big adjustment there. And so that's one reason why kids, you know, so there's there's just so many reasons and we're trying to keep track of, of everything. I did want to mention that the research done in the Census Bureau on this topic, it's not just our group. And that's one thing that's actually really cool is that there's tons of interest um, in the undercount young children. Um, and broader historically undercounted populations. So it's not just our group, but our group is, um, we're trying to be aware of all the research. We're trying to, like as we're giving presentations and talking with stakeholders, we're trying to make them aware of what's going on. And, you know, we're also looking at research projects that don't have a component necessarily focus on the undercounting of children and talking with those groups about, can you add something that would incorporate young children? So I hope I got everyone's kind of questions. I didn't know that I should respond. That's why I was very quiet up here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Do I have any NAC members virtually who has a question or comment? Please unmute your mic and speak at this time. Hearing none, floor recognizes Delane. Please introduce yourself upon speaking. I'm Delane Compton, member of the NAC. Um, I just would like to encourage you guys to not uh, skip over thinking about just the memory and how people think of their families. When I was interviewing queer couples, um, I don't know how long ago it was, we were constantly having to remind them how many children they had. And a lot of it's because of like, they were very specific, like, oh, I'm just used to only having to book a table for two because that one doesn't count. Like there really was a lot of this. And we also saw a lot of it between um, in that zero to two range. So I guess one of my questions was, do we see more of an undercount between zero and two versus zero, three and four or something going on there? Anyway, just, just wanted to throw that idea out in particularly related to when there were multiple children. Um, a lot of people apparently quit counting at a certain point and or forget the fourth child when they've had a second to, I don't know, in, from my own research. Um, so there was that. And then I also thought it might be important to really recognize that maybe them as a special population in the sense of like having an actual campaign. And that might be coming off a little of what Dana was saying, but um, if people understand why it's important, you know, versus thinking, oh, that, well, he doesn't matter right now or she doesn't matter right now, but soon they will. No, thank you. And that's uh, an important thing. So as far as the undercount and how it varies by age for young children, um, in 2020, we saw that the undercount for zero year olds was the, was the highest. And then that increased, um, with age. We, we think that, you know, once children are like school age, that they're more likely to be included. We also know that once they're school age, that families are less likely to move around. Um, that young children who are part of like young mobile families, you know, young families with a lot going on and everything. Um, there tends to be a lot of movement, but they tend to settle as children um, become like elementary age. So um, that that's definitely a concern. Um, multiple children, you know, families with multiple children, that's that's something on our radar, you know, seeing household size, because we know that that's a factor. Um, it also, you know, 
the bigger the household, there's potential that it's more complex situations. And so that's, again, something that we're, we're really interested in. Um, earlier, I didn't address the uh, comment by, um, by Dr. Pan and, and Arlac about, uh, you know, can we use, you know, some sort of app or, or something like that? And, you know, the good thing is we're early in the decade, so that's something we can consider. Um, the role of the Young Children Working Group is we kind of take in these ideas and we might not have the expertise to pull something like that off, but we know who to talk to within the Bureau. And so um, just getting it on our radar and, you know, we'll get more information about kind of what you're envisioning, but, you know, administrative records are a big part of 2030 and any way we can get information for young children would be helpful. So, yeah, that's something that we can talk more about. I have a couple of minutes. The floor recognizes Richard Chang. Yes, I had a question regarding whether two topics were being considered for research. Uh, the first is the potential impact of accessory uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, these are essentially micro homes that states like California are uh, heavily incentivizing people to build out, but may appear to be uh, workshops or um, guest houses in backyards, um, and as more families move into those, whether that might potentially lead to undercounts. And the second topic would be whether there might be factors external to the Census Bureau that the Census Bureau wouldn't have control over things in the political environment, such as uh, that might lead towards hesitancy towards answering, um, uh, responding to the Census uh, questionnaire, such as the citizenship question that was being discussed for inclusion or uh, political discussions around the public charge, um, where those types of answers might impact whether families would be more or less willing to share that information. Yeah, um, great questions. As far as accessory dwelling units, um, I mentioned earlier that there's different types of coverage there and undercounts, and some happen because of the housing unit is missed. And that's something that our group is concerned about um, hidden housing, um, accessory dwelling units are a good example of that, um, conversions or mixed housing where mixed used where it's residential mixed with commercial. So we are, um, that is something we've talked about within our group about research that could be done on that. And we're trying to connect with, you know, other efforts at Census Bureau that are looking into that. Um, external factors, that that's a, that's a really good question, a really tough question, you know, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? That's a huge external factor. You know, the, some of the language leading up to 2020, as far as like citizenship, that was a huge internal external factor. Um, we're also thinking about like kind of sociologically, what are some of the trends that we've seen? I mean, the, a big one that I've mentioned several times already is household complexity, um, changes in household structure. And this has been happening for decades, right? But we were thinking about what are the reasons why it might be increasing now? We know that it's especially, you know, that complex living situations are are much more prevalent among um, some race and ethnicity groups. And so, like, for example, in the 2010 census, 39% uh, of young children um, were living in what we classified as a complex household using a typology that the Census Bureau has used for, for about a decade. Um, but for like African American children, for Hispanic children, for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander children, um, for AIN children, that was over 50% for all those groups, you know? And so um, these are complex in that they're difficult for us as the Census Bureau because it's not our regular, you know, easy to household to go to where we can, you know, simply, you know, that. It's like two parents and, and a kid or two, right? So it's something that we're thinking a lot about. I know the rostering project um, that's going on for 2030 census is thinking a lot about how we can get, you know, people with tenuous ties to the house housing unit, um, the couch surfers, um, people that uh, just a cousin that might be staying temporarily. How can we get everyone? So um, those external factors are definitely something we're thinking about in our research. We have time for one more. Floor recognizes Richard Pan. Uh, again, thank you so much, Rourke. And I know I had a lot, really a lot to say as a discussant, but I, I, I guess the um, sort of to follow up what Flo said, you know, we keep doing the same thing. And 
and I do wonder because of the com complex household issue is constantly pushing on the respondent and rostering going to ever get us to that solution of trying to address the undercount instead of going the other way child shows up we know they touch certain institutions they're born they'll be you know they they'll they'll probably deliver they could deliver at home they deliver an attorney where they go may they may get ob care from an obstetrician or a midwife right they're going to go to the pediatrician's office or a clinic or family practice to get their vaccinations hopefully and checkups right um, they will perhaps go to WIC, right? Um, you know, that that sort of the first couple of years, right? Um, the, the sign up for Head Start probably in age three or four, right? Et cetera. And, and thinking about, do we have mechanisms to go the other way? When the child touches and we have partnerships with these organizations or these professionals or these institutions, that there's a way that we can collect the data and get it to the census that way instead of expecting the respondent a household who has a stroller next to them says no there's no child here right um right uh, or you know how they're thinking about the relationship of that child that young child who cannot speak for themselves in that household that's the challenge right so um so i'm hoping that we'll explore instead of you know I mean, obviously we can keep working on trying to ask better questions have the numerator etc but other ways to get the children obviously you're looking at administrative data sets but other ways that we might collect information that go might go directly toward that young child and the people immediately around that young child which even though they're living in the household if it's a complex household you may not be talking to the person who's most immediate to that child and therefore um for various reasons may not then respond that that child actually is present in that household oh um so as far as looking at new approaches that's definitely something that we're thinking about and you know, as people might have privacy concerns for young children, or, you know, they, they might be purposely concealing for whatever reason, whether it's like a lease agreement or something. So one of the 2030 projects that I highlighted earlier, um, that's being led by someone on our working group um, is looking at improving within household coverage using administrative data. So the idea there, like for young children is if there's a household enumerated and we have administrative records that say, you know, it's all correct, except there's a young child that they missed. And we're thinking about ways that we can use that data to either recontact or to just add the child. So um, that's part of the 2030 research agenda. It's um, kind of early, so I don't want to talk about like any of their approaches or results or anything. But again, it's something that we are thinking about that is outside the box. I don't think we've done that before that we use administrative records to like, you know, add people to a household that had responded or that either through NARFU or self response that we said, oh, they're missing someone that should be in that housing unit according to our administrative records. So again, it's thinking kind of differently about this and it's way to, ways to improve the within household coverage. Um, there can still be whole household coverage where everyone in the unit's not, you know, and so that's going to be a challenge and there's housing unit coverage, housing unit coverage where we miss, you know, the whole address, but that's at least one one way. So we are looking into that. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, Dr. Pan and Arlott. I'll turn it back over to you now, Karen, for the next topic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Thanks to our discussants. So up next, we have Joan Hill, who will present the American Community Survey content test, followed by discussant Nicholas Vargas and committee discussion. Good afternoon. I'm Joan Hill. Um, I work in the Decennial Statistical Studies Division, and I will be talking about the content test results. Slide two, please. So let's start off with some background on the ACS content test process and timeline. In June of 18, we solicited proposals for new or revised ACS content for over, from over 25 federal agencies which were reviewed to ensure that the request met a statutory or regulatory need for the data at small geographic levels or for small populations. The Census Bureau in consultation with the OMB and the Interagency Council on Statistical Policy Subcommittee on the ACS determined which proposals moved forward. An interagency team consisting of Census Bureau staff and representatives from other federal agencies participated in development and testing activities. Last year, we conducted the 2022 content test from September through December to test the wording, format, and placement of proposed new questions and revisions to current ACS questions for potential inclusion in the ACS data collection instrument. 
The goal is to implement recommendations cleared by OMB in 2025. Next slide. For the content test design, three random samples of 40,000 addresses each were selected for the control treatment, the test treatment, and the roster treatment, totaling 120,000. This gave us the ability to detect small differences in key measures between treatments. The content test followed the same basic data collection protocol as production, with a nine-week self-response phase, including internet and paper questionnaires, followed by a four-week in-person non-response follow-up phase conducted via computer-assisted personal interviewing, or CAPI, which lasted about a month. The control treatment contained production questions and questions from the three new topics, solar panels, electric vehicles, and sewer. The test treatment contained a test version question for all topics except household roster. The primary purpose of the roster test treatment was to test the household roster test question separately so that any changes in household composition wouldn't affect person level results for other topics. Next slide. For each topic, we assessed the results using various metrics that were identified and prioritized by subject matter experts prior to data collection. We nominally compared content test treatment estimates to similar benchmark estimates from other established surveys and analyzed item missing data rates and response distributions. For households where we received a content test response, a content follow-up telephone re-interview was conducted to measure response error. Specifically, we measured response reliability using gross difference rates and indices of inconsistency. The gross difference rate, or GDR, measures consistency between the answers on the original interview and the content follow-up re-interview. The index of inconsistency, or IOI, measures the proportion of total variance attributable to simple response variance. We also estimated response bias for income. Next slide. So the first topic I'll describe is household roster. The control was the production ACS version. The test version contained changes to the household roster question that were aimed at improving the coverage of young children and tenuously attached residents. Specifically, the test version was developed to evaluate a new set of rostering instructions for the paper questionnaire, including the explicit instructions for babies and children, and to evaluate rostering revisions for the internet and CAPI instruments to reduce respondent confusion and ultimately improve accuracy. Paper questionnaire has a space for the number of people in the household known as pop count and the names of people living or staying there. The internet and CAPI versions have respondents list the household members and include under coverage and over coverage follow up questions about living situations of people initially left off the roster or erroneously included. Next slide. For the household roster, the test version was successful. Although there was no significant difference between the test version and the control in young children zero to four on the final roster, there was significantly a significantly higher percentage of young children added from the second under coverage probe in the test version, which was modified to explicitly ask about additional children living or staying at the address. Household mismatches and tenuous connections showed no significant differences between the versions. The test version had a significantly higher percentage of complex households, though. The test version had a lower count discrepancy in the mail mode, meaning a better match rate between the paper form pop count and the number of names provided on the roster. For the mail mode, the test version had a significantly lower item missing data rate by over two percentage points. Finally, the test version indicated a pattern of less respondent confusion in the electronic modes, such as a higher percentage of added people who are ultimately kept and lower help screen access rates. So considering these results, the recommendation was to go forward with the roster test version. Next slide. For educational attainment, we compared the control to the test version. Back in 2008, headers were added to each section for educational attainment, including no schooling completed. After this, the rate of respondents selecting no schooling com completed increased, which may have erroneously included adults who actually completed some schooling. 
So to reduce respondent confusion, the test version collapses, no schooling completed, nursery school, and kindergarten into a new category, less than grade one. Next slide. These changes were successful. The test version had a significantly lower percentage of people with an educational attainment of less than grade one by almost a percentage point. The test version estimate of 0.6% for less than grade one is nominally closer to the 0.3% estimate from the 2022 CPS Annual Social and Economic Supplement, or ASEC. Although the missing data rate was marginally higher, it was actually less than a percentage point, um, in the test version, the gross difference rate was significantly lower for less than grade one, indicating a higher degree of consistency between the original interview and the content follow-up, and thus higher reliability. So based on these results, the National Center for Education Statistics recommended that the ACS move forward with the test version for educational attainment. Next slide. For health insurance coverage, we compared two test versions to a control. The main testing object objectives of the health insurance coverage set was threefold. One, improve measurement of public coverage and accuracy of direct purchase coverage. Two, reduce overcount of single service and non single service non-comprehensive insurance plans. And three, reduce erroneous reports of multiple coverage. Test version one added instructions and reordered response categories to improve clarity. For test version two, the order and wording of the categories were the same as test version one. The big change in test version two uh, is that the question has an instruction to mark all that apply and adds the explicit category, no health insurance or health coverage plan at the end of the list. Next slide. Overall, there was some mixed evidence to support the implementation of version two of the health insurance coverage question over test version one. And in the interest of time, I'm not showing the details for version one compared to the control since version one solidly outperformed the control across metrics. For version two's explicit uninsured category, the significantly higher reliability was a very important finding. While there were significantly few write-ins and reports of multiple coverage in version two, which is good, there was initially some concern about the significantly lower proportion of Medicaid coverage for male respondents. Ultimately, the health insurance interagency subcommittee unanimously recommended test version two with the mark all that apply and the explicit uninsured category. Next slide. The National Center for Health Statistics proposed that the Census Bureau modify the disability question to be consistent with the Washington Group short set on functioning. The Washington Group was created by the United Nations Statistical Commission to improve the quality and international comparability of disability statistics worldwide. This set adds a question to measure communication ability and uses four graded response categories for each part, while the current ACS question uses a dichotomous yes-no response for each part. The control is the ACS six-part set, whereas the test version is the seven-part set, including a communication component, which is shown here as part D on the far right in the test version. In addition, the test version has the order of questions switched and removed the word serious to pick up a range of difficulties. Next slide. In the comparisons, Comparison of results, the test version had a one percentage point higher item missing data rate. But this was actually expected given that it has additional questions and more res response categories for each of those individual questions. In terms of defining disability, the Washington group generally recommends defining a person as having a disability if they report a lot of difficulty or cannot do at all for at least one activity in the question set. This is shown here in definition one. An alternative broader definition of disability is shown as definition two, and that includes the other two categories, as well as those who report some difficulty. So using definition one, the test version percent of people with disability is significantly lower at 8.1%. 
and this would not be comparable to the current ACS measure. The Disability Subcommittee recommended that the ACS move forward with the test version and primarily use definition one. Next slide. For income, we tested a change in the ACS reference period as the previous calendar year, and this coincides with administrative data in preparation for their possible use in ACS processing in the future. Since changes to the income reference period would likely cause confusion without also changing the reference period for related topics such as labor force and SNAP recipiency, we tested the reference period changes for those questions as well, which I'll present later after the income results. As shown here, version two tests the calendar year 2021 reference period instead of the past 12 months. Other than the reference period change, version two is the same as the control. Although this comparison isolates the change in reference period, the full story needs to include a separate comparison of estimates from administrative records, which I'll describe later. So shifting to test version one, we tested question and instruction wording changes for areas that regularly give respondents trouble based on cognitive testing. And the interest income question is broken out into a separate rental question. Next slide. The focus here is the results of the wording changes for the two versions for income, which both had a calendar reference year of 2021. Version two and the control were the same except for the reference period. I haven't included that comparison in the interest of time. Version one compared to version two, version one had a significantly higher rate, higher rates of break even amounts for self-employment income and a significantly lower missing data rate for interest income amount, both overall and for internet. There, were, there was no significant difference in the net difference rate which estimates response bias for public assistance income. For the most part, the instruction wording changes in version one performed well. However, this recommendation is pending results from a forthcoming quality analysis involving administrative records data. To effectively evaluate effects on reporting accuracy for both changes in wording and changes to the calendar year reference period, will link content test survey responses to relevant administrative records and compare data from tax records, SSA records, and other administrative data containing info income information. This analysis wasn't feasible in the timeframe due to lag in administrative data availability. This also affects the SNAP outcome, which I'll describe next. Next slide. The SNAP version question test version question is the same as the control except for the change in reference period. Next slide. For SNAP, there are no significant differences between the test version and the control in the prevalence rate of households receiving SNAP benefits and item missing data rates. As shown in the table, the comparisons to the benchmarks lend support to the test version. Since the SNAP and income reference periods need to align, the recommendation to implement the SNAP test version is dependent on the income topic change, so the reference period will not be changed for SNAP in 2025. Next slide. Similarly, any reference period change proposed for the labor force series must also correspond to the income series. Both labor force versions use the new calendar year reference period and the control here used the past 12 months. In the paper mode, the two test versions differed in how the instructions were displayed and communicated to respondents. In the internet and CAPI modes, test version one and test version two were identical. Next slide. So for the labor force set, item missing data rates for mail and internet were either lower or not significantly different for test version one versus the control. Version one had lower gross difference rates for several, several response categories and no categories were higher than the control, indicating that version one had better reliability. Version two had lower item missing data rates compared to version one for the mail instrument. This indicates that placing the instructions beneath the question was better for respondents than the bulleted list. The recommendation is to implement all changes other than the reference period. So for mail mode, implement test version two. For the reference period change determination, 
Again, administrative data will be used to examine changes in the test version response distributions and the impact on quality. Next slide. The sewer question is new and only one version was tested. Results from this question would provide data for monitoring water quality in rural and small communities. Next slide. The sewer test question showed a lower rate of households connected to public sewer than the 2021 American Housing Survey. So this is a good result since ongoing research indicates that respondents have been over-reporting public sewer connectivity. In addition, the item missing data rates for the sewer question was within a percentage point of a similar question in a similar location on the questionnaire. The reliability metrics indicate low levels of inconsistency overall. Based on these results, the recommendation is to adopt the sewer question. Next slide. For the new electric vehicle question, two versions were tested. Version two enables estimation of the rate of plug-in electric vehicles, since the question asked respondents to include both all electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles when marking yes. Next slide. As for electric vehicle results, version two had higher rates of plug-in electric vehicle ownership than version one. We found no significant difference in response reliability between the versions. Version two had significantly lower item missing data rates than version one. Thus, the recommendation is to adopt version two, which has the one part question. Final question is solar panels use. Data collected from this question would help the EIA match energy consumption to energy production. Next slide. The Proportion of households reported as having solar panels is nominally higher than previous benchmarks, such as the 2021 American Housing Survey estimate. The item missing data rates from the content test are relatively small, although nominally higher overall than the missing data rates for AHS. Although the AHS results are edited, so there's not a direct com comparability between content test and AHS. So based on these results, the recommendation is to adopt the solar panels question. Next slide. So in sum, the content test findings support the implementation of a test version for seven topics, roster, educational attainment, health insurance coverage, disability, sewer, electric vehicle, and solar panels, and a pending administrative data analysis for income, SNAP, and labor force. So comprehensive evaluation reports for each of the 10 content topics, um, which contain detailed methodological information as well as metrics um, and quantitative results. Those will be published um, online very soon. In fact, two of them are uh, posted already. I believe it's the unit analysis as well as the disability report was posted Monday publicly. Uh, so, um, we provided the content test results to the Interagency Council on Statistical Policy, the subcommittee on the ACS, in mid-September, and they supported moving forward with these recommendations. The public comment period uh, for the 60-day uh, Federal Register notice is opened until December 19th. So OMB approved ACS content is slated to be implemented in production in 2025. Next slide. So a couple of questions for the committee. There are several topics on which we'd appreciate uh, your insight. Uh, we'd like to have your input on methods for increasing response to the telephone content follow-up re-interview, which measured response error in the 2022 content test. Um, we have seen a decline in the uh, response for this follow-up and it's going in the same direction as original survey response rates, um, but it's especially difficult when we're trying, when we're launching a follow-up for people to uh, once again, help us out and participate. Um, so any suggestions you have would be appreciated. In addition, we'd appreciate any suggestions you have for additional metrics that would be useful in evaluating quality during content testing. 
Um, we, the ACS does content testing approximately every five years for new questions and changes to revised questions. So we would look, we look forward to any recommendations you have to improve our measures and our, our testing for ACS content. Thank you. I'll turn it over. I'll turn it over this time to our discussant, Nicholas Vargas. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicholas Vargas, NAC member, and I'm delighted to serve as a discussant for this session. I'm so glad to be here, and I want to take a moment to thank the Census Bureau for meeting with the NAC today, and of course, thank Joan Hill for this really thoughtful presentation and the push for the NAC for NAC members to engage these potential questions on the American Community Survey. I really appreciate the descriptions you've provided and the thoughtful plan on how to consider alternative question wording and options. And of course, I wanna to continue to applaud the Census Bureau for continuously revisiting questions and testing varied response options to collect accurate and reliable data for some of the most very important issues US residents face. And just to remind folks, content tests generally evaluate alternatives for questions that indicate a problem. Those problems might include high missing data rates or low reliability, meaning the consistency of results for a question may vary a great deal and more than one might expect from survey year to survey year. And I'd like to encourage the Census Bureau to share as much information as possible on the strengths and limitations of different question stems and different response options and to consider the potential real life implications of these changes should they produce substantially different results. For example, on the total number of people who say that they are hearing or visually impaired or have physical, mental, or emotional conditions that limit or shape independent living and how that might go on to reshape funding decisions and resources available to serve disabled communities. Differences in the content test appear most striking for changes to the disability question and response options. And I'm deeply appreciative for the very new 107 page working paper that the Census Bureau published this past Monday on the 13th of November that begins to detail some of the specific results of the content test for the disability questions. In this document, we see that rates of disability were substantially lower in the new test condition than the control when new definition one of disability incidents was used. It looks as though the overall disability declined by over 40% when using this new definition one of disability versus the control. So the new definition would produce a dramatic statistical effect of reducing the population of people with disabilities in the United States. Alternatively, for definition two, the new disability questions over overall disability more than doubled when compared to the control. So no matter the new definition, definition one, or definition two, if adopted, there will be a drastic change in the incidence rate of disability across the country. Of course, it would not reduce or increase the actual rate of disability experienced, but rather our count that goes on to inform programming and funding. On the one hand, it will be cut nearly in half, and on the other, it will more than double. It looks as though the disability subcommittee is recommending moving forward with definition one, the dramatic reduction. So I'd like to learn more about how that recommendation was achieved. And I'd also like to learn more about the limitations of the original disability questions. Was this a case of high missing data or low rates of reliability, as is often the case when people engage these tests? Or was it perhaps more a reflection of a request from other agencies? It appears from the new report that was published that there is actually more missing data with the new proposed disability questions than the original ACS ones. Generally, I think it would be useful for the NAC and the broader public to know what led to the testing of these new questions and what are the potential strengths of these new questions in comparison with the originals. Moreover, it will be important to know how this potential change could impact groups who were not included as part of the content test. For example, Puerto Rican residents have almost double the prevalence rate of mobility disability as people in the States, and four times the rate of low vision or blindness. And it's currently unclear if and how this new operationalization of disability could impact our knowledge of how disability in regions with high prevalence rates operates and how we might be able to best serve these communities. Because people living in Puerto Rico were obviously not included as part of the sample for the ACS content test, 
we know little about the implications for this population. So I'd love to hear more about what's going into the recommendation for the new definition one of disability that will reduce the count considerably and whether more testing in regions like Puerto Rico could be on the agenda. We know that the Census Bureau is fully invested in outreach to all relevant communities and organizations. So it would be great to know the groups that are being consulted here and whether and how their input has been considered on these potential changes. And I know that my comments here um, and my questions make up, the bulk of my comments and questions here are really about the disability questions. And that's simply because the potential implications of this change are so substantial. Um, two other things did kind of stick out to me that I'm curious about, and that's the Census Bureau's pause on considering reference point changes to the labor force and income questions until upcoming administrative data analysis is conducted. And I'm curious, I think it might be useful for people to know more about these upcoming analyses and what the results would need to look like or illustrate to move forward or not with these new changes. So with that said, I look forward to hearing more about the, these potential changes to the ACS, which is a fantastic and instrumental national resource and to, the, and to the thoughts and feedback from other members of the NAC. Thanks again for this opportunity to engage. The floor is now open for any questions or comment from NAC members. Do I have any members who are virtually who have any question or comment at this time? Please, excuse me, please unmute yourself. Hearing none, do I have any questions or comments for those who are present today? The floor recognizes Dana. Please introduce yourself. Dana Waters, NAC member. Um, I want to thank Mr. Vargas for his discussion. Um, I, as someone who lives in a two-person, two-disability household, uh, test version two is inclusive of our disabilities, of chronic illness and mental illness. And I can tell you, you don't have to be an expert to know that test version one and the control version are both going to miss these categories. So I just want to emphasize that test version two really does expand to include disabilities that are not commonly thought of as belonging in the disability community. There's a lot of shame surrounding it. There's a lot of um, failure to acknowledge that some difficulty with tasks does constitute a significant hindrance on the ability to live day to day. So I, I, Mr. Vargas, thank you so much for your discussion. And I, I really just wanted to make that comment for myself and for my roommate. Or let floor recognizes Marlene. Thank you for Thank you to my colleague, Mr. Vargas, for that. It was, um, the discussion was on point, and I really, really appreciate um, the issues that you brought to the surface, so I appreciate that. And I appreciate the comment of my other colleague to my right, um, because um, I am a woman with a disability, and my disability um, is several, but one that comes to mind immediately is my degenerative spinal condition. And so on some days, I have some difficulty but overall, I function on a daily basis. Today was one of those days where there was some difficulty getting here. So based on question one, does that mean that I don't have a disability? Um, and that is really a concern for me and for members of my community at large. And so I would really urge <laughs> um, reconsideration of using that question. And, and I would really urge to just table it. Um, because right now it is not inclusive and it will miss many individuals within my community. Do we have any virtual members who have any questions or comments at this time? Please introduce yourself and unmute your mic. Hearing none, do we have any members here with an additional questions or comments? Marlene, do you have anything additional? Marlene, do you have anything additional, please? Okay. Floor recognizes Carol. Please introduce yourself. Um, Carol. The population um, that was considered or populations considered for the cognitive testing of these questions, could you um, talk a bit more about that, please?
Am I answering right now? Can you hear? Yes, go ahead, Joan. Sorry. Okay. And the question was about cognitive testing. Um, I'm going to start us out and then uh, I have my colleagues who can who jump in on anything I missed. Uh, so the cognitive testing for the content test generally um, incorporated three rounds. Um, and English and Spanish versions were tested, uh, as well as um, Puerto Rico in Spanish and group quarters in English, although um, Puerto Rico wasn't included in the field test. And so for cognitive testing, um, we had a lot of interesting results. And then they did, they did uh, funnel into the field testing in terms of modifying our versions. So uh, a quick example, and then I'll, I'll address the other questions. Quick example um, is that uh, Spanish speakers were um, having trouble with the independent living question, um, you know, and it, it was interesting for them to try and figure out, and it difficult for them to try to figure out whether doing errands alone because they are not native uh, English speakers, and I'm talking about the monolingual Spanish speakers, um, was not included in the question scope. And so uh, we ended up adding to the preamble and that went into the field test. And so that was really helpful in clarifying that. That's just one example. Um, but I do want to um, also get to some of the other topics um, in the time we have, but um, hopefully that answered your question in part. Floor recognizes Richard Chang. Uh, yes, I had a question regarding the test version of 18B. Does this person have difficulty hearing even if using a hearing aid? Um, I was wondering uh, how that question might have been uh, tested or vetted by those with hearing loss. Uh, as somebody who was born with congenital hearing loss that's quite severe and uses hearing aids, I can say that there can be a significant improvement with hearing aids, but there could still be significant difficulty. And so there might be some confusion around how that question might be answered. Um, in addition to uh, if that question is answered by somebody who isn't the person with a hearing difficulty, uh, they might not actually be able to accurately um, respond to that. Agreed. Um, it's, Agreed. Always a, it's always a concern um, in terms of um, getting reports on uh, items like disability, which doesn't have a, a true score necessarily, and it's perceived differently by self-respondents responding for themselves and um, respondents providing information for other members of the household. That is a, a certainly a concern, and we continue to um, you know think about how to really capture that. It it is a tricky um, a tricky measure because uh, especially with unrelated households that that can be even trickier and that's something we continue to think about and and um, try to improve but there's a definite divide between responding for yourself and responding um, providing information especially on disability for someone else um, i also want to loop back to um, the, the cognitive testing piece just to, to say um, one other piece on that um, so um, each topic identified specific topic topic related recruiting criteria. So for cognitive testing, we tried to recruit for the particular groups that would be most affected by that um, uh, by the the um, question and in measuring uh, providing results for the question. So, for instance, um, recruitment focused on parents of children with disabilities individuals with disabilities, non-native English speakers, and people 50 plus for the cognitive testing of disability. Um, so, uh, yeah, that I think that's all I had on that piece. And um, as I said, I, did, I do want to also address some of the other questions that came up, but um, please go ahead. Floor recognizes Janine. Please introduce yourself. 
Hi, this is uh, Janine Abrams McLean. I just wanted to follow up on one of uh, the questions that Nicholas Vargas asked, which was around the original limitations of, or the limitations of the original question that led to the testing of the disability question. So because there is there have been some thoughts that this is to the the testing of this question is more so going to align towards aligning with other standards used by other entities and so if you could just clarify that um sure i do want to mention um before we provide um information on that there is a, a panel um or a presentation just after lunch um sharon stern um uh one of our uh, our primary subject experts for disability will be presenting a panel with other experts um, right after lunch and will address a lot of this, these questions and provide really detailed relation, um, information on the process and how we uh, you know, came about testing disability in the content test and in the various um, other questions. So I did wanna point that out. Um, that said, and I do want to also field questions about the other tests in the content, the questions in the content test, if other people have questions related to that, because they won't be covering that after lunch. Um, but Sharon, did you want to jump in on this question? Not sure if Sharon's. I'm here, Joan. Oh, okay. Thank you. What is it you wanted me to comment on? What was the what was it you were asking me to comment could you, on? Could you go ahead and repeat ahead your and comment to me? Yes. So the the basically following up on Nicholas's question about what were the original ish or the issues with the original question that led to the testing uh, of the two new questions. Actually, that's exactly what I was going to do in my introductory remarks this afternoon. Um, essentially, this time there wasn't closer to the mic. Okay. <laughs> essentially, there wasn't something wrong with the questions this time. It was uh, suggested that we could improve the questions. So there was the same set of uh, five basic activities of overlap between the two sets of questions. Um, there wasn't a new identified need. It was the same purpose as we had before. But it was suggested that we could do a better job measuring it with um, the addition of the communication question and with the graded response categories. Are there any NAC members virtually who has a question or comment? Hearing none. Arlock, I see you next. And Delane, did you have your card up? Then I, it will be our lock and then Delane. Thank you. Um, so you uh, asked about. Please the, introduce yourself. Our lock Sherman with the NAC. Um, on the question of um, the. Uh, more measures for evaluating. Um, first, I guess I'm wondering if you could say more about the motivation for moving to calendar year reporting on the income um, question. And then one thought would be, is it possible to evaluate with impact on the quality of the, not just the level, but the distribution of responses is, and not just year long, but the ACS is asked throughout the year and by late in the year, you would have a very long recall time. And what uh, what happens to the, con to the accuracy for late in the year responses um, and since not all areas are surveyed at the same time in the ACS, does it also then affect geographic um, results uh, within the ACS when you pull the year um, for things like poverty? Um, I, uh, 
then I think um, there may be another question about the uh, the rostering too. But but uh, why don't I leave it at that for now? Thank you, um, Leanna. Did you want to jump in here? Hi, I'm Leanna Fox from the Census Bureau. Um, so I can talk a little bit about the why we looked at the reference period change and kind of some more questions about the timing about when we might implement. Um, so this is really meant to be a long term analysis in the process of potentially incorporating administrative records into the ACS. So the first step would have to be first, we would have to align the reference period with with the reference period of administrative records. Um, we are very concerned about recall bias, Arlock. So, so thank you for that comment. And that's something that we're going to be looking at. So that's that's we were never intending to to implement the change in the reference period um, immediately. This needs a lot of research. It's, it would be a, a major change to our income, and what we and and poverty as well. And what we would like to do is is thoroughly analyze this. Look at look at data quality. Look at recall bias. Look at how well these concepts are even aligning with administrative records. And so we're working on that with our national experimental well-being statistics project and other projects at the Census Bureau linking administrative records to um, household survey data. Um, so when we're looking at this, we're going to be thinking about implications throughout the distribution. We're going to be thinking about implications for um, for groups that are hard to to pick or to to link to administrative records. Um, but I guess I would just say this is this is something that that will take quite a bit of research to to really evaluate, and we would only want to have one major disruption. So so ideally, when we would be making the change to the reference period, that would be at the same time that we're incorporating the administrative records. So this this won't be happening anytime too soon. But we're starting to do the research now so that we can implement in the future. Thanks, Leanna, and I also want to mention that. Um, the report on income, the topic report from the content test, it has been approved and will be coming out soon. And also there was a question on rostering. Yeah, if um, I could, the um, presentation uh, here and I think in September to CSAC, said the um, zero to four results it, uh, had no change, uh, um, or if, if you could repeat that. And then the Federal Register notice um, said the revisions to the instructions may help improve within household coverage, especially among young children and tenuously attached residents. Could you say a little more about that? Yeah, so uh, discrepancy or, 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 or uh, yeah. yeah, what we were looking for uh, was an improvement in the test version for young children zero to four on the final roster. We didn't pick up that, um, it wasn't significant, um, but there was a significantly higher percentage of young children that we picked up from the second under coverage probe. We have a, we have a series of probes for rostering. Um, so in the test version, that second under coverage probe picked up, um, you know, a significantly higher percent of young children. And that probe was specific to, you know, explicitly asked about additional children living or staying at the address. Um, so that was a trend in the right direction. Um, Eli, did you want to jump in? Um, on the rostering, if I've missed something. I, I'm sorry, just so I understand just the room. Um, I think you captured it, Joe. I was going to say, if Eric is still in the room, he also um, participated on our rostering development team. And a lot of the information that he had was the stuff that we were focused on. So, um, you know, the FRN is, is saying like our intention was to improve those tenuous attachments and address those specifically through, you know, some of the wording changes that we had. Just so I'm understanding, there's a there's a probe that is also part of this. And if you'd leave that out, there was no improvement. But if you count a probe that will be incorporated into the revised language for 2025, then there would be an improvement. 
I'm trying to think how to answer this. It wouldn't be, I don't think, necessarily leaving out the probe, it, in, including all of the probes. We didn't see the effect on the final roster. Am I correctly characterizing that, Eli? Right, that sounds right. Okay, and I do want to mention, too, um, something that Eric said earlier. Um, there are a number of groups looking at rostering. Of course, it's it's primary. It's a you know, primary part to collecting our data is establishing that roster. And, um, you know, obviously the ACS content test text tested improvements to rostering in, in those modes, but there's a variety of groups across the Bureau that are looking at this and trying to work together on it, both the decennial program, ACS program, demographic surveys, because it is so key to collecting accurate and complete data. So, um, Eric, that was a good point. I wanted to reiterate that. Maybe there can be some follow up. I, we're not quite understanding how the probe improves, but the overall result doesn't. So maybe there can be some additional information on that. Delane's question. And then after that flow, we are looking at four minutes. I just was curious if there was a plan to start testing for sexual orientation, gender identity questions. There is a plan in the ACS. Eli, did you want to jump in and describe? Yeah, be happy to. So, um, the Census Bureau, this is Elizabeth Fuller again, sorry. Um, so, the Census Bureau did receive a request to add sexual orientation and gender identity content to the survey. Um, and we are currently in the process of developing a test around that content. There is also a federal register notice about that test currently posted. That comment period closes um, at midnight on Monday. Um, so if you have comments on that proposal, you've got a short window to get that out, uh, get that to us. But there is a proposal out there. And right now we are planning to conduct a test next summer um, for both gender identity and sexual orientation questions. Um, and I'm happy to answer other questions about that. Just Thank you. Floor recognizes Florencia. Thank you, uh, Florencia Gutierrez. I think I'm just raising my confusion <laughs> um, around the rostering of young children. Um, and if the new question that is being proposed will lead to more young children being counted or not. Um, yeah, I'm just confused because the presentation said there was no real significance, but in the FRN, it seems to say that it does. So it's just confusing. And yeah, getting clarification would be great. So on the final roster, we're not seeing a difference. When we uh, focus on the universe of that probe, that second probe, we're seeing a difference. Now, it's not it's not coming through in the final roster. We're not. It's it's maybe going in the right direction, but it's not rising to the level of a a statistically significant difference in the final roster for young children. And keeping in mind, this is a very obviously a very small group. Um, and it didn't reach the level of significance, but we feel like it's going in the right direction. Eli, did you want to add to that? No, I, th I yeah, think I that's not right. I mean, we, sorry, we, this is Elizabeth Clark. I, mean, I think we were, you know, un, not super excited with the results that we saw. Um, it, we were hoping for a higher impact of the changes we made. Um, but as Joan said, we think it is in the right direction and um, maybe more a matter of, of volume. So, uh, Joan, I'm not sure where that report is in the process, but hopefully that will also be published relatively soon and, and we'll have a lot more detail about the, the findings we're having. Um, what the probing is referring to is that in the internet and in-person modes, we 
ask the people to roster who's in their household, but then to help make sure we've got the right set of people, we go through a series of rostering probes. And in this case, we particularly in that rostering probe asked about young children who may not have been initially included on the roster. And what we're seeing there is that probe is working to pick up children. We're just not seeing a net effect of that probe on the overall coverage for the roster. On the results, because I think they relate to the discussion that's going on here. Um, the, the content test is often framed as we're going to go out, do this split sample, do a significant test, and if it goes one way, we recommend. If it goes another way, we don't type of thing. Um, but there's another way of framing that I suggested could be explored, and that's thinking about who is the change in the question supposed to benefit? So uh, I've often relayed, because based on you know, my research experience and, and such, and I believe it's evident in some of the, the work we do at the Census Bureau as well, that oftentimes folks like the historically undercounted or communities of color or folks of different languages, pretty much the, the segment of the population that we need to know the most about for policy impact often are represent the folks that are least accurately measured. And so one might be able to frame a content test as how one can improve the segments of the population that have difficulty answering these types, all types of survey questions, especially these types like health insurance and employment and income in a gig society type of thing. Um, and that matter, and it, you know, we want to help get more accurate information that you'd end up seeing a larger difference but the sample size by that time is so small you can't declare significance but that's just a a relic of the sample size as opposed to whether there's a meaningful difference um so we talked about that and the notion that there may be some additional analyses i don't know if that's coming out in the ultimately in the report uh, that is being released or not uh, but we had a, a really nice discussion about how to think about these tests and where to look for improvements because typically if 80 or 90 percent of the of the population is going to understand and accurately answer the question regardless of which version it is and the other 10 percent isn't then when you mush them together the significance is going to go down Thank you, Joan and Nicholas, for, for that discussion. I will turn it up back over to Karen at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joan. Thank you to our discussant. Uh, at this time, we are ready to break for lunch, and we will resume the meeting at 1.10 p.m. Thanks.
from a meeting in just one moment. So stand by, please. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the NAC meeting. So let's move on to our next presentation. Uh, let's welcome Sharon Stern, Julie Weeks, Susan Popkin, and Andrew Houghtonville, who will present on data collection efforts for the disability community, followed by discussant Marlene Sayo and committee discussion. Take it away, Sharon. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your interest in this topic. Um, the NAC uh, request to discuss disability mentioned three surveys, the American Community Survey, the Current Population Survey, and the Survey of Income and Program Participation. Today, I'm going to discuss two of them. While the Census Bureau is a co-sponsor of the Current Population Survey, it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics who decides what questions to add to the basic monthly. Um, it is their requirement to produce uh, employment statistics for people with disabilities, and they've chosen the same six standard questions. I'm going to start with the Americans with Disabilities reports. This series was very, very popular. Um, the reports use data from adult and child functional limitation topical modules. At the time, SIP interviewed the same people every four months for two to four years. Topical modules were supplemental questionnaires asked on an occasional basis during a regular SIP interview. These reports were generally released two to four years after the data were collected. SIP underwent a redesign with a goal of reducing cost and respondent burden and improving data quality and timeliness. The new instrument was a complete redevelopment built around changing the survey reference period from four months to one year. The new design introduced an event history calendar to enhance the respondents' ability to recall events accurately over the longer reference period. This design does not include topical modules. In 2014, the SIP did field a special supplement sponsored by the Social Security Administration. 
Supplement was quite different from topical modules in the earlier SIP. It was an independent follow on survey by telephone several months after the original interview. We did produce a report. However, the estimates produced raised questions. Using the SSA supplement, the report found that 27.2% of people uh, had a disability in 2014. That's of the civilian non institutionalized population. That estimate was not comparable to the previous reports in the series. The 2010 report showed that 18.7% of the population had a disability. Um, so, in addition to the standard six questions, the current SIP includes a question about developmental delays for those under age five. For those five to 14 years old, the survey asked about difficulty playing with other children and limitations in the ability to do schoolwork. Work related questions are asked of individuals 15 years and older. The questions cover difficulty finding or keeping a job, limitations in the kind or amount of work, um, and being prevented from work at all. Beginning with the 2021 SIP, uh, content was added that was sponsored by the Social Security Administration. These include three questions to capture aspects of functioning, sitting, lifting, and grasping. We ask whether uh, the respondent has a learning disability or a mental or emotional condition, and we ask whether the person has a health condition lasting 12 months or longer that limits daily activities, and then we ask what the conditions are. We worked hard to get SIP on a more regular schedule, and we've done that. Each year, we release a public use data file with the previous year's results. Um, we also produce a number of briefs and table packages on other content, uh, but we've really just started to explore the new data on the SSA sponsored content. We've released the numeric account story um, and given this rich data set, we look forward to working more with those data. And now as time permits, we do hope to put out additional products. It was hard to pick a starting point for describing the ACS. Before the ACS, the decennial census was the source of estimates of the characteristics of the population, and disability was one of the characteristics asked of a sample of the population on what was then called the long form. So let me start with the process that led to the census 2000 questions. Uh, the technical advisory panel was not satisfied at, with the results of the 1996 national content test, and they didn't feel that they could recommend those questions for census 2000. So another federal interagency work group was convened by the Office of Management and Budget. The article referenced on the slide describes the process, but in summary, the group reviewed and analyzed the needs, asking questions like, what agencies need disability statistics for small geographic areas? Does that agency have a legislation that mandates statistics from the census? The group grappled with what aspects of disability could be collected on the census, and there's some notes I really want to have this background and tell you all about. One is that the long form was a sample survey. The questionnaires were all paper. It was a mail out, mail back self response on paper. The non response follow up and the areas that couldn't be reached by mail had enumerators who also used paper. So it was an all paper census. Um, that'll come into play in a minute. At the same time, during the late 1990s, the ACS was in development in select counties. In 2000, ACS did a national level data collection, and this was critical proof of concept because the census had to show that we were able to collect ACS concurrent with a decennial census and have equal quality. As such, the content of the ACS was the same as the decennial wherever possible. Um, some cops concepts had to be adapted, but disability was the same on both. Um, but there's a key difference. The ACS non-response follow-up was conducted in a computer-assisted interview, um, either by telephone or in person. So from the beginning, ACS was already rolling out improvements to what the decennial was able to accomplish with the long form. Um, and just for context, the demonstration phase, which is what ACS was before full implementation, lasted from 2000 to 2004. 
Um, before I talk about the next two content tests, I want to take a quick pause to talk about a paper questionnaire change that happened in 2003. We are constantly reviewing data, evaluating, and doing analysis to show that these data are correct and complete. The evaluation of Census 2000 and the American Community Survey data, those collected at the same time, did reveal a problem with the skip pattern. We do collect, uh, excuse me, we do correct errors. This was something that had to be corrected, um, and we were able to introduce that correction in 2003. Um, also in 2003, coincidentally, um, there was a discussion about the next cycle of content for ACS. What would the ACS be going forward? So OMB asked people uh, if they had topics that needed to be changed, new content, what the ACS was going to be in the future. Um, and in response to that, OMB formed an interagency committee led by NCHS to discuss the disability. As had been done in the prior decennial censuses, the first the group first reviewed the legislative and programmatic need. Additionally, the work group attempted to use the same space to meet the distinct goals. Paper was still the predominant mode, and after assessing the need, the work group had to determine what survey questions both met the need and fit in the same space on the paper form. <laughs> Um, in practice, that meant that at that time, the group could not consider adding more items or expanding answer categories. There was just so much space that the committee could, con could consider. So that group identified four basic areas of functioning, vision, hearing, mobility, and cognitive functioning that identified the largest component of people with disabilities. These domains they expected could be used individually or combined to assess equity and outcomes for people with disabilities, a primary purpose of having disability on the decennial census and in the ACS. Second, the group identified two key elements that could be used for monitoring dependent living and the need for services. Ability to take care of oneself, specifically bathe and dress, and the ability to move around the community without assistance were considered appropriate for this purpose. This slide contains the wording of the current ACS questions, those used since 2008. The answer choices are yes, no to each, and there is a skip pattern. Children under age five only get the first two questions. Children five to 14 get the first five questions, and people 15 and older get all the items. Um, I want to talk very briefly, I know a lot of you are aware, but I'll say that what the ACS produced is an incredible amount of data on a regular basis. Um, many tables, for example, just in our detailed table package on the disability content, we have 25 tables for the one year data. And these are repeated for all geographic areas that meet the population thresholds. Um, this is in addition to subject tables, data profiles and maps. Um, and that doesn't even begin to hit on the supplemental tables and the five-year data products. We also do a number of analytic products. Um, these generally include statements that are tested for statistical significance and provide some analysis. Mm -hmm. Shown here is an example that includes some America Count stories, uh, ACS briefs, and working papers. Um, and we make these available as well. So I know you heard from Joan this morning and we began the conversation. There was some feedback already and discussion um, about this most recent cycle. But I wanna reiterate that we use the same process as we have in previous iterations. Under OMB and the Interagency Committee for Statistical Policy for the ACS, we asked agencies to let us know what new needs had been identified or question changes were needed. The request came in that ACS should use the Washington group short set. And the justification was clear that there was not a new need identified, just an improvement in measurement. The Washington group set asks about five of the same basic activities, seeing, hearing, cognition, ambulation, and self-care. The Washington group 
set also includes a question on communication that ACS did not have. Um, and the scale response instead of the dichotomous yes, no. As Julie will discuss, the Washington group questions have been around for a while, so why now? I want to make clear that the operational environment has changed since 2008. Not too much of a surprise. We have the internet self-response option, which has become ever more popular and a larger portion of our response in ACS. Additionally, we've had a change in the size and layout of the paper form. This time around, ACS did not need to restrict the disability items to that same space on the paper questionnaire. Um, however, it was important to determine whether the questions functioned in the ACS environment. So the goal of the interagency group this time was focused much more on how best to include the questions and evaluating that they worked well. Um, that's it for me. I'm handing it over to Julie. Thank you, Sharon. Hello, everyone. Thank you to the committee members, Director Santos, for having me. Um, I am going to provide some background information about the Washington Group on Disability Statistics. And one of the question sets developed by that group, the short set on functioning, which is uh, our topic today. So let's start with what is the Washington Group? The, the Washington Group is what's called a U, United Nations City Group. Groups um, that are formed by the UN Statistical Commission to address specific statistical or methodological issues of broad concern to national statistical offices worldwide. It, it, the Washington Group, was founded more than 20 years ago following a meeting that's that the Statistical Division organized in 2001, this Measurement of Disability Seminar. And central to that purpose of that meeting was addressing the state of international disability statistics at that time. There were different conceptualizations, measures, poor quality data, and a general lack of standardization across countries in the way disability was collected in their data collections, primarily the censuses. A number of recommendations were made at the conclusion of this meeting, which was attended by more than 100 subject matter experts from national statistical offices. And one of those recommendations was the formation of a city group to develop implement, disseminate, and support improvements in the field. So following that, um, at the request of the U.S. Chief Statistician, NCHS, which is the principal health statistics agency in the federal statistical system, was asked to organize the first meeting, which was held in Washington, D.C. City groups are typically named after the city in which they first meet, just like the Pariah Group on Governance Statistics or the Titchfield City Group on Aging uh, Related Statistics, which Census has membership on as well. It was at that meeting in 2002 that some of the basic requirements of the group were endorsed, which was to develop question sets that would provide internationally comparable disability data and to do so by starting with initially a short set of questions that could be included in censuses, given that in most countries, the census is the primary data collection um, uh, method. The group would then turn its attention to longer sets of questions that included additional types of functioning, use of assistive devices, aspects of the environment, and measures of participation, and they have done that. Membership in the Washington Group currently stands at 168 national statistical offices and agencies, and the group is country-run, which means that the members who participate in the group also drive both the governance and the work plan of the group. NCHS was asked to provide coordination and agreed to re the request to chair the group. The steering committee and many of the work groups have representation from all regions of the world, and there is a website containing all of the Washington group, which is public facing. 
In addition to national statistical offices, there have been from its inception, a large um, and broad range of disability actors that have been participating in supporting or doing the work of the Washington group. This includes development agencies that have provided support to national and international organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as umbrella organizations and agencies across the UN system. So this was a quick and brief introduction to the Washington group, including why the initial work focuses on a brief set of questions for the censuses. But let's move to the development of the short set. There is little need to convince this committee and many of attending virtually that there is a need for high quality, comparable disability data that extends beyond the US. The Washington group members began the work by clearly stating those needs to provide information that in some places was and still is non-existent, to inform policies and programs and to provide resources and actions, and most importantly, and I will return to this theme again and again, to monitor inclusion. It is important to note that there are differing needs for data, which lead to varying decisions regarding measurement. Population-based estimate making is a different need than program eligibility determination, for example. The Washington group members for them, the use of data to inform policies and monitoring national and international commitments to ensure full participation in society for all people was and is of critical importance, especially in light of ensuring that countries comply with the UNCRPD and for reporting the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. There are other objectives that were agreed upon. This set had to identify persons with similar types and degree of limitations, regardless of nationality or culture. That is, that the group identified as with disabilities had to be consistent in terms of their functional characteristics and the severity of their limitation, again, for international comparability. The set also had to represent the majority, but like the ACS set, not all persons with limitations that are common to all people. Additional add on questions can increase the scope of who is an who is identified, but for the purposes of a census or other settings where space is extremely limited, the set had to represent the most commonly occurring limitations and functional difficulties. Finally, in recognizing that functioning and disability occur along a continuum and no one single number is representative of the diverse array of functional experiences, that set had to capture the full spectrum of functioning by using a graded response set. These were the agreed upon stipulations by the Washington group. And given all of these and rejecting an earlier impairment based medical model of disability, the Washington group defined an approach to measuring disability based on identifying those who, because of difficulties doing certain universal basic actions, are at greater risk than the general population for limitations in participation. Furthermore, the framework for this approach to conceptualizing disability is the ICF. Which, provi which provides a conceptual representation of the disablement process by identifying the basic individual and social components involved in that process. The model also provides a general but non-specific indication of the possible relationships among the components, nor does it indicate exactly where to place measurement or specifically how. For the Washington group's purposes, the relationship between functioning, as noted in green, the activities of limitation, and the outcomes in terms of participation in civic and social and personal life 
was of utmost importance so that no matter what a person's functioning level, the goal is to maximize their participation in society. It would also provide the best information needed to monitor disparity gaps and inclusion. So, as I've indicated, this focus on equity or equalization of opportunities is absolutely central to the purpose of the Washington group sets. To achieve equity in any outcome of interest, and here there is a, a bar chart um, of employment, um, in order to achieve equity, the percent of people with disabilities who are employed must equal that of people without dis disabilities. If those bars are not equal, then there is an equity gap. Identifying and monitoring those equity gaps provides important information to guide policies that will reduce those disparities. So we can know the prevalence of a group, but it does not tell us where to direct those policies. It doesn't tell us where the disparities are, and it doesn't tell us how to address those disparities. From a human rights perspective, this is called equalization of opportunities. The six questions on this short set um, are shown here on the slide. I think many of the many of you may already know them. Um, and as Sharon pointed out, for the most part, the domains of functioning outlined in the set are the same as those in the ACS. But given the strong commitment to not endorse disability as a single number or as a dichotomy. The response set includes four levels of functional severity from no difficulty to cannot do it all. While capturing these levels of functional difficulty comprise the main impetus for proposing a change in the ACS measurement, this change would also add that question on difficulties with communication, which the Washington group felt was very important. Sharon already mentioned that the independence question, this idea, um, the ACS question on difficulty running errands alone or shopping is not part of the Washington group short set. It is in the evaluate in the census evaluation and it is in the proposal, but for the short set where this is used internationally, the circumstances and the environment surrounding running errands and going shopping, that means something very different in across different countries. So for that purpose, it's not in the short set, but it is in the census evaluation. Also, it should be noted that the Washington group recommended cutoff for defining, defining the population with disabilities is any, a lot of difficulty, or cannot do across the six questions. That is, the levels and types of difficulties reported in focus groups and cognitive testing evaluations across thousands of respondents who provided an answer of a lot or cannot do were most similar in severity, magnitude, and impact compared with the narratives that those who indicated some difficulty provided. Given the purpose of disaggregation to assess equalization of opportunity, the set had to produce data where homogeneity within groups and heterogeneity across groups was maximized. Between 2002 and 2006, testing of the set occurred in more than 30 countries and was supported by partners including the World Bank, Australia, WHO and UNESCO. This isn't the only testing that has occurred with the short set or any of the other sets that is ongoing, but it is the testing that occurred in that four year period leading up to the endorsement and adoption of the short set for international use. That adoption occurred in 2006. That's outlined here in a red star. Um, I know that's a very hard to read slide. It just tipped. It's a timeline of some of the major disability events um, across the spectrum. Today, the short set is included in national data collections in more than 120 countries 
And in many cases, the set is in both their censuses as well as other survey operations, such as health, labor, or living standards surveys. Again, beyond those country offices, the set has been endorsed by a number of organizations in development programming in the World Bank's Living Standards Surveys, USAID's Demographic and Health Surveys, in humanitarian and crisis settings where registration of displaced persons occurs, by most UN organizations where data collection programming occurs or is supported, and here in the US in NCHS's population-based surveys and in Pulse. It should also be noted that the UN and the UN Economic Commission for Europe recommend in the principles and recommendations for populations in all housing censuses the collection of the short set for disability. There's a delay here, so it changes up there, but it does not change here. Um, in this last part of my presentation, I do want to show a few figures to show you what can the Washington Group short set tell us. Obviously, um, prevalence is of importance, and in this slide, what I'd like to mention, well, let me mention, this is from the National Health Interview Survey. Um, the questions, the short set has been in the NHIS since 2010, um, and using the international standard cutoff in 2022, the prevalence of the group that would be identified as with disability, remember this is the international cutoff, um, mostly of severe disability, um, and the people who are most risk for disparities is 9.3%. However, as you can see on the left, forcing a dichotomy masks a great deal of nuance, information that can be used by a variety of stakeholders to examine outcomes for people experiencing different levels of functioning. For example, more than a third of all adults report some difficulty, and 1.3% of the population cannot do at all at least one of those six domains of functioning. The programs, the policies, the supports provided to those two different groups are going to be different. And we don't know that if all we are collecting is a dichotomy. This is the severity data that the community has been advocating for some time, and it's important to recognize that a great deal of diversity in terms of functioning does exist in the population. I'm going to move away from prevalence because for the Washington group, prevalence is of less importance, again, than the idea that the disparities that exist must be addressed. So. Here we are looking at employment, and these are real data this time from, again, the National Health Interview Survey. And using this real data, um, what we see is that the group um, who, with disabilities, excuse me, um, are participating in labor force at a rate of about 36.7%. Those without disabilities, 791 that's the dis disparity gap. Now, if we take the sum group out of the set of without disabilities, what we get is a middle bar, that light blue bar. Does this group, when looking at this particular measure of participation, look more like those with disabilities or those without? Nearly two thirds are employed. Once again, when you start to look at nuanced data where we're collecting more information about levels of functioning, we can answer far more sophisticated questions. Here's another figure, again, um, an outcome, this time food insecurity disaggregated by disability. More than a quarter of people with disabilities reported experiencing family food insecurity in 2022, compared to 7.6% of people without disabilities. And again, we look at a three category measure of disability to disaggregate. The percent of those who report some difficulty falls squarely in between the 4.8% for those with no difficulty 
and the 19.6 among those with more severe functional limitation. Two examples, different outcomes disaggregated by disability, where the group with some difficulty looks very different. In terms of functioning, it represents a very different group. So policies aimed at equalizing these bars cannot adopt a one size fits all approach. Neither can the data that is used to develop such policies. Finally, I want to talk in these last two slides about how an equity, how our equity gaps change depending on how you, where you place that cutoff along that continuum. This is an example where we move from the current international standard cutoff to once again placing those with some difficulty in the category of those with more severe functional limitations. In essence, what we are doing is creating a much more heterogeneous group where the equity gap has closed, but in fact, it's a statistical change. The number of people with disabilities increases, but the gap, that piece of information that will inform resource allocation and program benefits closes. It masks all of the inequity that is still there. This is my last slide. I'm, it's the same exercise where we look first at this food insecurity again for those with and without disabilities. But on the right hand side, we put the category of people with some difficulty into the other category of with disabilities. And in effect, once again, by adding those, we are masking people who face very significant disabilities and their equity gap. They're invisible in this part of the figure. I hope that provides some um, background information and I know we're going to get to some question and answer during the uh, discussion. So I'll stop there. Okay, hi, I'm, can you all hear me? I'm Susan Popkin, I am the co could you go to the next slide? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? What person is answering the slide? I'm uh, the co director of the Urban Institute's Disability Equity Policy Initiative, or DEPI. I am representing our team um, today, but I'm also representing myself. I am a person with disabilities. I am an old, also going to introduce myself with a visual introduction, an older white woman with gray, mostly gray hair and glasses. Uh, I am wearing a colorful scarf around my neck and a gray blazer. Uh, I have a Sjogren's disease, which is an autoimmune condition that is very disabling. And it also is the reason I can't join you today because I'm immune compromised. Can you go to the next one? Uh, the, our Disability Equity Policy Initiative was launched in 2021, and we've been working to it, it build a body of evidence to improve the lives of disabled people and also to empower disabled researchers to do this work. The next one, please. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the challenges we've encountered in using the current ACS 6 questions on disability in our own research. Uh, how those current questions undercount the number of people with disabilities and make it difficult to answer important policy questions, and why we feel a switch to the Washington group short set that we just heard about is not an adequate solution. Can you go to the next one, please? Um, and it really matters to get this right for policy. I think we just heard that in the last presentation as well. Disability is an evolving concept. And accurate counts are essential for research and policy. Uh, we are living through a period where there is a new kind of disability we didn't have five years ago, long COVID, and we need to be able to account for that. We need to be able to account for other kinds of changes. Um, the current ACS 6 questions that you've seen focus on functional limitations and activities of daily living, like dressing, bathing, independently doing errands. But that is leaving out a large proportion of the disabled population. It's missing people with neurological disabilities, intellectual and developmental disabilities, psychiatric disabilities, and people with chronic illness like me. Um, I would not 
I would not answer yes to any of the questions in the ACS6 myself. Uh, and researchers who studied the ACS6 have estimated that this framework is failing to identify almost 20% of people with self identified enduring disabilities that affect their ability to function. We go to the next one. Uh, we have tried, I'm going to give you two examples for our own research about challenges that we've encountered in trying to use the ACS6. Uh, the first was a study on barriers that people with disabilities face in finding ha affordable housing. Um, so we wanted to use the current population survey, which also includes these set questions, to identify people who were eligible for housing assistance but able, were not in receiving it. And we found that a significant number of our respondents who selected no for all six of the ACS six disability questions also reported a disability or illness as a reason for not working elsewhere in the survey, which suggested to us there was a substantial undercount. In our own analysis, we included these individuals in our count of people with disabilities. Otherwise, our numbers would have been much lower. But I think what it told us is many people do not see themselves in that six item scale. And as I said, I know I don't. And I know a lot of other people who don't. And I think that raises a real question if we're looking at questions of equity and policy about who we're leaving out. Um, you can go to the next one, please. Uh, and as I said, we used the, the CPS for this analysis. Uh, we found we approximately 18 million disabled people were eligible for housing assistance, but not receiving it. And we know that's not a complete picture. We also know it's not a complete picture for reasons that don't have to do with the scale, but have to do with who's included in the CPS, uh, because it does not count people who are living in institutionalized settings or incarcerated, or people who are unhoused, all of whom are probably mostly disabled, majority of them are disabled. Um, so we knew what we had to present our research with a lot of caveats. We worked with a team of advisors from the disability community, and they were very emphatic that we stress what the limitations are, that we are seeing it's a situation that suggests there's a problem, and we know it's even worse than what we're able to find. And I'm going to go on to the next one. Our second example is on long COVID, which I mentioned earlier. Um, long COVID is an emerging disability. We are only beginning to understand uh, the impact that it's having on on our, in American society, the number of people who are affected. Um, we used a survey that Rob, Rob Santos will recognize, the Urban Institute's Wellbeing and Basic Needs Survey, or WBNS, uh, which is a survey that uses, it's an internet-based survey, uh, a representative sample of adults in the United States under the age of 65. Um, and we used it uh, to look at the experiences of people of long COVID. Again, in this situation, we worked with a team of people that included people with lived experiences. We collaborated with the patient-led um, collaborative on long COVID, uh, who helped us design the questions and uh, oversee the analysis. Um, but we also have used this to look at how the WB, the ACS6 questions are working. Um, and in an unpublished untab tabulation, we found that among adults under age 65 who self-identified in our questions as being severely affected by long COVID, top of our scale, only 60% also identified as disabled using the ACS6 questions. That really says to me there's a disconnect because people who are severely affected by long COVID are generally not working, are might probably spending most of their time resting in bed, going to doctor's appointments, um, and they're not showing up in the ACS6. And as I said, this is particularly important because this is a new time of disability. We know it's affecting millions of Americans and policymakers need accurate information to inform planning and policy to fund research. Um, next slide, please. So I think we think it's important to take the time to explore alternatives to make sure that we're getting an accurate account of people with disabilities. Um, we are using the WBNS to see how well the ACS6 works. We can explore other options with our survey and are doing that to see if they'll provide a more accurate picture of the numbers of disabled people. Um, in our next wave of the uh, WBNS, we're going to include a broader disability question in addition to the ACS6 to allow people to self-identify 
And then we're adding new questions about whether children in the household are covered by individual education plans or of Section 504 accommodations. I don't know how those are going to work. I don't know if they'll be any different, but we're going to be able to look at those and offer some recommendations for research based on that. Next slide, please. Uh, we've heard a lot today about the Washington Group short set. We think there are a lot of risks to moving forward with this change. Um, and I won't go over what it is because we've heard about that enough in the meeting today. But uh, it has a lot of the same limitations as the ACS 6. It also focuses only on the activities of living and functional ability. It also excludes many types of disability. Again, I would not qualify. Um, many people I know would not qualify who are severely affected by their disability. Uh, as you, the proposal is also to only count people who select serious difficulty on any of the items as disabled. The Bureau's own analysis and the analysis we just saw in the prior presentation shows it will drastically reduce the number of people who are identified as disabled. That has serious implications for equity and public policy. Uh, next slide, please. Our recommendation is to take the approach that we use in our own research, that you should seek consult advisors, not just from the research community, but from the disability community, um, and experiment with alternatives to see which ones produce a more accurate and a more inclusive count before moving forward. And um, thank you, yeah, I'll stop there. I'm, I guess I'm up next. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, deviate a little bit. I'm not going to use my slides. I have substantial slides. I wasn't quite sure what I would. Everyone else would talk about. Um, or the discussion this morning for those listening to the video. Now you should look back at the prior uh, session where these issues were addressed. Um, uh, as well. Um, with questions from the National Advisory Committee about the disability uh, content test or the ACS. All right, so uh, by way of introduction, my name is Andrew Houghtonville. I'm a professor of economics at the University of New Hampshire. I'm also uh, the research director of the University of New Hampshire Institute on Disability. Um, I am 57 years old, uh, cis male, White cis, white cis male with brown gray hair, balding and a beard, wearing a blue uh, kind of grayish blue sport coat with a blue tie and a blue shirt. Um, all right, so I, I also experienced disabilities in many ways. I uh, experienced depression and anxiety and learning disabilities that are well medicated and I have a great therapist. Um, my children experience disabilities. My son uh, experiences severe TBI. Uh, his pupils wouldn't dilate. Uh, he was near death and had a long successful recovery. My daughter experiences bipolar disorder. My father was institutionalized in the 70s with bipolar disorder, and I was actually an SSDI beneficiary as a child, which I didn't know until a few years ago. Um, uh, lithium ended up being able, him able to be able to return to the community uh, in the 1980s. Um, I received most of my funding from the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLR. Um, I owe a great deal of my career to uh, NIDLR uh, and their support and their mission. Um, I've participated in uh, National Academies panels, one on the reengineering of the SIP. So I'm, I actually started to come here today to talk about the SIP. Um, I've also participated in a National Academies uh, panel called by the Social Security Administration or paid for by the Social Security Administration to look at functioning, how to measure functioning in the context of Social Security disability eligibility. Um, let me get on to the proposed questions and somebody tell me if I'm, when I reach the five minute mark, um, please. Um, the proposed, questions are scientifically better. Um, they perform better on a lot of different me metrics. They are linguistically more consistent. 
uh, they provide more information, severity, not just the inclusion of the, the communication question uh, over the ACS current set, uh, but they have a severity scale. Uh, severity scale doesn't, there's a big jump between a lot of difficulty and some difficulty, which causes some of these issues that we're finding, um, but it provides something that, that we've been asking for, the other being onset of disability. Um, uh, it's a great benefit to have them be tested in different languages and cultures across the world. Um, there are additional sets that can be added on that have been tested. So uh, some of the next questions are about depression and anxiety, and I'm highly interested in seeing those added on different surveys. Um, it also goes all the way to workplace accommodation. So, I mean, there's a, a range of questions that are consistent linguistically that have been tested to varying degrees. Um, but it's a real resource and they even provide you with this data and SAS code. You need to add R, by the way. I, we're working. Okay. Um, that said, right, uh, not all is rosy. Um, the decision criterion that's set out in the census uh, 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 subcommittee on the ACS uh, suggests that the changes need to be uh, have minimal impact on year to year estimates so that the five year panel would be uh, the five year pooled sample files would be maintained. Uh, this will break that severely and that shouldn't go unrecognized. This means that um, rural estimates particularly will be lagged behind and there's a high degree of use at the University of Montana by my colleagues there uh, funded by Neidler uh, to use these to uh, impact policy and at the local level. And so that would be a huge loss. Um, uh, so it doesn't meet criteria in 6.2 in, in, in the, the charter, the chapter, charter, charter. Um, uh, because it's viewed as a revision, there wasn't a legislative needs assessment required. It's not an addition of questions, it's a revision. Um, uh, I'm kind of surprised it's not updated. It dates back to the Adler paper that that um, um, that that Julie mentioned, uh, and so we're talking about a needs assessment that was last done uh, in nineteen uh, in the late nineteen nineties, right? Because the questions are basically the same. Um, we lost the work limitation question, which many economists and people at Social Security uh, regret. You'll need to fix that, Julie, someday. We've been on the opposite side of the table many. A few times. Um, so it's still missing uh, people experiencing mental health conditions, for example, depression and anxiety. If we went through a legislative needs assessment, um, uh, uh, mental health conditions or the, ex the impact of mental health conditions may be rise to the top with, uh, with parity uh, between uh, physical and mental health being a, a key issue. Um, and also, you know, the input of people with disabilities is uh, has been severely lacking uh, in the development of not just the content test, but earlier in the development of the Washington group questions, where um, uh, individual disabilities, certainly in the United States, were not involved in any substantive way or organizations that represent people with disabilities in the design of the Washington group questions. Um, uh, other places from across the, the world where wherever they met, they invited uh, people from the community uh, to engage and to be observers. Uh, uh, so people with disabilities were not totally left out of the discussion, but this is uh, a massive, incredible effort at the international level um, that, that really focused mainly on, on the needs assessment of agencies, not necessarily needs assessment of people with disabilities. Um, and then lastly, the biggest uh, issue is the potential reduction uh, from 14 to 8% in the prevalence of disability among the uh, civilian adult non-institutionalized population. Um, this reduction is, is, was expected. You know, we've had test data going back to 2010. Um, this was expected um, and uh, is not a surprise. Um, yet, in part because people with disabilities weren't engaged in the process, this is really taking people by a lot of surprise, right? 
um, by big surprise. Um, however, as an economist, I talk about trade-offs to my students all the time. Uh, I think there can be some middle ground found. Um, it'll make some people, uh, never mind. Uh, I think there can be some middle ground found. The question I have is what definition will census use? It does not need as is recommended currently uh, by, by the content test folks um, to use definition one, to primarily use definition one. Um, that's not necessarily necessary. Um, what words will, will census use when you say population of people with disabilities or people with disabilities on not American Fact Finder, whatever it's called now. Um, I still have to go to Fact Finder to find the other one. But, um, you know, uh, still, um, you know, uh, what questions will will use? Julie uh, provided some information on the um, Definition one, definition two, and uh, the, the definition one being cannot do it all and a lot of difficulty. Uh, definition two, adding not only those folks, but people who report some difficulty. Um, and, you know, as Julie said, it led to an increase in the population, but a decrease in observed uh, disparity. However, there are some um, other ways of, of looking at this data. And uh, one way, one way, is that you could do cannot do it all, a lot of difficulty, and add in people who report to some difficulties, right? That gets um, a different estimate uh, that falls between definition one and definition two. Uh, for example, I ran it with the 2019 pre COVID National Health Interview Survey for 18 civilians, 18 uh, plus. Um, doesn't include the independent living difficulty, go outside home alone to do errands question. If we use the definition one, uh, it's 9%. So similar to the 8% uh, in the content test. If we use definition two, adding in all the some difficulty folks, uh, it gets an, a, a 41%, almost 10 percentage points higher than the content test. Um, but if we actually say, okay, wait, let's do, cannot do it all a lot of difficulty uh, or to at least two some difficulty reports, uh, it gets a prevalence rate of around 19%, right? Which is closer to the 14% that the, uh, that the ACS currently uh, shows or that the content test shows. If we wanna look at, okay, well, what does this do to outcomes, right? So I study employment trends. Um, so employment is the one that I know most about. Uh, if we use the strict definition, the, the narrower definition, definition one, it's 22% are employed. If we use the broad one, 48% are employed, substantially higher than anything that I've ever reported in any of my research and, and work. If we use the 19% number, the number that comes from adding to some difficulties, um, you get 34%. And that's very close to around where we typically are in the CPS. A uh, monthly basic survey, um, and so uh, there are other definitions that are available. Uh, one that I can th think could be um, added is cannot do it all, a lot of difficulty, and then add in at least some difficulty in the independent living question, because that's that's kind of a that's where remember there's the prompt of because of a mental, physical, or emotional condition, do you have difficulty going outside? home alone to run errands, such as going to the doctors or grocery shopping. That question has always been important uh, in any kind of ACS analysis because it's, a, it's actually a severe, this may not add many more people because it's, it's really a severe thing. I strongly recommend uh, that going forward that people with disabilities are, and the groups representing them in the United States are engaged in helping census decide which words it will use and which definition it will use. Um, um, however, I'll close with saying um, a couple things. You know, if, if any other population was cut in half or from 14 to 8%, I would expect they'd have the same response. And given that they hadn't been engaged, um, you know, I have no doubt that all procedures were followed, all regulatory procedures were followed, no doubt, right? 
I think it's time we evaluate that. And I don't think it's necessary for Congress to get involved with legislation, but having the Office of Compliance review the regulatory interpretation of how stakeholders and individuals should be engaged in such things as the census program, so the ACS program, um, you know, because I, I think it's actually, a, if anything, it's the lack of input from people with disabilities is really a reflection of how, um, because I, I know that all I, I have no doubt all regulations were followed. It's just how do we interpret them? How do we implement them? Um, I'm, I think it, it's time to look, revisit that and look at that carefully. Um, also, you know, uh, let's go back to the point that was raised in the earlier uh, session. Um, how much time do I have? Anybody keep? I meant to hit it. I'll keep going. All right. So. Um, uh, like the ACS, current ACS six questions, the Washington group questions will miss a lot of people um, with disabilities, um, especially those. I've done some work with the match CPS and to the SSA records and the six questions, the ACS six questions misses a lot of beneficiaries, particularly those with depression and anxiety. One of the largest groups, at least in the in those files uh, and, you know, I'm telling you, working with Social Security folks, it is exacting. That is good science. It is spot. I mean, we couldn't get that thing published without we had a staff member as part of the team. Um, it it misses people, and this shouldn't be a surprise again. Uh, although it, for us, it was a surprise that Social Security beneficiaries, because they've already said that they have a health conditions that limits their Painful activity. Uh, so it was a real surprise. Um, but why? Why 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 six questions now seven potentially um, that focus on functioning? Why? Right? Well, we have an issue of uh, plain language. Function allows us to use much more plain language. It's not dependent on whether a person has a diagnosis, right? We're not Canada, we're not Northern Europe, we don't have, you know. Uh, there's a big disparity in diagnostic information, and if we use diagnostic language, even long COVID or uh, intellectual disability, or, uh, you know, if we use diagnostic language, uh, we'll miss people because there are people who are underdiagnosed. So function allows us to jump over that issue. It all is simple, simple language, um, and it gets at what many programs are designed to support. Social Security disability insurance benefits do not cover all people with disabilities. They cover people with disabilities who uh, are unable to work above a substantial gainful activity. Um, and that's what that needs assessment likely showed years ago. It had a work limitation question. Uh, originally, the ACS long form census long form had a work limitation question. Um, but um, The focus on functioning is really necessary to fit the space at which we have and to fit plain language information, to fit what many federal programs are designed to do. However, because there's no, why I highly recommend investing in a wide open needs assessment that engages people with disabilities as well, is that we're moving beyond that kind of need based definition of disability, that it's people have different needs. With the ADAA, the American with Disabilities Amendments Act, it no longer require a limitation. You could have just a condition that's mitigated. So under the ADA, I would, under the ADA, I wouldn't have a disability. Under the ADAA, I would. I just happen to have my condition mitigated, my functional condition mitigated. The functional uh, consequences of my uh, conditions are mitigated. So I still qualify under the ADAA. Even the ICF, when it goes and actually uses a definition of disability on page two of their big red book, functional limitation is one, just one part of disability. Impairment and participation restriction. You can have discrimination based off of a, the presence of a condition as opposed to um, 
as opposed to you, you don't need function. It's it's sufficient but not necessary to be defined as a disability in the ICF. But that's just the ICF definition. Um, so we're moving beyond that because. Disability, you know, uh, if you ask about models to define conceptual frameworks, the ICF, and there was a Nagi one which had it more linear uh, definition of disability, where disability was the kind of penultimate uh, uh, consequence of impairment and activity limitation. We're moving beyond that, though, uh, because disability is becoming an identity, right? That's one. Um, and um, it's it's a matter of social justice and rights. And to say that because my uh, depression and anxiety don't limit my function because I'm well medicated and have a great therapist um, doesn't mean I don't have a disability or don't have rights to uh, that are given to people with disabilities that are. Owned by people with disabilities. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think that some middle ground can be found. Uh, and because I, I do fear that, throw, you know, throwing out the questions wholesale without, as long as the words and the cutoff can be addressed, we can move forward with a, you know, a population with disabilities definition and estimate that doesn't decline uh, and in potentially influence resources. Dr. Hootenbill. Yes. Uh, and the rest of the presenters, is it possible at this time that I can go ahead and pull Mar Marlene? Yeah, discussion sure. Of the discussion in the rest of the neck. That's a and very then, nice way of telling me to wrap it up. <laughs> and that way we can pull the discussion to maybe. Um, All right. Thank you very much. Or I'm not kicking. I'm not kicking you out, but I I'll want you in with. The yeah, okay. With everyone else. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, this is Marlene Sayo, and um, I am a Latina with brown hair with gray through it, and I'm wearing a black jacket today um, and a yellowish looking blouse. Um, so I am the discussant for the section, um, but due to time from constraints, I'm just going to um, first and foremost say thank you so very much for our four presenters today. Um, I truly appreciate the information that you shared. There was, you provided some clarification to me um, as it applied to the WGSS um, survey set, um, especially that the short questions, I didn't know there were expanded questions that are available. So that is great. And I think it's fair to say that we're all coming from the same space, right? That we acknowledge that uh, members of the disability community are at high risk of being undercounted and excluded. Um, historically, we have been marginalized. And so the concern always when there is change and the change will result in a significant decrease in the count for our community, that we are once again, um, um, I guess, being ignored or um, made invisible. And so that concern um, is there. From what I'm hearing and from what we heard from the speakers today, their goal was to take, you know, um, a look from a functional perspective to, to really see um, how we can identify equity or lack thereof, um, as well as the disparities that exist. Um, but I think it's, it's also said nicely um, that the fact that the disability community was not consulted um, when the WGSS uh, questions were being looked at um, really um, is a problematic for the, for the community because we are not monolithic, as we all know, um, and we present um, with multiple disabilities, but we also have multiple identities. And as Andrew said, it's an identity for us to have a disability. It's not just a function. Um, so I appreciate the clarification as to why these questions were adopted, but I also um, appreciate the concern that it's a narrower focus 
and it's taking a narrower view of our community. And that narrower view can ultimately lead um, to reduced uh, resources for us. And that is a, a concern. Um, and so how can we work together to improve uh, upon the questions that are being offered? You know, Andrew provided some um, recommendations, which I appreciate. Um, but at the end of the day, using definition one um, is of serious concern because we would go from 14% to 8%. Um, and so I would open it up to my colleagues for discussion and questions. I'm gonna open the discussion for, um, have seven minutes. So members virtually and, and here in person, please make your, your um, questions or comment very succinct to the point, and then we can move on to our, to our next um, member. Any questions or discussions at this time? If you're here in person, please tilt your card over. Virtually, please unmute your mic. Yoma, the floor recognizes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Chairwoman. Um, hi, everybody. everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. Get a feedback on that. Are you as well? Feedback, but it seems that there, you're might be breaking up a little or there might be some delays. Yeah, okay. I'll continue moving forward. Um, I thank the presenters and of course, uh, thank our NAC member Marlene. I think my, I'm trying to understand how something, what I would think is significant this significant change, a uh, potential change, um, came forth, and it wasn't, and, and the and the and the disability community was not fully engaged. Like th that's one question I have. Like, how did that happen? Because it looks like there there were opportunities. There were clearly, you know, FRNs, interagency. I think I'm trying to understand how all that happened, and now that we are here, that's one. My second question is really to what extent has there been study on potentially the impact of it, not just as a total, total population within the disability community, but even say by by age, we know that young children in particular tend to be underdiagnosed um, and all the various things that comes if they're underdiagnosed very early. So, uh, similarly, we know that, that children of color, particularly black children, Latinx children, are also like less likely to be diagnosed early. So I guess I'm trying to fully understand um, whether uh, all the communities that should have been at least consulted with um, were fully consulted. Again, thinking about, I think, to Molly's really great point, the intersectionality lens around this issue for those who have um, multiple uh, minoritized sort of identities. Thank you. The presenters, if you want to respond this time. Um, I think it also just the intersectionality strikes the strength of the, the ACS over SIP and others. Uh, just the sheer sample size allows us to do intersectionality. So losing that information or having changes in the information on disability will uh, impact uh, our ability to do intersectional research. Um, how did it happen? Uh, I think that's a question for those who know the regulations uh, around uh, seeking stakeholder input. Um, as I said, I, I don't doubt that the proper uh, processes were used. Um, uh, so it's now a question of, is the interpretation of those sufficient? But let's not go to Congress to ask them to change it. Um, if I could jump in. I would agree that the, uh, the uh, intersectionality is a key issue. Uh, uh, I think one of the things that one of the things is it's really difficult to look at intersectional issues now with the ACS as it is. We found that in our housing study. So I'm concerned about anything that's going to make this hard. Floor recognizes Dana. Please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Dana Waters, member of the NAC. I am a white woman with red hair and big blue glasses, um, and I'm wearing a white shirt. I just wanted to 
flag an area that I think could be really negatively impacted by narrowing the definition of disability or failing to expand the definition, which would be data on insurance coverage. Um, understanding why people do not have insurance coverage, why people lose their insurance coverage, and what role disability plays in that is incredibly important. And people who deal with hidden disabilities or underrepresented, underacknowledged disabilities have a whole lot of different struggles when it comes to getting and keeping insurance that are that may be distinct from those who are being included. And I, I realize that the risk of making invisible the disparities between disabled and so-called non-disabled people is very real, but there's also a huge risk of making invisible people who do have significant limitations or as uh, the ADA would note, um, people who are regarded as having those limitations. So um, this is something that's especially important for me because I lost my insurance this fall. I don't currently have sufficient insurance and right now I am able to function in about three weeks. I may or may not be. Um, and that data is important. So I just wanted to sort of highlight that. Um, I know we have a lot of data nerds in the room and they really could find that information valuable. So thank you. Do we have any other members in the room? For recognize Marley. I have a question as to for clarification purposes with the WGSS. Is the goal that if you respond um, to the two highest choices, that then you're considered having a disability, but if you respond to some or not at all, then you're not considered to have a disability? The cutoff is yes, anyone a lot or unable gets labeled in this international variable as with disabilities, the group who have the most severe limitation, who are at the greatest risk of participation limitations. Those with some usually get placed with the nose. I I will tell you that in many places where the short set and the other sets are being used, that all of the data are being used so that those four categories are being used in, in, in tabular format and other kinds of things. Um, but yes, for the sake of official statistics where some dichotomy has to be created, that's the international recommendation. So. As a result of that, that is why we would see a drop from 14% to 8%. That's right. And um, the, the recommendation to consider the short set did not include a recommendation for where to place that cutoff. I will make that very clear. It, you know, we have a, a situation where we're either going to change that number and almost cut it in half, um, or we're going to keep the some people and then perhaps over inflate that number unless some other option is deployed, such as Andrew's option. Um, I, I will say this, and I and I I mean this with all due respect. <laughs> the 14 and the 8 come from the evaluation that is that has just occurred. It, they are these are not numbers that were generated as a result of actual ACS, you know, the, the actual survey. So I think we have, we're at 13.9% for at least adults. It, the same six questions in other data collections produce very different numbers. So I, I want to at least get on the record that yes, we may be changing numbers, but I'm not so certain that the 14 should be labeled as the accurate exact number 
of the population in the US. I think that's awfully important to recognize. Yeah, and, and many times in the ADA it was cited as 54 million and it's been going up. Or those numbers are based on the SIP topical modules. Um, and you know, that's why I push for the SIP. I, I initially wanted to talk a lot about the SIP. Uh, because I think the lack of the topical module or formerly SSA supplement is a real hamstring to us. Uh, that series that that um, that Sharon mentioned earlier, the Americans with Disability series, out of your, your uh, census reports, that thing is like a bible. You know, sorry, uh, that thing is a very valuable resource, and um, it was based on the SIP sixty-eight plus. Uh, questions about disability, also addressing child disability. I mean, the SIP is a tremendous asset. Uh, and, you know, going back to uh, uh, Dana or Dana, uh, your question, your comment, um, I think the power of, of having the SIP, the ACS, and the CPS ASAC um, the, is that we can use that data to look at health insurance in a variety of ways. No one survey and survey can really capture uh, the experiences of people. Um, and that's why I think understanding, you know, the SIP is really the place to look for people with visible versus invisible, uh, chronic condition versus, you know, functional difficulty as they are measured here. The SIP is the place, and, and that's why I wholeheartedly support uh, a regular fielding of the SIP and uh, inclusion of more and more disability questions if the topical modules or follow back supplements don't work. Um, or a CPS supplement. Um, the previous one was led by the Department of Labor and it really doesn't get at the kind of information that we're looking for in terms of functioning and uh, underlying health condition. Um, but uh, yeah, so a, a good thing about the the having the ability to adjust the SIP. SIP currently asks the ACS six questions. If it asks the Washington group question, then we could get a better sense at who's not being captured by by that group. Uh, for instance, uh, the SIP asks intellectual disability. So we'd be able to look at, all right, what combinations of communication difficulty, go outside alone difficulty, and cognitive difficulty will capture a population that's consistent with the experience of people with intellectual disabilities, kind of as a proxy measure. So it can be really creatively done, and I'm, I'm always happy to see the same questions in different surveys, but they will, as Julie said, you'll get a big, quite bigger percentage in the BRFIS than you will the National Health Interview Survey than the CPS. A lot of research has been done and in, in kind of showing that you'll get different estimates, but um, I'll stop. Thank you to our presenters and thank you, Marlene. I'll close this the discussion at this time and turn it back over to Karen. Thank you very much to our presenters and our discussant. Um, at this time, uh, Cherokee Bradley and Carol Hafford will lead the NAC committee discussion and formulation of recommendations. Uh, I believe uh, Cherokee will have the committee take a very short break uh, before you get into that. Um, and again, while we invite the public to continue watching uh, this portion of the meeting, we note that it will consist of conversation among committee members only. Therefore, for the public, this concludes the 2023 NAC fall virtual meeting proceedings for day one. I hope you all found today's presentations and discussion to be very informative. Uh, and tomorrow we will pick it up with more interesting presentations. So at this moment, we will turn it over to Cherokee and Carol. If you guys don't mind, could, um, are we looking at a five or 10 minute break? We've, gone, we've cut into some of our time for deliberation. So I'm gonna leave that, the consensus up to you. More or less, 10, 10, okay. 247, see you back.
virtual members just hold tight one second. Oh, okay, here we go. There we go. I write. Let's see. So I'm just about that. Can I look at the platform? Oh, that's too much. Dragon, yeah. Okay, gonna go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys, I, let's go ahead and get started. Help me put your computer on scrolling. Some um, information scroller. Or, or? Yes. Okay. okay. So then you just have to. Okay, due to the, the, the amount of time that our last um, presentation took, we're looking at extending the time for these deliberations and to end till 530 instead of five o'clock. We initially had a few hours to do so, but again, we're short on time. So okay. it's going up to our first. Recommendation. I'm going to just drive for a little bit. Okay, no problem. So I'm going to give you time on this first one to read the, let's scroll up and read the preamble. Ioma, if I recall, you and I have a discussion. Are you online, Ioma? I am online. I am online. Okay. So if you want to speak to, because of the, due to the length of the preamble, if you want to speak to just to provide overview, and I'm going to give the rest of the NAC the opportunity to read along as you're discussing. Sure. I just, be, sure. Uh, I just, be, uh, just before I do, I, before I, do, I, I, I uh, is flow there. there. Or... Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so flow could also, I mean, um, also discuss and I can add. This is one of those that we add from the child. Group. child. Oh, which one we're talking about? This first one is in ours. Okay, I'll talk about it. We're not at the recommendation. We're just talking, just giving a high level description of the preamble. So we're not at the recommendation yet. Oh, but yeah, I'm happy to go through the ones that the child group came up with. I'm going to make sure I, I'm, I'm seeing sure the screen. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, I mean, just the preamble. I mean, just the preamble. Short, but in essence, but in essence um, it's just basically, it's just basically asking. I'm asking, sorry, I keep I'm sorry, I keep hearing my, hearing my back, so it's distracting me a little. Um, oh, good, that worked. Okay, whatever you did worked. Um, and so we're just, I think the whole premise of this is really trying to sort of address sort of the privacy budget, right, with all the disclosure. Uh, that the Census Bureau has to do. And so it's really trying to figure out what is a trade off in terms of the tables, the tabling of, of information, um, and how the Bureau is making decisions about sort of its overall privacy budget. And so figuring out which tables and which information needs to really either, it, which one is useful, which one is not to potentially eliminate. And so the recommendations are just following sort of that larger um, uh, sort of. Uh, 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 aspect around sort of curing the data enterprise and sort of the privacy budget. With that being said, recommendation number one, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau consider investigating whether in decennial census or ACS tables at the block group or lower are A, costly to the privacy budget, B, are never known to be downloaded from data.census.gov, and C, are identified through a process of extensive 
outreach and engagement with user communities and stakeholders as having no known issues. Uses, excuse me. Questions, concerns, any discussion? One quick question. Go ahead, Janine. Uh, this is Janine. Um, Yama, is this just in general or are we specifically talking about um, disclosure avoidance? Or Janine, everything in between? I feel, I mean, I think this is, I think it's, we could find it to be around sort of the whole DP or disclosure, but I think it's just overall, to be honest, it's really around that whole data enterprise um, um, that the Bureau is sort of, you know, I think the director spoke on it this morning too. So I think it's really around all those pieces, but, but it really is around the DP issue of how um, it may be impacting the kind of data that's being tabled and, and some of those things. So keeping it kind of just keeping it more broad, because I'm my fear is that if we don't define if we define it or how we define it, they may be like, oh well, we're not applying you know disclosure avoidance to this table versus that table. So anyway, but I, if we want to keep it broad, that makes sense. Is there Janine? Is there anything you would add to the recommendations? Is there anything you would add per se? Right. So is there anything that that um. Yeah, anything you would add to the recommendation or to make it clearer or more refined for the Bureau so that, you know, they understand what we're asking for, which is basically just, you know, do some investigation to figure out which tables are really important. And, you know, because if there are more tables they produce, the potential to use all the privacy budgets kind of stuff. Um, and they have to, I think that's one thing, but the, in the larger scheme of things, just the effort it takes to produce tables and all that, you know, thinking about if it's not being used at all, why even bother? So I think it's, it's probably a little bit of a combo. Um, Richard, I'm gonna pull you in on this. Yeah, as if well. you would, yeah. Let me think about that for a second. I'm gonna read through it. So I guess uh, uh, sort of maybe a clarifying question, uh, Ioma, or uh, uh, so, I think one of the frustrations we've had with the 2020 census was is that because at least we're told because they had to go and do all this privacy stuff essentially that's why it's 2023 and we're finally releasing some of this detailed data right and the concern is is that people are spending a lot of effort trying to essentially uh, sort privacy so again I think in terms of trying to this balance between sort of the I would call it privacy, but I guess trying to, you know, to be sure that you can't backtrack the data and so forth. that we're doing it in a way that basically we're doing it. Uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it um, or maybe we could do it broadly. But the thing is, is that then you when we try it like, OK, but please do it in a way so that we don't lose data, et cetera. But then they're doing it so in such detail and maybe with tables that they're using so much effort to do that, that basically we're having delays in reporting of data. I mean, so I, I don't know, when you say privacy budget, it's not just financial, it's a time thing as well. So basically trying to figure out how, how can we identify what the priority tables are for people that the census can focus on getting those tables out earlier uh, or some way so that we're not having such a delay in waiting for the, 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 the information that came out of the census as we're seeing I think in the 2020 census where basically everyone's like, how, when, when, you know, it's 2020 census, it's now 2023 when you're finally getting the detailed tables out. Um, and, and there may be, sorry, I'm probably talking too long, but uh, basically trying to figure out how we better focus the efforts of, our, of the census staff in a way on the things that we care about and not having them spend time on perhaps tables that no one, that very few or maybe no one's really paying attention to. Arlock, I'm gonna pull you in and at this time, at I want you guys to be thinking about any edits or any recommendations that you have to any fixes, any changes that you would like to make to this one. Yeah, that, it, um, right, what Yoma and Richard said is exactly right. And a little on the background, the Genesis um, in the May meeting, I think um, Associate Director Keller said they wanted to expand the kinds of tables they're providing and kinds of information that the Census Bureau is running using bringing in admin data linkages and new products that will create new um, value for um, users. 
and that they're going to have to do this in an environment of being mindful of the overall privacy budget. And so we asked, did does that mean that you know there's some trade-offs, going to be some trade-offs here? And if you can get rid of things that no one uses, you would be able to provide more to users. And um and Ron Jarman said absolutely yeah, yes, that's right, as I remember it. And that's sort of the genesis that if we can get rid of things that people aren't actually using because they are at the very local level, a block group or whatever, and they're a kind of table that people only use at the county level, and no one's ever accessed them. I don't know if these any such things exist or not, but if they do, they would be very costly in the poverty budget, I would think. Um, and so that's all this is getting at. And also correct. And thank you. I was going to say you were there. It was Arlock who, Arlock, uh, yeah, let's give him credit. It was really Arlock who did this particular aspect, that preamble. So I just want to make sure. I'm like, oh, I'm glad you were there. I just want to correct that case. I mean, it changes or are we accepting it to move forward? Okay. Yeah. I'm okay. Microphone. <laughs> um, in the recommendation, it says um, tables at the block group or lower, a costly to the privacy budget are never known to have been downloaded and are identified. Um, I wasn't sure what are identified um, was referencing. Is there something missing? I was just wondering. Do you want to all should our, we shift that phrase around and say are identified as having no known uses through a process of extensive outreach, et cetera? Just flip the last two phrases. So does that clarify it? Yeah, because they're Yes. Okay. And then um, one update, we actually have this room until five. So we do have to leave at five o'clock. Okay. Recommendation number two, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau consider using this engagement process to solicit additional optional information about how users use the tables they use. Examples using it to identify areas or groups needing economic or social support, language access, disability resources, and much more. Questions, concerns, edits? Dana? Can we just find a way to change use the users use the tables they use to, <laughs> to any other language that doesn't use the same word three times. Well, how users use User the table. Tables. Yes, that's true. We should do that's that. True. I remember yeah. saying that I just, my brain couldn't function. So, yes, I, I'll, yes. Okay, John. John Sandoval, I think. Um, Optional, if we could have a stronger word, it seems like it's optional, maybe it's helpful information. Any other questions, concerns, edits? 
So how users util utilize the tables? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Masterful editing. <laughs> Go ahead, Arlot. Changing the in the parentheses, changing it to they. Uh, no, using them. The tables them. Okay. Okay. Let's move on to number three. Give you a few moments of the preamble. Okay. Recommendation number three, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau provide a session in the spring 2024 meeting on the National Experimental Wellbeing Statistics, also in short as the news, known as short as the news. Questions, concerns, edits? This is Gina. Do we want to be specific about what we want that session to include? Something all about the hard to serve, the, I mean, the hard to count and historically undercounted communities? Because just a overview of the news may not answer specifically the questions we're asking. I'm okay either way if you guys think it's clear. Is the preamble going to be deleted? <clears throat> no. Do you want to say what you just said? Oh, maybe as it pertains to race, ethnicity, and special populations. That'd be great. That'd be great. I'm sorry, this is, I have to use it as keyboard. Two. Yes, could you drop? <laughs> Thank you. This is this is this. and Nicholas, do you have Do we want to specify that it's hard to count populations? Uh, yeah, but it's in the preamble. Oh, it says uh, it says it says in the preamble. And Helen's making a, a great point. We don't use hard to count anymore, do we not? Actually, in um, Director Sanders' blog post, mm -hmm. they're actually they're coming out with distinctions between hard to count. So a hard to count population would be college students in a dorm, mm -hmm. which is distinct from a historically undercounted uh, population. And there's going to be more to come on that. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to give you a moment for the preamble to four or five. Recommendation four, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau provide similar commitment, effort, resources, time, and engagement throughout the Census Bureau on critical issues of importance focused on addressing the differential count with the historically undercounted populations working group, similar to how it has how it has done with the young children's worker group. Questions, concerns, edits, comments. Recommendation five, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau ensure the historically undercounted populations working group and the young children working group interact consistently, giving the continued differential count, especially the undercount of young children of color, being that of black and Hispanic children. Can we change Which the concern? to example? To example. EG. No, um, yeah, EG, thank you. Thank you. No. 
Questions, concerns, comments, any recommended edits? Cherokee. Um, Carol? Yes. Um, could we include American Indian and Alaska Native children there as well? I couldn't hear you. American Indian and Alaska Native children. And if you do that, yes. Yeah, so then I would mm -hmm. do IE, because I think that's kind of at least the three groups, right? That I think they've shown, unless we include, I don't know, I can't remember if Asian children were, that's been the case. So what are we adding? AIA. American Indian Alaska. American Indian, Indian Alaska. Okay. Oh, but you wanted to, um, um, Iyama, you wanted to change it to IE? When you well, yeah, so I think if it, yes, I think unless there's other children of color, I don't remember Asian or um, Native Pacific Hawaii, like I, so I don't know if it, I've seen data with the other children who are not Black or Hispanic or um, American Indian, that's all. But here. For six, I need the complete recommendation. David, you have Oh, I'm sorry, Richard, go ahead. Microphone, 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 please. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, Fernandez study uh, showed that actually Asian as well as um, Native American, um, Alaska, Native Alaskan and American Indian. And I'm, I don't know whether it, did, it didn't have specific things coming up, but I would imagine that Native Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander children, although I don't have any data specific to that, but the uh, Fernandez study showed that the highest actually ratios were actually Asian, American, Indian, Native, Alaskan, and other were uh, uh, young children had the highest undercount. So then let's add them. Or let's add them. Or, so add them. Or, so I just knew that. We so knew that. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. So what is the change that needs to be made? Add API or if you don't, if you if you add them, then leave it as IE. If you don't, then change it to AG or EG. Question, do we need the example? Is there a reason why, Yoma, that you wanted the example? I, I'm just making I'm sure, just that, making sure that, that IE denotes that we can much have everybody covered. covered. But if we think there may be then we could just say example. Then we could just say example. I mean, it's, I mean it may be minor. It may be minor. So are we keeping it or are we? So leave it as is. Let's move on. Let's move on. Got the A8. Uh, <laughs> All right. No. Okay. Let's. I is EG. Yeah. A. If we're going to include that. How about including? EG and AIAN, maybe? I mean, yeah. okay, so let's do this because we, we could, I think it's good. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, we can spend another 15 minutes on this. I was going to table it and give it back to Ioma. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Number six, recommendation six. The NAC recommends as these working groups are set up, including those that have been set up, there is an attention to, there is attention to the racial and ethnic makeup, as well as other identities, including gender and disability status, to ensure that improvements and updates on various census related matters leverage the professional expertise and lived experience of diverse members, leading to improved census operations. Just a question Do we need to specify what we mean by these working groups? Like if these live on their own, yeah. they might not know what we're talking about. So both the young children for sure and the historically undercounted population. As a start. Okay. Would you say potentially? Would you say potentially? In the preamble. Other working groups, because like, I don't know this. I know there's several other working groups. I just don't know all their names. But I think we could just put those. But I do want to flag that that they need to keep that in mind for all their um, other working groups. Any other comments, questions, edits? Right now, it doesn't make sense. 
So the NAC recommends as the historically undercounted population working groups group and young child working group working group. <laughs> it says working group twice are set up, including those. That Maybe just the NAC recommends the historically undercounted population and the young children working group. Oh, there's a tension. Oh, there's a tension. Yeah, it's like wait, what? The NAC recommends, the NAC recommends to the racial ethnic makeup as well as other than blah, 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 of these working groups, such as blah, blah, blah. Help me to just go back and take it. I can't. I can't. I can't in this group format. Do, do you want to take it back to words method and? Yeah, let me. Yeah, so we can move on. Okay. And Carol, could you make note of that? Of number six? You almost want to make note that number six, you almost going to take it back. Okay, give you time for the preamble on B. Okay, number seven, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish a robust set, a robust set of research projects focused on the undercount of all persistently undercounted populations. This research project, which should include observational and ethnographic, ethnographic research, should begin immediately in fiscal year 24 with a modest investment in observational research built on the affordable ethnographic research conducted in 1990. The research initiative from 1990 examined causes of undercount in 31 distinct communities. Questions, comments, recommended edits? Jermaine? So are we talking specifically when uh, persistently undercounted population is a predefined group because it's capitalized. So I think this is my mind, mind too. So, so we, is the terminology. So I think the bureau is basically, basically the history. So maybe just make that edit, please. Okay, I just want to make sure what whichever groups we count that Mina is a part of this, especially since it's talking about 2030. Did I hear someone, Gina? That was that you by chance? I was gonna say, if there's any way of fixing the, the feedback, it's really hard to hear really you guys. So, thanks. Just going back. So, Gigi, so, you're saying Gigi, you're saying. Um, about including Mina. 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 Well, it just says you had that line about 31 distinct communities, and I'm pretty sure Mina would not be included in those. So I just want to make sure that it's not limited to those 31 distinct, that it's just all of these persistently undercounted populations. But I don't know if that's like, previously been identified or you're talking about the, you know, because Mina hasn't even been a part of the conversation most of the time. Right. Carol, I'm going to pull you in as well. Um, um, so this one, the floor, is both open to, the floor is open to you both at this time. I just want to pull Carol into the discussion as well. Oh, go ahead. Wait, wait. are you, are you done, Jameen? Okay, thanks. Um, for this one, I was just wondering about the timing of this um, recommendation. So the research project should begin immediately in FY24. We're already in FY24. So should it be planning for a research project in that would be conducted later in FY24 or early in FY25. Um, and I guess I'm thinking about what Director Santos said this morning about the appropriations and what budget will be available. So I guess I'm concerned about saying something should be, begin immediately when it seems that the research projects that we saw um, this morning um, do require some you know, intentional planning to stand up. 
So I'm just trying to kind of hmm, give a realistic time frame around this. Go ahead, Inyoma, because we had some discussion on this. Yeah, so, so two things, uh, uh, Gigi, your, uh, your point about MENA has been noted. I, that particular report was just from 1990. However, I mean, we can look to, to make sure MENA is, is there. I think if you can provide language, I think that'd be great. And then Carol, to your point um, about the Bureau, I would probably argue that this is a huge oversight, right? That one of the biggest issues with the decennial and has been since it started is the differential undercount. So to me, it feels like to get so like to me, it should be they should move something else off. Personally, I just think that because this is such a huge issue, it has been, and we saw it, you know, get worse to 2020 due to many things, COVID interference, whatever. But I think that that understanding, yes, there's there's, there's the whole appropriations and, and how long it takes. This is why it says it has to start immediately because we know if it doesn't start now to get to the mid of the of the uh, of the decade, it's too late. So I think this is why I would say we keep it in there and have them respond and let them know the fact that it was missed is to me a red flag in of itself. So that's why I sort of when we when when uh, me and Chairwoman Cherokee Bradley talked about this, I was like we sort of said we could give them space and plan it. But by then, it's probably going to be too late as it is. So I, I would push that we keep, we're very clear in the language to indicate that this should have already been there. Like, it's, it's, it's not like it's a secret that the historically undercounted populations should be a priority, period. So I guess I, I'm, I don't want to give any more room because that should have been like number one. But I, I understand what you're saying. Carol, to your point, you're, you're um, saying that being in fiscal year, already being in FY24 then, right. is it attainable? Is it something that actually did? Right, but I think back to Ioma's point, um, to make it a priority, to perhaps state, the, you know, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish as a high priority, a robust set, so that you get the, you prioritize it, um, given the importance that um, it, um, it requires. Um, and I think maybe if just framing it as a high priority might then sit well with the rest of the language about, you know, doing so immediately. Are you comfortable with that, Ioma? Yeah. I like that. We don't take away, do we take away the FY24 part? No, right? That, no, no, no. That, but, but just say I'm establish a, as a high, high priority. priority. A Even better. I like it. I like it. Okay. Okay. Good. If nothing else, moving to recommendation eight, the NAC recommends that similar to the research project conducted in 1990, research sites in 2024 be chosen to represent the diversity of populations in built environments. Um, as an example, housing, living patterns, urban, rural, level of broadband connectivity. These findings from this research could then inform localized operation and operations and messaging that could be tested in multiple 2026 field tests. Questions, comments, edits. Hearing none, move into recommendation nine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Nicholas? Yeah, I'm suggesting probably just an EG at, at the opening of the parentheses. Okay. Move into question, move into recommendation, excuse me. Nine, just a second for the preamble. Sorry, Miss Richard. And this is for number eight, correct? Yeah, th th this is related to actually eight, and perhaps even a little related to seven. Um, I, I, I do wonder that, um, you know, we're, we're saying you need to do these studies, um, and perhaps you shouldn't do some other studies, because we talked about the budget, right? Um, whether we should, in relation to these two recommendations, um, also have the Census Bureau, um, especially since it's urgent, maybe at our next meeting, talk of, you know, basically talk about how their research agenda and us, us weighing in on their research agenda, like how do spending their current research dollars, et cetera, right? We, and so we say this is a priority, 
Um, I think we also need to hear about, okay, which ones are you going to stop doing, et cetera, or are you going to or not, right? Are you just going to blow off a recommendation? I don't know. I, I shouldn't say it that way. But, I mean, I, I, I sort of feel like we're, you know, we're establishing certain pro recommending certain priorities, which I don't disagree with. But I want, you know, it, it's good to know how this fits in the context of all the, you know, the, their, the research that they're doing, right? And frankly, maybe we have some more direction to give them as we have a better grasp of what their research strategy is leading up to 2030, whether we should engage in a, in a more robust discussion about that, aside from making recommendations that say prioritize this and this, but yet, you know, being able to see that larger picture. So I, I guess I'm sort of suggesting perhaps a, another recommendation that asks them to that, that, that folds in, uh, we'll make recommendations at this meeting, but to have a larger discussion about what is that research agenda that's leading up to 2030. And we hear, we hear bits and pieces of it, right? We heard some today. Um, but um, I, I just wonder whether, it's so that we could weigh in more on, on, on how, you know, where they're putting their resources in on these things. So question, could that be formulated into a recommendation? Yeah, exactly. I would, I, I would uh, perhaps sit down and try to draft an additional recommendation along those lines if that is something people are agreeable to. And that would be under this, this um, for this section? Yeah, I guess it would be a recommendation 8.5 or something. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. And just to briefly, while we're there, just to remind us, they did, the Census Bureau has done a few, maybe two or three sessions, right, public sessions, on the research agenda. So we should at least acknowledge in whatever we write that they have done a little bit of that, not necessarily to the NAC members directly, but they have done that and talked about all of that. Cause right, there was a whole FRN last November asking for research uh, priorities for the 2030. So we should at least acknowledge that they've done some of that, but maybe it's more of to your point, Richard, that is let's make sure we understand their machinations, but yeah. Point it out. I'm not saying they've never done it before, but they haven't given it to us and 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 had us respond to that. I mean, we are so, and again, we've heard pieces of it even today, but we haven't had sort of the broader picture, right? And are their priorities in line with our priorities? Noted, let's move to recommendation nine. Recommendation nine, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau establish a research project no later than 2024 that examines whether well-targeted in-field address canvassing cannot only identify low visibility household units, not in the math, but also areas with concentrations of complex households. With the example, these efforts could be guided by a model to be developed by the Census Bureau that targets areas where addresses were missed in 2020 as identified by the real-time 2020 of administrative record census sim simulation and metrics that suggest a likely concentration of complex households. Questions, comments, recommended edits. Is there a concern about the 2024? Just flagging that here. Again, the I mean, the math, the master address file is pretty a big one. So it's just they need to just make sure they have the right master address files, but just want making sure there was not a concern, at least about 2024. going to recommendation 10. Let me stop real quick. Gina, are you still having issues with hearing? Nope, it's fine. There hasn't been okay. any more feedback. Whoops, except I'm hearing myself now, but I'm just not talking very much, so it's okay. Anyone else virtually have any issues with the audio? Not at this okay. time. Okay, recommendation 10. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau establish a research project to identify optimal modes of response and improve instrument design for limited English households and those without broadband connectivity with low literacy, literacy levels and or limited digital literacy skills. Questions, comments, any recommended edits? Hearing none, moving to recommendation 11. Just a moment for the preamble, the small preamble. Recommendation 11, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau develop a research project that aims to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the 2020 census partners, specifically 
there is a need to examine, examine the following. A, the extent to which the community outreach partners reach households less inclined to self-respond and how persuasive messages were developed for subpopulation. B, the extent to which the 2030 census plan places too much burden, places too much burden on groups that may not have funding from their states, localities, and private funders and consider providing matching funding. Questions, concerns, recommended edits. Should they say sub would, dev would develop in A, um, would the last part would develop for subpopulations? So just the S maybe, I think. Am I hearing anyone moving on? Okay. Oh, um, I'm wondering about how persuasive messages were for certain subpopulations. That little piece of it seems different from the rest. It seems like messaging research to me. I don't know if we want to pull it out or just leave it. Yep. I see what you mean. Yeah, because right yeah. there's. Right, there's one about reaching households less inclined to self respond, and then one really about how the effect of persuasive messages. So you're suggesting basically have like a um, 11B and then move the 11B to 11C. Is that right, Flo? Richard? Did Flo say something? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't hear. She, did she respond? I didn't hear anything. Yeah, I said I, I agree. Okay, that, I just that okay. it would get lost otherwise. Richard, uh, I'm I'm not sure how well the census will be able to determine the strengths and weaknesses by themselves uh, if they missed it the first time around. Um, I'm wondering if we could add a part D that allows for this process to include public comments or feedback. Is that fine with you, Richard? Okay. Recommendation 12. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau develop a research project that vigorously evaluates its 2020 census communications campaign, excuse me, and how it can be improved to effectively motivate self-response among the persistently undercounted populations. Questions, concerns, comments? Change persistent to historical. Again, I just don't know what whatever language we're using in the documents, sorry. I'm gonna bring John Sandoval in this conversation as well. I don't know if what we heard this morning kind of satisfies this, or if it doesn't, then specifically how this is different from what we heard this morning. Can you say more? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So the first agenda item this morning was the lessons learned from the integrated communications campaign. So in this recommendation, we're asking him to do a research progress that evaluates the campaign. So it feels like they've done this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right now we're looking at removing it. Go ahead, Nicholas. Okay. I, I just wanted to second that. I thought the presentation this morning was quite helpful. Okay. So removal of recommendation. I'm just gonna strike it through, so. Okay. So that should be, this is actually identified as 13, 14, but it should be 13. Recommendation 13, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau develop a research project that critically re-examines its current success metrics and identifies ones, they used to be changed, ones that can assess progress towards counting everyone once and in the right place and consider whether certain metrics as a total percent net coverage error is providing insight about the success of the census count.
Questions, concerns? Go ahead, Flo. Um, I was just thinking if we should put a period after right place and then say they should consider whether certain metrics such as is providing insight about the success of the census count. Any other? Okay, hearing no. I can't hear you, Arlock. Certain metrics such as are providing rather than ints providing? Yep. Any additional? Okay, moving on. I would sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering if it might be helpful to provide an example of a metric they might want to consider. Uh, the the 2020 census uh, National Academy's evaluation uh, shows the percentage distribution of response modes by race and ethnicity. Um, and to be able to see that in real time might be useful. So the percentage of uh, responses through either the internet versus paper and phone versus non-responsive follow-up households um, could be uh, an example of a metric that they should consider having as part of this. Can you repeat the name, Richard, of that metric? Uh, percentage distribution of response modes. Thank you. Actually, I wonder um, if that should actually be a separate sentence, right? Because the, um, the, the total percent net coverage error is not, doesn't actually provide much information. So I wonder if you if it may make more sense to just uh, say you know one potential metric that could be considered for use is is exactly uh, the percent distribution response. So so just another sentence that flags one potential metric to consider would be what um, Richard just said. Thank you. Uh, this is Richard Chang. I agree. Any additional before we move on? Okay. The preamble to identify it as 15, truly 14. Give it a second. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau develop a research project focused specifically on state level data, data sets, including WIC, TANF, Medicaid and CHIP to assess their utility for improving census coverage of persistently undercounted populations. This project should include all the practical questions entailed in securing these data sets, including how much time it would take to reach agreements to assess them. Richard Pan. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I guess, I guess there's a research component. There's also an operational component, right, in terms of accessing. And then uh, the other sensitivity I have to bring up, uh, because it sort of came up in 2020, was um, privacy. Um, so when is, let's suppose it's this way. As we were going out trying, you know, um, so in California, we enroll undocumented children in our Medicaid program. Of course, it's totally state funded and we, the state was a little concerned about certainly forwarding and any of that information to the administration at the time. And so, um, uh, so anyway, um, that could be part of the evaluation of accessing state level data, what states are willing to provide as well as the quality of the data that you actually get, et cetera. But I, I also just been a little cautious about um, uh, that aspect of things as well, um, I, I, you know, in terms of what data exactly the state 
will be asked to hand over to the federal government. I realize the census, you know, I'm on this board, et cetera, but there, I, I know there's some sensitivities potentially there. Yeah, and I just, I wanna add that I think if there is inclusion of a SOGI question, that may add to privacy concerns, but did we, do we wanna maybe formulate a specific recommendation around messaging on privacy, or is this, are you recommending that we specifically talk about how well, the state would respond, not individuals. Yeah, I, I think I think maybe in the last sentence, since okay, in terms sorry. of the words, actually, I realized that was a general statement, but in the word, quote, wordsmithing part, uh, this project should include all practical questions entailed in securing these data sets, including um, how much time it would take to reach agreements, and uh, I guess, I don't know if we say privacy, or what are, are the nature, uh, or what data states are willing to share, or release, or whatever, uh, 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 including issues, including concerns about privacy, right? So that could be part of the investigation, but I, I think that is, is one of the things that uh, uh, that we should pay attention to. Okay. Ioma, I wanna pull you in, I see your hand. Yeah, I'm, I just, I, I thank you, Richard, for, yeah, flagging that, right? Because the whole concern about the public charge and those kind of things. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you said that. I. I I was just wondering, it, right, so you said, and addressing, so you said identifying data sets that are willing to share and addressing concerns about privacy. Is there anything we should say, are we able to say about really, I mean, we can't say public charge-ish, um, but but do you think privacy gets at that underlying real concern about when census gets access to certain data that now is available to potentially, you know, put certain people at risk? Should we say anything stronger, or do you think that privacy is good enough? Privacy, I think we send a uh, signal, appropriate signal about uh, uh, about the issue. Okay. See, lessons learned. Recommendation, the NAC recommends that the Bureau take the following steps to improve the impact of state and local complete count committees for the 2030 census. A, survey members of, 20, of 2020 Complete Count Committee regarding local state successes and missed opportunities, what states and localities should consider in funding and organizing the Complete Count Committees in the 2030 census, and what the resources, did I miss something? Resources the Census Bureau can provide to support state and local Complete Count Committees. Oh, Chairman, excuse me, sorry, um, apologies. In the last recommendation, I think we do we still have persistently undercounted populations? Just for consistency. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, Dana. I just wanted to suggest adding after state and local complete count committees, including informal complete count committees, because I know in a number of places they are not fully recognized, but essentially serve the same function. I would agree with that. Um, I, I, th I think the thrust of this is is that uh, we want the Census Bureau to, as has already told us, they should start earlier, start thinking ahead, and also maybe doing a little more advanced thinking about the role of the complete count committees, and also being sure that we start standing them up perhaps a little earlier as well. Any other questions, comments, edits for A? B, develop materials on the value and process of complete count committees in 2024 and begin to reach out to governors, legislators, may mayors, center skeety councils, and other governmental officials and bodies in 2025 to urge them to authorize, fund, and form committees beginning 2026 to ensure they are ready to work by 2028. Richard Pan. And uh, part of the reason for the timeline, certainly open to any changes, is that I know that in the legislative process, uh, Sometimes it takes a few years before the money actually gets passed and flows. Okay, Carol. Um, to add tribal governance. Agreed. <laughs> tribal governance. Any other questions, comments, edits to the B? C, 
provide training materials for complete count committees developed after consultation with stakeholders that provide guidance on best practices and effective outreach strategies and messages. D, allocate funds for resources to assist complete count committees. Oh, did, Marlene, did I miss you on C? Well, I'm trying to figure out where <laughs> it would fit because what I really, one of the things I came away with from the presentation this morning was what they talked about, tent, trans creation of materials. And so I would love to write about that and making sure that it's accessible for people with disabilities and taking into account the needs of the disability community. And so I don't know where it would fit nicely, but if you're creating materials, you need to um, really make sure that they're accessible using language, communication needs. Yeah, Marlene, I think that deserves its own recommendation, and I'm happy to work so, on that with you. So I kind of drafted something. Oh, I don't wonderful. Know. <laughs> um, so this is what I came up with, but open to discussion. The NAC recommends that as part of the transcreation of materials process that the Census Bureau consider and comprehensively address the language and communication needs of census respondents, including the use of ASL plain language and Braille. Um, and then with the, um, addressing the intersectionality with home language as well. So I know it's really convoluted, but. <laughs> Could you email that? Yeah. Okay. Um, can I just make a suggestion that maybe add something about and adding a mechanism of evaluation of mm -hmm. those materials? I like that. Thank you. And so, Marlene, so I have to clarify, is this your, uh, uh, this will be an E to yes. this recommendation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, recommendation 17 as noted. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's communications team engage more closely with the Bureau's researchers and advocate to ensure that respondents not only responded, but they counted everyone in the household, including children, in their response. Questions, comments, edits? Richard Pan. Yeah, just, uh, so one of the examples, unfortunately, in the last census was that the communications team did not communicate to landlords that they actually, by law, required at a $500 fine, I believe, for every violation uh, to allow census enumerators into their complexes. But that was not clearly communicated, and so enumerators got turned away. And so there was, it seems to be a disconnect between the communications team and the operations and what the law said. So that's just, uh, so again, and I think I did pose the question earlier when they presented about being sure that we send the appropriate messages uh, and not just when the numerator shows up, but even beforehand to be sure that, um, uh, so we need to have this connection between the communications team with the operations folks and uh, uh, to be sure that uh, the appropriate messages are sent. Arlock, before you speak, am I capturing any, everyone virtually? Does anyone virtual, who's virtual, have a question or comment or edit? Okay, hearing none, Arlock? Um, is it, and is it, uh, do we mean more, for example, by landlords or particularly by landlords? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead, sorry. Yeah, admittedly, that covers both 17 and 18, so. Moving on, the, excuse me, noted 18, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's communications team communicate clear messages to the public regarding all legal obligations to operate with the census, for example, by landlords and their employees to allow census enumerators onto their property. I, so it's been noted, did, did we not make this recommendation previously? Oh, can you speak the microphone, please? Sorry. I think we made a recommendation regarding consulting with landlord groups and property managers, right. but I don't think the specific insistence that we deliver messages about yeah. what the law is. I right. don't think that was included. Yeah, I think this is, this is a little more, right, exactly. We did consultation. We need to communicate, but this one's about 
uh, the census communications team should be reviewing people's legal obligations and making sure that that's built into the messaging. So obviously one of them is the landlords, there may be some others, but uh, we should be, there should be a clear, that's what people's legal obligations are. I know sometimes, of course, we usually want people to cooperate, we don't want to tell people like the law says you have to, but maybe sometimes we do have to say uh, the law says you have to. It's usually not for the respondents, it's for people to allow us to get to the respondents. So I think it's important that someone do a legal review and then uh, for the, well, let's say, there should be a legal review for the communications team so they can craft appropriate messages to communicate the legal obligations people have to allow census enumerators to get to where they need to go. I just wanted to maybe ask a quick question. What you, I think, just described there looks quite, sounds quite different than what's then, written in number 17. I, I, I wonder I if a revision um, to clarify might be helpful. I, I agree, and I, I'm still struggling with the possible what overlaps and just uh, maybe a bit of semantics between the, the previous recommendation and this one. Okay, yeah, I think originally they were put together and then we separated them because there were slightly different angles because one was about cooperating, you know, communications working more closely with the researchers and the other one was more about the legal obligations, so we split them, but there, yeah, there's a reason they're somewhat, seem to be somewhat related, although they do approach two different angles. One's about cooperation, one's about communications, communicating legal obligations, but I'm certainly happy to hear about proposals to either recombine them or streamline them or whatever. I think maybe some of my hang up is just trying to figure out how 17 is like measurable, um, to be honest. Like how do, we, how do we know whether or not that's occurring? And is there anything like measurable or accountable that we can include there? Well I, well, I have to admit, I did pose the question to the communications group today, so one could uh, potentially argue that it's already been brought up today since that was, since I brought it up during the presentation. So the feeling is that this might be a little duplicative, um, then I guess we could certainly just remove it. Uh, but certainly that is a message I want to be sure is sent, that communications and operations needs to work together right, more closely, and they did acknowledge there sometimes was a gap. Are you suggesting the strike 17? Um, since I did, we did have a chance to discuss it today, um, if no one else feels like 17 is necessary, I'm okay with just deleting it since it was discussed today. And of course, when we drafted it, we did not know we would have that discussion today. I just want to get, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Yoma. So I just want to get I just want to get clarity between discussion and recommendation. I feel like just because you discussed it, okay, but I feel like recommendations to me are clear about these things that we think are really important. So I, I guess I want to make a distinction about discussion doesn't actually indicate you're going to do something about it, or at least make sure that you institutionalize it. I just feel like the recommendation allows us to sort of begin to ask. So now that we discussed it and we recommend it, what did you do to address it? So I just feel like I worry that we're using discussion as sort of like that means they're going to do something. I think the, the recommendations makes it clear that we that we we think this is an important matter. And when they respond to it, they have to at least either say we did it or we don't think it's important. I just I just worry that just saying discussion, just because it was discussed doesn't mean it actually has been addressed. So I, I just worry about just deleting it wholesale, but I want to make sure I'm not missing or conflating the discussion equals recommendation part. Well, and I wonder if it would just be clear, if, more clear if we just state it like the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau communications team collaborates, because to me it's not just about engaging, it's actually working together with the partnership program and the researchers and other facets of the organization. So it's like, how do you make it so that everybody is lockstep mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as they do their work instead of doing their own thing over here? And so over to, to, to steer this, because we have one hour left, um, I'm going to suggest, Richard, that you take this one. Is this your recommendation? 
Yes, so I guess the, so I'm happy to try to redraft it with some help if people agree that we want to keep it. If people say, no, we actually want it to go. I say keep it. <laughs> but I'm hearing keep it now. <laughs> so. And I'm happy to have, we can, we can do offline, Richard. Okay, all right. Okay, so we, let's, that, let's, work let's to go ahead and, it. yeah, just redraft it. We'll table this because let me make note that what we don't, with, in these last two days of recommendations, we don't cover, they don't make it, they don't make the list. So let's try to cover as many of these, if not all of these, as goal as possible. Okay. So, D. Just, um, Did I miss Carol? Go just ahead. Just very quickly, um, I think to the point that Yoma made about building on what the Census Bureau has conveyed during the next meeting. So to reference that they shared it with us, but to extend it and institutionalize it is important, and I think it just helps make the recommendations more practical, and so that the response isn't oh, we did that at the meeting and we told you about it. It, it kind of just puts, it just kind of creates this um, continuity about what's shared and then what can be acted upon and recommended. So I think that's a way to just kind of build it out a bit. Moving forward to D, the overview of young children. Give you a moment. As noted as 19 recommendation, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's 2030 research agenda test more innovative approaches to improve the count of young children. Did we close out that example? And right here at Households. Examples provided to identify facilitators and barriers to counting young children and research their suggestions. Questions, comments, edits. Okay, moving forward. Preamble to 20 as noted. Recommendation, recommendation 20, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau develop a research agenda focused on counting people with low literacy skills, leveraging the insights gained from liter leveraging the insights gained from literacy experts. This research should cover at least three topics. Where and how people with low literacy skills get information. Example, what messages would appeal to them to respond and what method of response they prefer and are most likely to use. Janine. I would just add um, low literacy skills in multiple languages. I think we default to English, um, but just adding that in there. Any other questions, concerns, edits? Dana, did I? Um, I wonder if you should put in multiple languages up more. Um, so at the beginning where it says focus on counting people with low literacy skills in multiple languages or, yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Dana, did you have a comment? I thought I saw your card maybe. Okay. Moving on to E, the ACS content test. Moment for the preamble. Recommendation 21 is noted. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau clarify the impact of the proposed roster change on young children and those with a tenuous connection to a household. Questions, concerns, edits? Our lot. I think Eric Jensen provided an answer, uh, but mostly in comments afterwards, um, explaining a discrepancy between how they describe the roster impact 
here versus in the Federal Register. Um, and I'm glad to talk about that if anyone is curious about it, talk about what he said about it. Is, is your recommendation to, to strike this recommendation? This I think we should keep it just because they go on record on stating it instead of having it in our heads. Like we heard it, but nobody else heard what he told us. Was this a private conversation, like a, a yeah, offline co conversation? Here. Right, he came over <laughs> after his presentation. He was trying to say it publicly and the, then we ended and so he told it to us afterwards. So, um, and I understood that this would be the kind of thing that is coming out in the report that they said was coming, but they didn't say when the report was coming. So, very open to keeping it there. Is it possible for us to just have it as a request for information rather than a recommendation? If that's, if there's really not, nothing else actionable? Thank you, Helen. Is the concern that this information is not publicly available or that we are unfamiliar? Like, um, can I get clarification on that? I think the concern right now is that there's conflicting information of what they presented here and what's in the FRN. So it's sort of like, is there an impact? Is there not an impact? What, is this a good thing for kids or not? And it's not clear right now. I think after the conversation we had, it seems to be a good thing, um, but. So, so, yeah, I recommend that we keep it, but I wonder if they place this information online somewhere publicly so other people can make sense of it? Like what's the, who do we want to inform about the, the clarification of this discrepancy? Us, <laughs> the child advocates. <laughs> what, what are you guys saying? Are we keep? Yes. yes so the responses to our recommendations and for requests for information become public, my understanding. Yeah. Maybe we can strike, though, the withdraw the part of the Federal Register notice, because that could slow things down yeah. uh, uh, in ways we don't intend or under, don't know. What recommendation are you speaking of? So, um, We're on 21. Well, that's true. Okay. Well, I did it again. So are we keeping 21? Or are we keeping the recommendation for 21? Okay. Moving now on to 22. <laughs> NAC recommends that the Census Bureau withdraw the part of the October 20th, 2023 Federal Register, Register Notice related to the proposed roster change and instead provide the public with clear information on what the test results show, including the statistical significance of the results and whether the revised languages was more or less effective for different racial and ethnic groups before requesting public comment on it. Now, Arlock, what was your, your edit? D delete the whole thing, is that? I mean, oh. I, I, sort of, I sort of feel like these recommendations came out of fear <laughs> on our part, because it was unclear what they were saying and what research they were presenting. Um, so I, I don't know if the other folks on, in the child group agree, but I would delete this one. Yoma or Gina? So I'll just make sure, because I, I had to uh, miss part of that meeting. So are you saying that they responded to the, 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 the concern about what the FRN said and what the presentation said? Did they address that? that? Okay. Yes, they, they responded and apparently there's research report coming out soon. Got it, okay. Okay, then this one, then if that's the case that clarifies it, that's what they said, then I would, yes, I would, I would agree with you to delete. And I do too. I do too. Okay, striking 22, moving on to 23. 
The NACA recommends that the Census Bureau's roster test for the 2030 Census investigate a better roster approach for the young children and that the results of the research be used to improve the ACS roster process as well as the 2030 Census. Questions, concerns, edits? Hearing none. Topic F on data collection. Recommendation 24 is noted. The NAC recommends that the Bureau take the following steps to improve data collection efforts for the disability community. That's actually not a recommendation. That is isn't. Marlene, that's a bit of a preamble. That's an opening. That's a miss on my part. Twenty-four is noted. The NAT recommends that the U.S. Census Bureau postpone the proposed changes to adopt the WGSS Washington Group short set on functioning questions on functioning questions to assess disability status in the ACS. Questions, concerns, comments. Um, I wonder if we want to say anything about what needs to happen before they actually enact it, because postpone it indefinitely, postpone it until some they have conversations or do additional research or. Can we combine 24 and 25? Yes. That's what I was going to say. Because <laughs> the biggest um, concern is that the disability community was not um, consulted. Um, and so combining those would probably make the most sense. Or like, you, do you have a question or is your card still up? If not, Richard Pan? Yeah, I'm just thinking uh, uh, that uh, that recommendation 24, which uh, would basically, oh, is it still 24? Okay. Ba basically that they would, we would recommend that they postpone until they actually engage the disability community, which is of course going to be the following recommendation. Uh, so in terms of the time certain would be, um, I, I, would, I would suggest propose, propose ah, postponing the proposed changes until they've actually, actually engaged the disability, you know, until the disability community has been engaged, and then I guess if we're bringing that other recommendation up, recommends that, you know, until you. Until a representative cross-section. Right, until that, yeah, until they actually execute that representative cross-section diverse members of the disability community and consult them. So that would be, it would be a postpone until that, until that has occurred. Fine with that? Any other questions, concerns, edits? Nicholas. Yeah. The postpone the proposed changes. The postponement to me suggests that eventually that they'll be accepted. Um, so I wonder if there's different language around uh, this that we might be able to use uh, to say that maybe a decision should be made only after consulting um, with these communities. Maybe postpone making a decision to adopt instead of proposed changes. Or propose any decision to adopt? Would that be more uh, instead of proposed changes? Just say postpone any decision to adopt, et cetera, until. How about reassess? Carol? How about reassess rather than postpone? Reassess, reassess instead of postpone. Changes? I think. Uh, my concern with the word reassess is it didn't sound like they assessed it. It was like a suggestion right. was made That's for you to use it. <laughs> Unless I misheard. No, I didn't. Any other questions, concerns? Are we accepting as is? I hear not adopt. Arlock, I need for you to speak into the mic. Does it flow to say that NAC recommends the U.S. Census Bureau not adopt the WGSS short set on functioning questions to assess disability status until? Until. Until, yeah. So not adopt? Not adopt until, yeah. But. 
does that run into the same issue? Not adopt until? So afterwards, doesn't it kind of suggest that they're going to adopt thereafter? Yeah. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I have my hand? Sorry. I'm, I'm, can you chime in? So I, I think we should just be very blunt. They should halt this whole part, right? If you go through the best recommendation, there's a other process, right? So I feel like even the mixing and even the one about until, you know, the, the whole um, uh, representative cross section, there's a whole other set that says, right, that I think whoever put the recommendation to Marlon, who put the recommendation about engage diverse groups, also test. So for me, it's almost like you should halt that completely and start over. I mean, that's what in essence what I think we're really saying. I don't, I don't, I guess I'm, I feel like we're kind of trying to mix words. Can we just say stop, halt, whatever the word we need to use to make it clear this should not proceed until you do all of these things, period. I, I guess I'm, I'm worried that we're giving them like some room to wiggle out of right now. Well, earlier I said table it. Um, but uh, I think I agree with you wholeheartedly. And like my concern is that based on side conversations I'm having with folks that we may be farther along than it was stated here today because OMB kind of cleared it. <laughs> um, and part of a prior presentation, the feedback that we're getting is that they said, well, we'll just share it with the community, the disability community, but we're moving forward with this. So halting, stopping, <laughs> is key because you haven't done what you should have done. Like there were no comments because it was considered a revision, I think, and not an adoption. So there, it wasn't even open for comments from the public. And that is a concern to us as well. So I want to interject on this. Can, can we time. wait? Oh, sorry. Because it's taking up a lot of discussion. We need to do for the recommendation. So is this something that you can take back and maybe revise and give with a couple or would someone want to take? Take a stab at. Yeah, I, no. I, 24 and 25 would have to be re revised a little up there. I can take a stab, and anyone else wants to do it with me? I'd be interested. Okay. Okay. So that would be Dana and Marlene. They'll take with 24 and 25, you said? We'll be on recommendation 26. The NACA recommends that the U.S. Census Bureau actively engage with a diverse group of people with disabilities, disability researchers, federal agencies, and other stakeholders to inform how to improve the collection of disability statistics and ensure that the future data collection includes the addition of questions related to mental health functioning. As an example, depression and anxiety. Questions, concerns, edits? If I may add, the uh the impetus for this one is the fact that a federal interagency was used to as a consultative body, um, and there is no, and they're all researchers, and there's no indication that anyone on that federal interagency body was a person with a disability, um, and so that is also problematic. Hearing none, moving over to, go ahead, Dana. Sorry. I uh, just want to change the IE to EG to be inclusive. And I'd also suggest adding to that um, to improve how the collection of disabilities to ensure future data collection includes the addition of questions related to mental health functioning. Actually, no, I, I don't want to add anything. <laughs> okay. Okay, moving on to 27. The NAC recommends, oh, is there someone, Nicholas? The NAC recommends that the Office of Management and Budget, Budget provide notice and a comment process for any changes to survey questions in the future and that this notice and process be made accessible for people with disabilities. Can we just parenthesis OMB? Okay. Questions, comments, concerns, edits. I just want to comment not on the recommendations. I thought it was outrageous that they had all this feedback from international experts and 
researchers and didn't even think about doing <laughs> their due diligence with folks inside the U.S. Yes, linguistically. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And then, so like, why are we so concerned? Like, we should be looking within our communities as to what the needs are. And um, like I get from a research perspective, you want to look internationally, but that really doesn't help our community. Okay, we go on to G. Um, go ahead. It, it, <clears throat> I, I generally agree with all of the sentiments being expressed. Uh, is it within our purview to make recommendations to OMB, though? Good catch. Um, I, I also recall during part of the presentation they mentioned, um, and maybe this, it was in anticipation of some of our concerns, but if changes to the question and the language are only considered a revision, then that seems to lower the bar for what they are required to do in order to push those changes through. Since they are defining it as revisions to currently existing questions as opposed to new questions. Um, so that may also play a role in terms of how obligated they may feel to take these recommendations into account. Not that we still shouldn't make them. Maybe we could make a recommendation that, and I'm gonna use very plain language, that the Census Bureau should go to bat for people with disabilities. Because we can at least recommend something to them. This edit, I think this edit would cover. Okay. Yes. Okay. Moving forward to G. As noted, recommendation 29. No, that's the recommendation. Whose recommendation is this? Isn't that our lock? Is that yours? Yeah, so this is um, to, fac to facilitate the, yeah, a bridge year, about a bridge year to facilitate the transition to the new OMB standards. Um, for a lot of purposes, what's important about race ethnic data is understanding the trend and if there's going to be a jump in the trend from one year to the next, say, you know, a lot of new Dominicans or, or you know, in, in the population, um, the white population, you know, jumps or whatever else. Um, and this would be for the ACS, so it could be, you know, at the metro level or something. It would be important to know, is that real? Um, because of something that happened that year or in that metro area? Or is this a measurement um, change? And the thought is uh, um, if census asks the question both ways in one year in the ACS, then they'll know. They'll, you'll have a you'll see the break in the series, you'll see it measured both ways in that one transition year, and you'll be able to get a sense of what the real trend was. Uh, um, and it, the hope is that Census will be able to secure extra funding so that they can expand the ACS, so that they can mostly, for the most part, keep the main measure um, at nearly the same sample size and then have an alternative measure as the old way 
um, maybe with a slightly smaller sample size, but enough to get a sense of the difference. And the uh, and they've done this before. Um, and the second part of the recommendation says, you know, you need clarity about what the real number, you know, the more official number is, and the second part would say the more official version would be the, the new set of questions. But you would have that bridge. Thank you for that. Let's walk through each for any questions, concerns, or edits, starting with the recommendation at the top of 29. Twenty nine A. Twenty nine B. Twenty nine C. Twenty nine D. Richard Pan. Maybe more of a general comment first to see whether we need to make an amendment. It's uh, in many ways, I think what we want to know is as they as the transition happens, right? Could you speak but, into the mic? Yeah. I was. Okay. Um, in, in many ways, is that if there's a discontinuity, right, because we went from one to the other, we want some data as to what might be happening in the discontinuity, <clears throat> and certainly researchers will, right, because suddenly you're going to have one set of numbers, another set of numbers, and what happened from one, one year to the other. So I don't know whether, um, obviously, you know, presented to the NAC and the user community for feedback, but also do we want to also engage, um, I guess, the research community as well, so that they'd be sure that whatever bridge we're doing is going to help them understand, depending what happens, you know, uh, the if there's a jump, that the jump may be related to the question versus some other secular trend that was happening that year. So um, whether we want, um, so certainly I think we want to hear about it. When you say user community, do you mean that does that include the research community? I guess I guess that's a question. I would be fine with to the NAC and research community if that makes more sense. So the, yeah, NAC the, NAC, the NAC research and user, I mean, certainly we want the users to know. Some of them are researchers, but some may not be, but yeah, okay. So the NAC, I, the, the, NAC the research, slash, comma, u research and user community, <laughs> our researchers. I wonder if we should recommend them doing trainings on their methods and how to use the two sets of data. Because um, it's going to be researchers that probably understand what they did. And then there's going to be the general population who's, want to, who's going to want to do trend analysis. And with a break in series without that bridge, it's going to be impossible. So it's sort of like, how should you be using these data? You should not be comparing these data to previous data. Um, that kind of thing. That's a very good point. I think they do it often. They, the census actually does do breaks in series mm -hmm. um, with, with that kind of bridge fairly frequently, and they t most often have a, you know, a, a note about they often have a note about comparability, but but if but I don't object to underlining that. What is the recommended? What's the recommended edit or? Um, I would add a recommendation that says the NAC recommends that um, the Census Bureau provide training on the bridge race and ethnicity file. I mean, if they even create one, <laughs> but um, for um, data users. Because I know they provide lots of notes and method documents 
Some people read those, most don't. Richard Chang. Richard Chang. Uh, I'm sorry. What? I was wondering um, what the purpose would be of having the bridge where you're surveying using both sets of uh, standards. Uh, how, how that might be, how, how that might be beneficial. I mean, um, for for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, I mean, uh, I, I don't think it would be as significant a difference as it would be for other communities that would be impacted by the combined question or, or MENA groups. Um, so I'm I'm just generally wondering, uh, genuinely wondering, um, what what the primary purpose of the bridge plan would be. So, for example, if the um, Mexican population in uh, um, uh, Arizona County jumps in an election year when this OMB standard is being changed, um, it would be known whether that's due to a spike in immigration or due to um, uh, methodological change in the ACS. Uh, or, you know, that was a crass example, but it, uh, uh, for lots of practical uh, applications, the trend is what people focus on or what matters for um, any data application and being able to no, was there actually a, a, a jump in the trend? Could matter. Uh, okay. Arlok, is your mic on? The mic, please. So you, if there were a break in the series, you would know whether the break in the series was methodological or something else. Yoma, I want to pull you. I see you. I want to pull you into the conversation. Just briefly, I know it took me a little while to like get convinced. I would say to the bridge plan, but I, from what I gathered, when when the 1997 one, it took what close to I think I I heard from some experts 15 years for it to finally make its way through. It just took a long time. So I guess the idea of the bridge plan is to allow a little bit more of to at least provide a plan and allow a little bit more of being able to connect the 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 current standards. And what would be hopefully obviously the, the new standards, right? So, right, that's really the idea is to at least have something that we can work with as the as the change happens, right, Richard? I, I mean, not Richard, sorry, right, Arla? It, it, right, it would help. Yeah. Hey, Richard, Richard Pan, Dr. Pan. Oops. Because basically what happened is you have the old trend line, right? And it'll go to a certain point, and then we stop doing it. And then we'll have the new methodology, right, the new classifications, and we'll start, and then there'll be another trend line from that. The problem is there's absolutely no overlap between two. So the bridge essentially allows you to say there's one point in time where we ask both. And so that, so, so basically you know, because you actually know what the old trend line where it would end, and it overlaps at the beginning of the new trend line, then you would say, well, that gap is because of the methodology. It's probably not due to a secular trend versus if they don't overlap and something changes, you don't know, is it the methodology or something happened? I mean, you can, you might guess, hey, nothing else happened, so I don't think that's it, but you wouldn't know. So uh, that bridge essentially allows you to connect one trend line that might end at a certain point, but the new trend line starts at a different point and goes on and that uh, you know that that's accounted for by your methodological change because you asked the question both ways that one, so there's an overlap, there's a point in time overlap between the two trend lines that allows you to say, this is probably due to methodology, not to something else that happened. If they don't overlap at all, you're not sure, is it the methodology or did something else happen, you know, between the two, between the end of the one, the beginning of the other, because they don't, over, you know, one ended at one year and then one started again the following year. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, that, it, it does make sense. Um, I'm thinking from the perspective of uh, community organizations on the ground, 
I, I suspect that there will be some cherry picking when it comes to which data set that they would prefer to use. Um, and I, know, I, I think what might be, what might impact the analysis of both of those uh, and the comparison would be the removal of the other category in the new standards. Um, like the other Pacific Islander category is going to be removed in, under the revised uh, SPD 15. Um, and so I think that would definitely complicate uh, how those trend lines might be connected to each other in, in ways we might not anticipate. Um, but. What, what yeah, are we, okay. what are no, we no, doing no, but with? That's it's definitely under, better understood on, on my end, like why there would be a benefit for that bridge. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to. I mean, do you have one comment? Because then I'm going to ask, are there any edits or are we just, you were wanting that clarification? Mr. Ch Mr. Chang, you're fine? Okay, go ahead, Jeremy. No. Okay, no, sorry, no. okay. I don't know why I'm so confused. Um, I, the only thing I worry about is if there's any language that could be interpreted that they don't have to implement new OMB guidelines with a bridge plan, if we allow them, for example, to cherry pick data sets and say, well, we can't measure MENA because they didn't have MENA in this previous. I'm just, I wanna maybe add a line on something where it sort of safeguards a little bit against that because I do, I see the importance of having overlapping data collection of the old standards and the new just to see how it shifts and, and what the um, impact is. But I also don't want to give an opening for excuse making to not implement the standards as we know it's definitely been um, postponed for a long time in the past. Last comment. Uh, the quick answer to that, that's why we have the recommendation that the official one, it's not, we can't cherry pick, we actually have a recommendation saying that the new methodology is the official methodology. We're just simply extending the old one for that one overlap year to be able to do the methodology. Okay. I'm going to have to close this out because we need to move forward. So we either, do we have any recommended edit? Any concrete edits? If not, I need to send this back to you, Arla, for possible revisions. And please specify which letter so, in particular. Uh, and another thing that we could do is say, and let's, we recommend that the Census Bureau delay, you know, and release the analytical version later. So that's even more clear that the real version and the prim, pr principal version is the principal version. Is this an edit or is version. this an additional recommendation? And which, which letter are we speaking of? It could be related to an edit, I'm not sure, but I guess the concern with B is defining something as the official version of the data is all trend analyses, the official version of those analyses, right, would be based upon the old standards, right? Can you do a trend analysis without? Let me interject, because we need to move forward. I'm going to send this back to you, Arlott, for a revision. Is this your recommendation? We'll, we'll consult afterwards. Okay. So we're we talking about the full recommendation, I mean, in its entirety from A through D. Sounds like from B on, there was a question. There were some. The whole, th I'll send it back. I'll send the entire recommendation. I'm sending that back to you for revision. So recommendation 29, okay? Recommendation 30, this is lengthy as well, so I'm gonna give you time, guys time to read it. And I think this belongs to Mark. Any questions or concerns? Let's go back. Questions, concerns, edits for 30. Go ahead, Nicholas. Um, for, are we at A or? Just for the 30, for the, okay. the, the first. Okay. None? Okay, let's move on to A. Yeah, the, I mean. Oh, okay. I just, I mean, I honestly don't understand the impetus 
um, to, I understand the impetus to potentially expand definitions of Latino for folks from Latin American nations who might identify as such and who are currently being recoded into other categories, especially like Brazilians. Uh, I just clearly don't understand the impetus to do that for Portuguese. Um, in my work and in lots of other research, I, I've not seen Portuguese as included in definitions of Hispanic or Latino. Um, it's not a Latin American nation. It's not Hispanic. Um, I recognize that there may be a sh small share of people who may be from Portugal, a very small share, who may identify as Hispanic or Latino, but that would be true of almost any nation, right? That there would be a small share of people from lots of different countries who might identify as such, and I don't think um, the recognition of a nation of Portugal or ancestry of Portugal should be indicative of Hispanic or Latino, um, uh, being Hispanic or Latino. It, it, it's hard for me to understand this. Arlene? I'm following his reasoning. That's all I have. Oh. <laughs> Ioma? So I'm, so, I'm, so I'm trying to also understand this particular one writ large, because I mean, with Brazilians, there's quite a bit that are Afro, um, have African diasporic sort of ancestry. So, so I guess I'm trying to understand why just the Latino category, when some of us can argue quite a bit of them, even in, in, in Brazil themselves, more than about half uh, say they have African ancestry. So I guess I'm trying to figure out why just the Latino category and not say even the racial category, right? So that's, that's I think I'm, I'm struggling with this full recommendation here and trying to get a sense of why just that category. Go ahead, Arla. My understanding, and I did not write this, and I'm not an expert in this area, is that um, Mark Lopez, what's that? Um, at uh, Pew and his colleagues um, uncovered in May a particular editing practice at the Census Bureau to change um, the uh, Hispanic or Latino self-identification of people whose only self-identified nationality was Brazilian so that they were not counted as Hispanic or Latino. And because it was a specific editing practice at census focused on that, they suggested removing, they, uh, uh, Mark is suggesting removing that, ending that practice. So it's, it's taking something that was narrowly instituted at census and suggesting they stop, but others may know more. Yeah, I think that's generally correct. Um, in the past, people from Brazil, the, many of them, many of whom would check that they are, yes, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin, but they'd be recoded and they'd be taken out of that box, right, um, for the purposes of all data dissemination thereafter. And what I think Mark is suggesting is like, why? We should, we should permit people from Latin America who identify as Hispanic or Latino or Spanish origin, Brazilians in this case, to identify as Latino if they, if they so wish, right? Um, and to count them as Hispanic or Latino if they so wish. And I, I generally agree with that. Um, I just don't understand Portuguese at all in the same way. Mark is not here to speak to this recommendation. So as a group. So I, I would move to strike Portuguese from the, the list that we have in recommendation A. But. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still, I guess I, I, it's almost like we can make the same recommendation, say like Egyptian, right, will mark that they're Egyptian, but they're automatically coded as white, right? You know, so, so, so the fact that we're taking, whether it's Brazilian and even, you know, Belizean, right? To me, I, I, are we making decisions about coding here? I, I'm, I'm worried right now that we're making decisions about how the census code, when I could, I, there's a lot that they code that I disagree with completely, why this particular one and not all the other ones that we know are just problematic in nature, um, right? So, so I, I'm, I'm just struggling with this recommendation because I feel like in the end of it, I'm like then Mark then also put that they should be marked Afro, you know, put on the black. 
and for me, I, this 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 is to me much larger than just you know saying do this because you can do that for a whole lot of other groups. And so I'm I'm worried that we're going into territory right now where just based on you know look the pew is respected, but based on one report, I think it may be something more broad could be could be actually put forth, which is you need to sort of do a much deeper study as to particular groups, but it's not just Brazilians, right? It could be uh, in, in the other category, you saw those other groups. So I, I'm I'm actually really worried about this one because I feel like there's too many Brazilians are also Af who are African ancestry. And so we're not addressing that and not only addressing the Latino portion of it. And I just, I'm, I, I don't necessarily agree with this full recommendation at all. Go ahead, Flo. Yeah, I'm just thinking how they recode lots of people. Like, they should be doing research as to, <laughs> like, okay, so you put me in as white. Do I see myself that way? Like, don't recode me unless, <laughs> like, it's just based on our assumptions of where people fit, and that's not necessarily where we should be putting them. So I... I don't know. I, I sort of tend to agree with Ioma here. So two things. Let me make a note that we have 15 minutes left to deliberate. Am I hearing? Let's go ahead and take a formal I and nay vote on this, okay? So the, the suggestion, the recommendation to the recommendation is to strike 30 as noted in its entirety. So 30A, 30, 30A, and B. All in favor, please say aye, raise a raise of hand so I can just get a visual. Aye. Aye to strike. And I think the aye is higher, but I'll go ahead and call a nay. Okay. Striking 30 in its entirety, 30, 30A, and 30B. Was there any and dissent? In the room and virtually. Well, just one moment. Let me try to capture the virtual. For those who are virtual, any dissent to strike in 30, 30A and 30B? Is it safe to say that you're all in favor? Okay. I, I abstain, but I would love... Maybe we could come back to it if we've done a little more research. I don't, for example, know if they do it for anyone else. And other people here probably do. So anyway. Well, at this, to, at this point. We could come back to it in the, in the spring. In the spring. But yes, it's being removed from these recommendations. This set of draft recommendations. Let me note that. Okay. Moving forward. Reading of this preamble. Moving on to a little bit more, what would be 31? NAC recommends that the racial and ethnic data and Census Bureau surveys and the 2030 Census rely first on self-response and minimize the use of administrative data. This means that there needs to be a significant investment in securing self-response and data direct responses through the NERFU process. Questions, concerns, edits. Can I just ask a quick question? This is Gina. Um, I couldn't quite, when you, in the preamble, it felt like that first sentence wasn't in English, wasn't correct grammatically, but I, it went too fast for me to read it carefully. Going back? Yeah, the, for many years. <clears throat> okay, I think it's fine. Sorry, I was just reading too quick. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thirty-two. The NAC recommends oh. the Census Bureau prioritize the differential oh, yeah. count. Did I miss? I, 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 Carol, I'm so sorry. No worries. The lack of peripheral. Um, <laughs> just in the preamble where it says it will also likely take state agencies, I think. Um, this is it, above thirty-one. Yeah. Um, to add to make it state, local, and tribal agencies. The 
Does that cure it? Thank you. So 32. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau prioritize the differential count of people of color by attending to the overcount of white people and some Asians and the undercount of Hispanics, blacks, subgroups of Asians and those living on a reservation. Questions, concerns, comments, edits? Go ahead, Janine. Yeah. I would say, and Native Americans living on reservations, since it's just specific to that group being undercounted. Go ahead, Dr. Pan. So just to clarify, because we're saying prioritize, um, and then you talk about the, over, the overcounts being talked first, and I realize there may be sort of two halves of the same problem, but is it more, uh, I can say, is it more important to prioritize the overcount uh, or the undercount? I mean. Can, I can clarify that if you want me to. So, right, if we, so we often talk about the undercount, which is true. The undercount comes because of the overcount. So really, if you don't address the overcount issue and just focus on, oh, here's all the over undercount, if you don't address the overcount issue, then the undercount actually may, may not be there. So it's one of those where also fo also focus on the, the overcount of, uh, of the, uh, the white population. So really, it's really that's, the part, that's part of the issue we never talk about is the overcount. Okay. All right. I just help? wanted to be clear because mo yeah, because most of the places we're talking about, you know, we're trying to address, improve the count for under and what causes an overcount may not be the same thing that causes the undercount. So when we talk about prioritization, I hear what you're saying is is that I just want to be sure that in many places we're saying we need to do research studies, et cetera, and we're prioritizing being sure we address the undercount. And here we're sort of saying actually we want to first address the overcount. And I realize that magnifies the problems, but the reason, the things that cause the overcount may be different than the things that are causing the undercount. So as we're, I want to be sure we're sending the right message to the census about where we want our priority, whether to drive down the overcount or to lift the undercount. They're not, you know, because they're not, uh, when you finally get the results, that obviously has an impact, but the, but the effort to, to address the overcount may not be the same as what you need to do to improve the undercount. Does that make sense? Yes, right. So the differential, that's why most of us say the differential, right? Because really the the undercount happens when you're like, let's subtract, you know, the, the overcount we have and, and we see these, you know, groups all then undercounted because of the dif so the differential. So I would say yes, I hear what you're saying about sort of like not giving mixed messages, but I think it's the point of maybe it's not prioritizing, but I think we have to address that issue. Because that means that you're spending funds on counting people more than one time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I would just argue, and again, whether we should use the different word and prioritize or said, uh, or you do prioritize, but it's secondary to something else. I just want to be sure. Maybe you know, address. Keep saying everything, maybe address. Yes. Everything. Yeah. If everything's prioritized, and what happens is they're like, oh, well, nothing's prioritized. So maybe if maybe we can say address the differential or. Uh, yep, and, address, and uh, yeah, that's, we'll yep. the, right, and then we'll leave the prioritized to the things that we care about the most. Richard Chang, so, I want to bring you into you. this conversation. I see your uh, card. Uh, my understanding is that the post enumeration survey can provide detailed race data on over and under counts, but I'm not sure if that's actually been released yet for the 2020 census. Um, if it hasn't, that's something that we might want to request a one-way briefing for. The PS was released, not at the sub-state level, but it was released um, a while back, right? When we found out, obviously, that the Hispanic group was at, what, 5.5%. So they have it at the national, but do you need something sub-state-wise? I just want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, yes, uh, at various geographic levels would certainly be useful as well. Go ahead, Janine. The only thing that I would say or add to this is that with the preamble, it specifically mentions the use of administrative data and using administrative data, which typically covers, is more um, complete for communities that are historically overcounted. It might be useful to go ahead and prioritize 
using administrative data to identify those issues with the overcount first because you have more data available to do that. What is your edit? What is your? I wouldn't have changed it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Saw someone else's card. Flo, was yours going up? Okay. I know. We're almost there, too. So, 33, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau perform research on the three ways people can respond to the census, internet, phone, and paper, broken out by major racial category and ethnicity, as there is some concern that moving to an internet-only based data collection process might improve the count of white people, but further reduce the count of people of color. Questions, concerns, edits. We do have time tomorrow, so I don't. <laughs> I don't want you guys not to. Okay. Hearing none, 34. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau ensure the historically undercount populations working group and other partners and experts inside and outside the Bureau are consistently engaged and consulted when relevant on critical matters regarding race and ethnicity, especially as it relates to the coding and recoding of racial and or ethnic groups, interpreting particular policies or analytical approaches, identify key organizations and experts to engage and experts to engage, noting gaps in the data, tabulation and interpretation, among other things. For example, their story on English as the most common race, many have been misinterpreted, misread by many, given how we measure, capture, and talk about race in the U.S. Ioma, this is yours, isn't it? Yeah, take out that last part. You can take out that. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think my brain was fried then. So that last sentence you just read, you can take that part out. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Questions, concerns, comments, edits. Ioma, real quick, with four minutes left. Could you clarify this recommendation? Sure. This was, I mean, so seeing some of the recommendations and also just uh, is that we we just need them to make sure that as they're making decisions about how to code, right, or tabulate. So even like the example of the Brazil, the, the Brazil to Latino or, you know, that they at least consult have a, this larger race ethnicity working group that they can really go to to sort of like raise some of these issues up and sort of have it be addressed in a more comprehensive way rather than like one at a time. So it's more of just that they need to do a little bit more to, to make sure all the things that are tabulated makes like it makes sense. If I'm Egyptian, should I be white? Right. That of course they have to do that because that's 1987. But as some of these other more nuanced things come forth, it'll be good that they have a group they can go to to address whether it's coding, recoding, or even tabulation or interpretation, those sort of things. And I would just, since I have one more minute, I, I will just flag that last part I said delete is the one example was they had a report that says English is the largest race in the U.S. And I was like, no, that's not, actually, that's not actually true, is that English is one of the subgroups of the white racial category. The way that report read was like, that's, you should not, you should not write a report like that. And if they would have had a working group, right, like a race ethnicity working group, they would have said maybe it's a different way to actually um, write this particular fact sheet or brief, right? And so that's kind of one of an example of what they why they need a sort of a working group that they really work more cohesively with. Let me step in, Richard Chang, in closing, and then that's we have time. We're at time. Um, I would just add to that recommendation um, and have the Census Bureau publish a summary of those discussions, who they had discussions with and if there were any positions taken by participants in those discussions. And that's your edit? I, I can help provide okay. some language afterwards. Okay. And I will, we are at 459. I will turn it back over to Karen at this time. Thank you, Cherokee. And I just wanna thank everybody for the great discussion today. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow morning. So enjoy the evening and uh, day one is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, have a good night, good night.